Section 12 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. France continued. 5. Forestry Science and Practice. Until the 16th century, whatever regulations had been issued regarding forest use were merely administrative or police character, and had nothing to do with the management or silviculture except perhaps so far as the number of Bellevaux reserved trees to be left, might be considered as bearing upon the subject. The reformateurs, who were from time to time appointed, had to deal only with judicial questions and abuses, and usually the ordinances referred only to special forests. But in 1563 the Table de Mabre of Paris issued instructions which were to serve in all forests. A futile attempt to secure statistical knowledge of the forest domain was made, apparently with a view to regulation of the cut, by de Fleury, the chief of the Forest Service in 1561. In default of data from many of the maîtrises, a provisional partial order to regulate the cut was issued in 1573, which remained in force for a hundred years and was regularly disregarded, extraordinary cuts being made without authority and with the connivance of the officers. An ordinance of 1579 describes the deplorable condition of the forest at length and calls for statistical data but again without result. A number of further ordinances also made no impression upon the callous and corrupt officials of the Forest Service. The first-class attempt to secure more conservative forest use and to regulate the cut was made by Henry IV in instituting a commission, and as a result of its report, issuing his General Order of Rouen in 1597, a highly interesting document giving insight into conditions and opinions of the foresters of that period. It also remained without any result whatsoever. Repeated replacement of the higher officials had no more effect than the issuance of ordinances. Not until Colbert's vigorous reform in 1669 came a change in conditions. Meanwhile, some forestry notions had been developed. A sequence of felling areas in the coppice, enhanced an area division, an idea of rotation and of the exploitable age, 10 to 20 years, although sometimes down to 3 and 4 years, the leaving of overwood, which became obligatory in the royal domain, and a kind of regulation of its age, forty years, too short, according to one writer of the time, to furnish valuable trees, and some proper considerations of its selection. In the timber forest, the fellings proceeded by area, in regular order from year to year, leaving a prescribed number of marked seed trees, at least six to eight per acre, on such areas as were outside the rights of user and removed from the likelihood of depredations the felling age being at least 100 years, under the notion that the oak, the most favored species, grows for 100 years, keeps vigorous but stands still for another hundred, and declines in a third hundred. Sowing of acorns on prepared ground was also ordered in the 16th century, and perhaps occasionally done. Young growths were sometimes protected by ditches or fences against cattle, although objections were raised against the former as impeding the chase. A diameter limit sometimes reserved all oak and beech two feet in circumference at six inches from the ground, the height of the stump. Even improvement cuttings, called recipage, are on record in Normandy, mainly for the purpose of cutting out softwoods and freeing the young valuable reproduction, repeated in decennial returns. Later thinnings assumed the character of selection fellings and indeed received the name of jardinage. They were continued until the time for final cut and regeneration had arrived. In the coniferous mountain forests, selection cutting, pure and simple, was the rule. It appears, then, that quite sane notions of silviculture existed, albeit they may not have been very generally and very strictly carried out. Especially during the 16th century, the maladministration of the royal domain brought with it a decadence of the practice in the woods. The area of the coppice increased by clear cutting at the expense of the timber forest, and by Colbert's time. All forestry knowledge had well nigh become forgotten. The Forest Ordinance of 1669 attempted to reform not only the administrative abuses, but to improve the method of exploitation hitherto practiced, at least in put in writing, codified, as it were, the best usage of the time. A commission of twenty-one was instituted to make working plans and prescribe the practice. The prescriptions had reference both to management and silvicultural practice. A felling budget, état d'assiette, was prescribed annually by the Grand Maitre for each garderie district, and felling areas were also sometimes, but not always, definitely located. 
Besides, extraordinary fellings might be ordered. The Garavis were divided into triages now called cantons. Management classes or site classes under different rotations, and the fellings proceeded in each triage in sequence. In each felling area, as had been supposedly the practice, at least eight seed trees per acre, and generally sixteen, besides those under the diameter limit, were to be left. The method, a tier et ar, intermediary fellings, thinnings, were avoided and frowned down upon, probably because of the abuses to which they had given rise. Meanwhile, their need grew more and more, especially in those places where the felling method did not produce satisfactory regeneration, and soft woods impeded the development of the better kinds. To improve the chances for valuable regeneration and to keep the soft woods down, the foresters proposed the reduction of rotations from 100 to 50 and even 40 years. And as with each felling the number of reserve trees had to be left, the forest assumed a form resembling the coppice under standards. In the coniferous forest of the mountains, fir, which in Colbert's time appear almost like a new discovery to his reformers, the selection forest with a diameter limit, e.g. six inch at the small end of the twenty-one foot log, was the method most generally in vogue, and is still to a large extent the method in use, but somewhat better regulated and modified, sometimes with improvement fellings added. In some parts, especially in Lorraine, for a time artificial regeneration and a strip system were tried, and even a group selection with a regeneration period of probably twenty-five to thirty years, and an exploitable age of one hundred years, was practiced in the eighteenth century. Buffon, in 1739, proposed a treatment for the pioneries to secure natural regeneration by cutting one-third to one-half, leaving forty to fifty seed trees per acre, while Duhamel, 1780, considers selection method best for larch and pine as well as fir, although pine might, like oak, be readily reproduced by sowing. While system and orderly progress of fellings in selection forests had gradually been established during the Revolution, this was largely disregarded, and unconservative fellings became the order. Guillaume's Manuel Forestier, published in 1770, gives a good idea of the status of forestry at that time. It appears that for timber forest, mostly royal woods, rotations varying from 60 to 200 years, for coppice from 10 to 20 years, were in use on the royal domain that fellings were regulated according to species, soil quality, and the most advantageous yield. To facilitate regeneration, a superficial culture of the soil is also advocated. The prescription of Colbert's ordinance to leave a certain number of seed trees, no matter for what species or conditions of soil or climate, had as early as 1520 been pointed out as faulty by one of the Grand Masters, Tristan de Rostang, who had recommended a method of successive fellings. This prescription, applied pretty nearly uniformly as a matter of law, removed from their officials all spirit of initiative and desire or requirement of improving upon it. No knowledge beyond that of the law was required of them, hence no development of silvicultural methods resulted from the 17th and 18th century. The seed trees left on the felling areas grew into undesirable and branchy wolves, injuring the aftergrowth or else were thrown by the wind or died and many of the areas became undesirable brush. Not until the first quarter of the 19th century was a change in this method proposed through men who imported new ideas from Germany. When the inefficiency of the metera tier et ar was recognized, the only remedy appeared to lie in a clearing system with artificial reforestation, recommended by Riamour and Duhamel. And indeed, the Ordinance of 1669 recognized the probable necessity of filling up failed places in that manner. Yet the success of plantings in wastelands does not seem to have brought about much extension of this method to the felling areas. As late as 1862, Clavet, complaining of the conditions of silviculture in France, and of the ignorance regarding it, refers to the clearing system as méthode allemande, the German method. The shelterwood system, the méthode du renemessement, was introduced in theory from Germany by Lorentz in 1827, was hardly applied until the middle of the century. Indeed, the promulgation of this superior method cost Lorenz his position in 1839, and other officers suffered similarly for this German propaganda. In this statement we follow Clavet and other authors. Hoffel takes exception to this conception of the origin of the shelterwood system, because he finds in some documents allusion to a modified application of the tier et ar method, which might be construed into shelterwood regeneration. Indeed, 
Guillot, 1770, and Ferrand de Fenil, 1790, describe methods of procedure which resemble somewhat this method of regeneration. But as the method of successive fellings was practiced in Germany since 1720, and fully developed in all its detail by 1790, Hottish formulating merely into rules what was long practiced, it is likely that the French authors had heard of it. Moreover, in another place, volume 3, page 271, Huffel says, quote, at this time, 1821, one made several tentative regeneration cuttings by successive fellings according to the new formula, but without success. End quote. At the present time, large areas of coppice and of coppice with standards characterize the holdings of the municipal and private owners, and the selection forest still plays a considerable part, even in the state forests. The method of shelter wood in compartments being still more under discussion than found in practice. The main credit for advance in silviculture direction, which belongs to the French foresters in particular, is the development of new and fertile ideas regarding the operations of thinnings. Here, the differentiation of the crop into the final harvest, la haut, and the nurse crop, le bas, see page 105, and the differentiation of the operations, par la halt and par la bas, seems to have been for the first time described by Bob in 1887. Indeed, the theory of thinnings, at least, seems to have been well understood by Buffon who advanced his theories in a memoir to the Academy of France in 1774, and gives a very clear exposition of the value of thinnings and improvement cuttings. And nevertheless, thinning practice, while often accentuated in the literature, is too often omitted in practice, or exercised only in long intervals, while otherwise silvicultural practice is excellent, especially in the coppice. Most valuable lessons may be had, especially from the experience in converting coppice into timber forest. At the International Congress of Silviculture, convening in connection with the Universal Exposition in 1900, supposedly the best home talent was re represented, but it cannot be said that anything new or striking or promotive of the art or science transpired. The desirability of establishing experiment stations outside the one in existence at Nancy, established in 1882, and the desirability of constructing yield tables still required arguments at this meeting. In the direction of forest organization, it is stated by Clavet that in 1860 only 900,000 acres of the state domain were under a regulated management, namely 380,000 acres in timber and 520,000 in coppice with standards, leaving about 1,500,000 acres at that time still merely exploited. The same writer states that of the corporation or communal forests, hardly any are under management for sustained yield and private forest management is not mentioned in this connection. Even today, less than one-third of the total area is under systematic control. In 1908, still, about 14% of the state forests were without working plans and 15% in selection forests. The method of forest organization employed, outside of the crew determinations of a felling budget in the selection forest, is an imitation of Cotta's combined area and volume allotment, with hardly any attempt at securing normality introduced in 1825. Characteristic and differing from the German model is the practice of actually co-locating in each district, canton, the periodic felling areas, affectations, on the ground so as to secure a schematic felling series or periodic block, serie. This is done often at great sacrifice. Lately various more pliable modifications have come into vogue, méthode de la faction unique, and freer methods, méthode de quartier de régénération. Somewhat similar to Eudike's stand management are proposed. Altogether, working plans such as elaborated in Germany are rare, and yield tables are still looked upon by Huffel as doubtfully useful. The management of the state forests is extremely conservative, large accumulations of old stock, the holding over of one quarter for reserve, and high rotations— only apparently based on maximum volume production since the, the statistical data are scanty, are characteristic. The opposite conditions appear in the private forests. 6. Education and Literature In the earlier times, the service established was, as we have seen, often, nay, mostly, in incompetent hands. The offices of forest masters were purchasable, were given to courtiers as benefices, and became hereditary. In all these, higher professional knowledge was unnecessary. The ignorance of the subordinates was as great as that of their German counterparts, but lasted longer. 
Hardly any book literature on the subject of forestry developed before the 19th century, and educational institutions had to wait until long past the beginning of that century. The first, and up to the present, only forest school came into existence after a considerable campaign directed by Baudrillard, Chief of Division, Administration General de Forêt, and Professor of Political Economy. His campaign in the Annales Forestières, the first volume of which appeared in 1808, and in other writings, as in his Dictionnaire des Eaux et Forêts, 1825, led to the establishment of the Forest School at Nancy in 1825. The first director of this school, Bernard de Rentz, having become acquainted with and befriended by G. L. Hartish and his assistant, afterwards his son-in-law and successor, Aldolf Parade, having studied under Cota, 1817-1818, in Tarant, this school introduced the science of forestry as it had been been developed in Germany. But later generations under Nanquette, Bagnery, Droyard, Bop, and Pouton, imbued with patriotism, attempted in a manner to strike out on original lines. As a consequence of the unpatriotic German tendencies in its first directors, the continuance of the school at Nancy was several times threatened, there being friction between the administration of the school and the service, which in 1844 came to a climax. Agents in the service, being employed without preparation in the school, a condition which lasted until 1856. Even to date, an active service of 15 years is considered equivalent to the education in the school for advancement in the service. In 1839, Lorenz was disgracefully displaced, in spite of his great merits, because he advocated too warmly the application of the superior system of regeneration under Shelterwood to replace the coppice and selection forest, an incident almost precisely repeated in the state of New York in abandoning its state college at Cornell University and in other respects the two cases appear parallel. Parade, the successor of Lorenz, being imbued with the same heretical doctrines, was constantly in trouble, and in 1847 a most savage attack in the legislature was launched which threatened the collapse of the school. This condition lasted until Parade's death, in 1864, when Nanquette assumed guidance of the school and steered in more peaceful waters by avoiding all ideas at reforms and innovations but otherwise improving the character of the school and introducing the third-year study. But he too was much criticized and in difficulties until 1880, nor was Pouton, his successor free from troubles, until in 1889 a new regime and new regulations were enacted. According to others, a reviewer of this volume, the difficulties which befell the institution were financial ones, quote, the too rapid conversion into timber forest reducing receipts which the minister of finance resented end quote. guillot's history of the school however leaves little doubt of the above interpretation being correct in the case of the state college at cornell university a later historian might similarly claim financial difficulties the school having actually been closed for lack of appropriation nevertheless political trickery was the real cause of this lack the school is organized on military lines. The students who intend to enter the state service are chosen from the graduates of the Institut National Agronomique of Paris, only a limited number being admitted. It has twelve professors, two for forestry, two each for natural science, mathematics, and one each for law, soil physics, and agriculture, for military science, and for German. A three-year course, which includes journeys through the forest regions of France, leads to government employment. Indeed, the first paid position as God General Stachier is attained after two years' study and before leaving school. For several years, 1867 to 1884, English students preparing for the Indian service received their instruction here, and 380 foreigners have received their education in this school since its foundation. For the education of the lower grades, an imperial rescript ordered the establishment of several schools which were, however, never organized. In 1863, were proposed and, in 1868, opened four schools, where efficient forest guards were to secure some knowledge that would assist them to advancement. Three of these schools persisted until 1883. In 1873, an additional school for silviculture for the education of under-foresters was organized at Bar Filmohen, where annually a limited number of students are permitted to enter. This institution has persisted to date. The French forestry literature has never been prolific, and to this day occupies still a limited amount of shelf room. 
The first book on record is a translation of the well-known volume of the Italian, Peter de Crescentius, translated at the instance of Charles V in 1373. In the 16th century, we have reference to an encyclopedic volume, probably similar to the German Hausfeta, by Oliver de Serre, Théâtre d'Agriculture et Messnage de Champ, in which a chapter is devoted to the forests. During the 18th century, just as in Germany, the Camaralis, we have seen in France a number of high-class writings, not by foresters, but by savants or students of natural history, the names of Huillemur, Dramel, Buffon, and Michaud, appearing with memoirs transmitted to the Academy of France, the highest literary and scientific body of men on subjects relating to forestry. Riamur, in his Reflexions sur l'état de forêt, in 1721, recommended the conversion of coppice forests into timber forests by a system of thinnings, but it is evident that his words were not heard beyond the academy. Duhamel, in 1755, 1764, and 1780, repeats the recommendation of Riamour in his three memoirs, semi Plantation, Exploitation des Bois, and Traité de la Physique des Arbres, in which he exhibits considerable learning, while Buffon, the great naturalist, in 1739 and after, presented several memoirs on forestry subjects full of excellent advice. Farin de Fenil, another one of the academicians, but also one of the conservators, is on record with two memoirs in 1790 and 1791 on the management of coppice and timber forests in which also the theory of thinnings was well developed. But among the foresters of the service there seems not to have been sufficient education to appreciate these writings, or, with the exception of Guillot, with his Manuel Forestier, 1770, to bring forth any contributions to the literature and art until the 19th century. In 1803 we find the first encyclopedic volume in Traité de l'Allemangement des Forêts, which was followed in 1805 by a very incorrect translation of Hartisch Lehrbuch, both by Baudrillard, professor of political economy, who also published in twelve volumes his Traité général des Hauts et Forêts, Pertuis in 1796, and Dralet, a forester in 1807, also brought out treatises on forest management, which include all branches of the subject. According to Huffel, the foresters of this period, Louis the Fifteenth and Sixteenth, were of superior character, and forestry in France was the first in the world. The writings of French authors were being translated into German and studied by foreign foresters. He has to admit, however, that the majority of these authors were not really members of the Forest Service. In 1836 appeared Parade's A Corps Elementaire de Culture de Bois, an excellent book recording the teachings of Hartish and Cotta. This seems to have been all sufficient until 1873 at least. Such things as yield tables are still a mere wish. When Tassi wrote his Etude, etc., in 1858, while de Salomon a little later reproduced Cotta's yield tables, and to this day this needful tool of the forester is still almost absent at least in the literature of France. Nanquette, Broyard, Barnery, Pouton, Rousse, Bob, all directors or professors at the forest school, enrich the French literature by volumes on silviculture and forest management, and Henri on soil physics. He also translated from the German Volnies De Composition des Matières Organiques. It is claimed by Guillot that a truly French science of forestry dates from Broyard's Corps de Management in 1878. De Moncy's Reboisement de Montagne, 1882, is a classic volume. Of more modern book literature may be mentioned three voluminous publications, namely Traité des Arbres by Mouillefer, 1892-1898 in three volumes, and Traité d'Exploitation Commerciale des Bois by Mati in two volumes, and Guillot's Corps de Droit Forestier in two volumes. A very complete work on valuation of damage under the misleading title, In saint and Forêt, was published by Jacot in 1903. But the latest and perhaps most ambitious work in the French language, and especially of intense interest from the historical point of view, tracing not only the development of forest policies but of silvicultural and managerial practices in France, is G. Hoffel's Economie Forestière, in three volumes published 1904 to 1907. There should not be forgotten as among the non-professional promoters of forest questions, Chevandier, a chemist and manufacturer, who in 1844 made investigations regarding the influence of irrigation on wood growth and on the influence of fertilizers, 
and, in connection with their time, laid the foundation for timber physics. One bi-weekly magazine, Revue des Hauts et Forêts, in existence for fifty years, the successor to the Annal Horstier, began in 1808, satisfies the need of current literature. Besides the journals of various forestry associations, among which the Bulletin de la Société de France Comte et Belfort has for a long time taken a prominent rank. A very active propagandist literary and association work has within the last decades been inaugurated, and forestry associations of local character abound. Among these, the Touring Club, a sporting association with some 16,000 members and 364 branches, is active by writing out prizes and promoting wasteland planting. Through its agency, some 4,000 acres had been planted by 1910, some 900 nurseries furnishing plant material. An active section of silviculture in the Société d'Agricultures some time ago absorbed the Forestry Association and is also doing practical work in the direction most needed, improvement of forestry practice among private woodland owners. 7. Colonial Policies The French possess extensive colonies in Africa, Asia, America, and Oceania, covering not less than 4 million square miles with over 90 million people, to some of which at least they have extended some features of their forest policy, notably in Algeria, Tunis, Indochina, and Madagascar. Algeria, which was conquered in 1828, is about four-fifths of the size of France, but only 5.5% is forested. Besides the desert, there are two forest regions, the northern slope, the so-called Tel, abutting on the Mediterranean, which, with 20% forested, contains the most valuable forests of cork oak, various other oaks, and Aleppo pine. In the high plateau to the south, a region of steppes with about 6% forested, mostly with brushwood. The adjoining Tunis also contains some 2 million acres of forest, a part of which clothed with the valuable cork oak. Although the population does not exceed 5 million, import of wood from Sweden and elsewhere to nearly $1 million in amount is necessary. The first advancement in civilization led to widespread destruction of the originally larger forest area, fire and pasture being especially destructive. Before the French occupation, the 8 million acres of forest were all, as usual in the Mussulmans' empires, the property of the sultan, but were used like communal property by the people. By 1871, the larger portion, some 6 million acres, remained in possession of the state, much encumbered by rights of user. At the same time, considerable areas, some 700,000 acres, had been ceded to communities outright, and others, 1.25 million acres, had been sold to private parties. At first, these latter lands were let for exploitation of the cork oak on 40-year leases, later extended to 90 years with indemnities for damage by fire, an incentive to allow these to run, until in 1870 the fire damage having become onerous, all areas burned after 1863 were gratuitously ceded to the contractors. More than one-third the areas involved and the other two-thirds were then sold at a ridiculously low price and under the easiest conditions of payment in the same shameful manner in which the timberlands in the United States were given away. In 1836, a forest administration for the state domain was inaugurated, but the unfortunate division of powers between military and civil authorities was a hindrance to effective improvement of conditions. The fire ravages of 1871 led to a thorough reorganization under the direction of Tassi in 1873. Nevertheless, in 1900, Lefebvre, inspector of forests in his book Les Forêts de Algérie, still complains that the forests are being ruined, especially by pasturing, the means allowed the administration being too niggardly measured. The forest code of the home country and special laws enacted from time to time applies. The administration of the state and communal forest is directly under the home department and is regulated in similar manner. A reorganization and a special forest code for Algiers was enacted in 1903. This legislation relies still largely on the general principles of the Code of 1827. The most interesting features are the provision for expropriation in addition to the state domain of forests, the preservation of which is of public interest, and the rigorous forest fire legislation, which permits the treatment of incendiaries as insurrectionists, makes the extinction of forest fires a duty of the forest officials, and provides the forcible establishment of fire lines or rides between neighbors. In the forests placed under the forestry regime, permits from the Governor-General are required for clearing. 
For the administration of these properties, the state receives 10% of the gross yield. Reforested hilltops or slopes and sand dunes are relieved from taxes for 30 years, burnt areas for 10 years. In the other African possessions, unregulated exploitation of the tropical forests, largely for byproducts like kuchuk, cola, and fine furniture woods, is still the order of the day, except in Madagascar, which, with 25 to 30 million acres of tropical forest area, was in 1900 provided with a forest service, which is under the Minister of Colonies. Here, a license system is in vogue, giving concessions to exploit limited areas for a given time, at an annual rent of less than 1% per acre per year. The concessions run from 5 to 20 years, and on 12,500 acres or more, the time of their duration being extended from the lowest term for one year for every 2,500 acres. Police regulations and fines are intended to check abuses and to regulate the rights of users exercised by natives. In Indochina, Cochin China, Cambodia, Annam, Tonkin, the total forest area is still unknown. Only that of Cochin China, with 2.5 million acres, and of Cambodia, with 10 million acres, can be stated, and Cochin China seems to possess the only approach to a forest service. Although it is estimated that in 1901 in the whole of Indochina, with 18 million people, some 85 million cubic feet of wood were cut, nine-tenths firewood, an import of over $200,000 worth of workwood from Europe was needed. The first attempts at regulating forest use in these Asiatic possessions date back to 1862, when exploitation was confined to delimited areas. The administration, however, remained inefficient, and under impracticable and heterogeneous orders, which were issued from time to time, devastation progressed with little hindrance. For Cochin China, a more definite forest policy was formulated in 1894-95, when not only the state domain but also the private forest property was placed under the regime forestier. The supervision of the private forest consists in requiring the marking of trees to be cut by government agents, and a permit for their removal. The state forests are of two classes, reserves in which all cutting is forbidden, only some 200,000 acres, and those in which licenses to cut may operate. Such licenses are given for one year and for a price of 100 piastres. The villagers have free use of the less valuable woods their only obligation being to assist in the protection against fire and theft. A real forest service was not instituted until 1901, a director with four assistants being placed in charge under the Department of Agriculture. Until recently, reports of the deplorable condition due to the absence of technical management reached the outside, but lately, 1911, the Governor-General discussing the situation not only speaks approvingly of the forest service, which on the two million acres under its immediate management had, by 1909, trebled the revenue, but talks of extending its activities to planting up waste places in order to secure favorable water conditions for irrigating lands. The rest of the colonies are being merely exploited. End of section 12. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 13 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. Section 13 Russia and Finland. While Germany and France were forced into the adoption of forest policies through necessity after the natural woods had been largely destroyed or devastated, Russia started upon a conservative forest management, long before the day of absolute necessity seemed to have arrived. Indeed, even today Russia is one of the largest and increasingly growing exporter of forest products in the world its annual export having grown in the five years 1903 to 1908 from four to six million tons and from 35 to 62 million dollars. A vast territory of untouched woods is still at her command, representing roughly two-thirds of the forest area of Europe. The vast empire, second only to the British Empire in extent, gradually acquired since the 15th century, occupies in Europe, including Finland, somewhat over two million square miles, 
with over 120 million inhabitants, and in Asia somewhat over 6.5 million square miles, with only 30 to 40 million people. Until 1906, when as a result of a revolution, a kind of representative government was secured, the hereditary czar was ostensibly and by title an autocrat, governing with the assistance of four great councils and twelve ministers, but in reality the government was in the hands of a bureaucracy and court cabal, to a large extent corrupt, and hence the many good laws and institutions of which we read may not always be found executed in practice as intended. The European section of the country is divided into ninety-eight governments or provinces, each under a governor, who is, however, largely dependent on the central power. The large territory of Siberia is divided into three governor-generalships. Much of it, as well as of the other Asiatic provinces, is still unorganized, undeveloped, and unexplored, or at least little known. Originally used mainly as a penal colony for criminal and political exiles, since the completion of the great Trans-Siberian Railway, the country has been peopled by Russian farmers. Both European Russia and Siberia are in the main vast plains, the former sloping northwestward from the Ural Mountains in the east and from the Caucasus in the south, and the latter from the Altai, Lion, and Yabloni Mountains north to the Arctic Ocean. Both sections exhibit in the southern ranges the effect of continental climates, prairie and plains country, the steppe, and in its northern ranges the effect of an arctic climate, short hot summers and long severe winters, tundra and swamps. 1. Forest Conditions and Ownership Both the forest area and the ownership conditions vary very much throughout the country. Russian statistics are very unreliable and are based on estimates rather than enumerations, and vary from year to year. So little is known of conditions in Asia, where Russia occupies a territory three times as large as its European possessions, that we can dispose of them briefly. There exists a vast forested area, almost unknown as to its extent and contents or value. This area is mainly located in Siberia, and although its extent is uncertain, it is known to exceed 700 million acres but it is also known that its character is very variable, and much of it is taiga, or swamp forest, much of it devastated, and much of it in precarious condition, fires having run and still running over large portions, destroying it to such an extent that in several of the provinces within the forest belt, the question of wood supplies is even now a troublesome one. The natives are especially reckless, and devastation difficult to control. The railroad has only increased the evils. Here in Siberia, the first attempt at a management was made in 1897, in the government forests, which are estimated at over 300 million acres. In addition, about 400 million acres have been declared reserved forests. Not one-third, however, even of the government forests, is well stocked, and less than 4 million acres are under some form of management. In European Russia, the forest area comprises about 465 million acres, or 36% of the land area, the population being now over 120 million, nearly one-half escaped from serfdom only since 1861. The forest area per capita is only about four acres, somewhat less than in the United States half of what is claimed for sweden and norway although seven times as large as that of germany or france it will be seen therefore that russia although still an exporting country has reasons for a conservative policy even if only the needs of the domestic population are considered which alone probably consumes more than the annual increment of the whole forest area and the consumption is growing with the growth of civilization as appears from the increase of wood-consuming industries, which in 1877 showed a product of eight million dollars, in 1887 of twelve and a half million, in 1897 of fifty million dollars. This assertion that the era of overcutting has actually arrived 
may be made in spite of the stated fact that in the northern provinces only two-fifths of what is supposed to be a proper felling budget is cut and marketed, and that other most uncertain estimates make the cut 17 cubic feet per acre of productive forest area, and the annual growth on still more uncertain basis 31 cubic feet. The same reasons that operate in the United States contribute to wasteful practices, namely uneven distribution of forest and population. As in the United States, the East and West are or were well wooded, with a forestless agricultural region between. So in Russia, the North and the South, Caucasus Mountains, are well wooded, with a forestless region, the steppe, between. This leads, as with us, to an uneconomical exploitation of the woods, the inferior materials being wasted because not paying for their transportation in one section and dearth of timber and fuel wood in the other section. The two most northern provinces of Archangel and Vologda, in size to all Germany, are wooded to the extent of 75 and 89 percent, respectively and the fourteen northern provinces together contain nearly one-half the entire forest area. Here the forest covers sixty-four percent of the land area, and nowhere below twenty percent, and the acreage per capita ranges from three to over two hundred. These largely unsettled provinces are the basis of the active wood export trade, and as in the similarly conditioned areas of North America, the territory is devastated by fires, which sweep again and again over the large areas without check. Southern Russia, excepting the Caucasus, is largely prairie or steppe, forest cover sinking below 20%, on the whole down to 2%, and less than one-half acre per capita. Altogether, one-half the country and three-fourths of the population are, with less than 14% of the forest area, exposed to a dearth of timber. The northern forest, the most economic factor, is composed largely of pure or mixed coniferous woods, 74%, principally Norway spruce, 34%, and Scotch pine, 29.5%, with only slight admixtures of larch and fir, and more frequently white birch. Open stand, comparatively poor development and slow growth, characteristic of northern climate, reduce its productive capacity, while frequent bogs and other natural waste places outside those produced by mismanagement reduce its productive area by not less than 20%. Toward the south, deciduous species are more frequent, oak finally becoming the prevailing timber and farming forests with beech, maple, ash, and elm as admixtures. As the plains are approached, pure deciduous forest indicates the change of climate. The forest of the Caucasus is principally of coniferous composition. There are six classes of forest property, the government domain, the appanage or imperial family, crown forests, private forests, peasant or communal forests, institute or corporation forests, and forests of mixed ownership in which government and private owners participate. The larger part of the forest area of European Russia is in control of the crown or state, namely 278 million acres, or a little less than two-thirds of the whole, and a similar amount in Asia, beside the so-called apanage forests of 14 million acres, set aside for the support of the court. Especially the northern forest is in government control. In some governments, Archangel, the entire area, 67% of the domain forest, lies in the two governments of Archangel and Wologda. In the less wooded districts, state property is insignificant. The area under government control in Europe and Asia is estimated in the official report for 1908 at around 957 million acres. This is, however, not the exclusive property of the state. Only about 260 million acres are so claimed. The larger balance includes 170 million acres, which are to be apportioned to the liberated peasants, 200 million acres in which the government is only part owner, 
or the ownership is in dispute, and the rest is only temporarily placed under the management or surveillance of the administration. Yet 60% in Europe and 13% in Asia is exclusive state property. In 1907, the area in Europe under working plans of the Forest Administration, however, was only 48 million acres, 86 million having been examined for working plans. Of the state property in Europe, 34% is spruce forest, 30% pine, and 26% mixed conifer forest, altogether 88% of coniferous timber. The Asiatic area is also over 80% coniferous. The appanage or crown forests, the yield of which goes towards maintenance of the imperial family, comprise about 16 million acres, or 3.4% private forest property to the extent of over 100 million acres, 23 percent, is most developed in the Baltic provinces and along the Vistula. Mining corporations and other institutes own about 7 million acres. The peasants, who until 1861 were mere serfs and had no ownership of any kind, being supplied with their necessities by the landed proprietors, still largely supply themselves in the northern provinces by the exercise of rights of users from the public domain on designated areas. In the central and southern provinces, farm and forest land, the latter to the extent of nearly 40 million acres were given to them in communal ownership. As stated above, about 170 million acres classed as government domain still awaits partition and cession to the peasants. Two. Development of Forest Policy The first record of attention to the woods as a special property dates from Michael, the founder, and Alexis, the second of the House of Romanov, the former becoming Tsar in 1613, the latter in 1645. He it was who began to introduce Western civilization. He confined himself, however, to regulating property rights, which up to that time had remained somewhat undefined the forest, as elsewhere, being considered more or less public property. He issued deeds of ownership, or at least granted exclusive rights to the use of forests, somewhat similar as was done in the ban forests. Soldiers alone were permitted to help themselves, even in private forests, to the wood they required. Protection against theft and fire was also provided. The peasants, being serfs, were bound to the glebe, and had, of course, no property rights, being maintained by the bounty of the seigneurs. Alexis' successor, the far-seeing Peter the Great, who in his travels in Germany and other European countries had no doubt been imbued with ideas of conservatism, inaugurated in the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century, a far-reaching restrictive policy which had two objects in view namely economic use of wood which he had learned to appreciate while playing carpenter in amsterdam and the preservation of ship timber which his desire to build up a navy dictated all forests for thirty-five miles alongside of rivers were declared in ban and placed under the supervision of the newly organized administration of crown forests in these ban forests the felling of timbers fit for shipbuilding was forbidden minute regulations as to the proper use of wood for the purposes for which it was most fit were prescribed and the use of the saw instead of the axe was ordered these rules were to prevail in all forests with a few exceptions and penalties were to be exacted for contraventions this good beginning experienced a short setback under catherine i seventeen twenty five peter's wife who influenced by her minister Menshikov abolished the forest administration and the penalties and reduced the number and size of ban forests. But the entire legislation was reenacted within three years after Catherine's death, 1727, under Anna Ivanovna's reign, and many new prescriptions for the proper use of wood were added and additional penalties enforced. At this time, under the influence of a German forest expert, Fokel, the increase of forest area by sowing oak, etc., in the poorly wooded districts was also inaugurated, and this planting was made obligatory, not only on the administration of crown forests, but also upon private owners, 
who in case of default were to lose their land and have it reforested by the forest administration to Fockel's initiative it is also to be credited the celebrated larch forest on the gulf of finland these restrictions of private rights and the tutelage exercised by the forest administration were abolished in toto by catherine ii in 1788 and although it was reported by the admiralty concerned in the supply of shipbuilding materials that as a consequence the cutting especially of oak timber was proceeding rapidly no new restrictive but rather an ameliorative policy was attempted such as for instance the offering of prizes for plantations in certain localities by the provincial governors upon the abolishment of the serfdom of the peasants under alexander ii in eighteen sixty three lands both farm and woodlands were allotted to them and in this partition in some parts as much as twenty five to fifty per cent of this forest property was handed over to them immediately a general slaughtering both by peasants and by private owners who had suffered by losing the services of the serfs was inaugurated leading to wholesale devastation servitudes or rights of user also prevailed in some districts and proved extremely destructive by eighteen sixty four complaints in regard to forest devastation had become so frequent that a movement for reform was begun by the czar which led to the promulgation of a law in eighteen sixty seven followed by a number of others during the next decade designed to remedy the evils this was done by restricting the acreage that might be felled by forbidding clearings and by giving premiums for good management and plantations finally in eighteen seventy five a special commission was charged with the elaboration of a general order which after years of hearing of testimony and deliberation was promulgated in eighteen eighty eight a comprehensive law for the conservation of forests private and otherwise which in many respects resembles the french in other respects the swedish conservation laws the devastation and its evil consequences on water flow and soil conditions had been especially felt in the southern districts adjoining the steppe and these experiences were the immediate cause for enactment of the law which however was framed to apply conditionally to the entire european russia the law makes an interesting distinction between protective protected and non-protective or unprotected forests as well as between different ownership classes and it makes distinction of four regions as to the extent of its application in the far northern governments densely forested sixty per cent and thinly populated only the protective forests are under the operations of the law in the caucasus also none of the restrictions of private property except in protective and communal peasant forests are to apply perhaps because the forest area averaging not over seventeen per cent is there largely owned by members of the imperial house and by nobles in certain districts adjoining the northern zone with thirty seven per cent forest also only the last two classes of forest namely protective and communal properties with institute forests added are subject to the provisions of the law the rest a territory of over one million square miles with only twelve per cent in forest is subject to all the provisions of the law which is remarkably democratic in treating state imperial and private forests alike this law declares as protective forests to be managed under special plans prescribed by the crown forest department those forest areas which protect shifting sands and dunes the shores of rivers canals and other waters and those on the slopes of mountains where they serve to prevent erosion landslides and avalanches conversion to these protective forests to farm use is forbidden and the use of a clearing system in forest management as well as pasturage and other uses supposed to be detrimental may be interdicted and the method of management may be prescribed an instruction regarding the execution of the law promulgated in eighteen eighty nine prohibited clear cutting in conifer forests permitting only selection forest and in especially endangered localities only the use of the dry wood and such trees as interfere with natural reproduction protected forests are those which are located at the headwaters and upper reaches of streams and their affluents 
Here the rules as regards clearing, mismanagement, reforestation, and pasture applicable to the non-protective forests prevail, except that clearing may be prohibited or permitted, if the committee deems it not dangerous owing to the small size of the clearing. In forests which are not protective forests, conversion into farms or clearing with the sanction of the committee is permitted, if thereby the estate is improved for example, if the soil is fit for orchards and vineyards. Such clearing may also be allowed if the soil is fit for temporary field use, but in that case the area must be eventually reforested. Clearing is also permitted if another formerly farmed parcel of the same size has been reforested at least three years prior to the proposed clearing, or if in artificial plantations the growth is not yet 20 years old also in a few special cases where property boundaries are to be rounded off roads to be located etc if after six months from the time of the application the committee has not forbidden the clearing it is considered as permitted it is also forbidden to make fellings which prevent natural regeneration and the running of cattle in young growth is prohibited private owners are not required but are permitted to submit working plans and if these are accepted, they are exempted from any other restrictions. Such plans may be considered as accepted if the committee does not express itself within one year. All clearings made in contravention to the committee's decision must be replanted within a prescribed time, or may be forcibly reforested by the committee. The most interesting feature, because thoroughly democratic, is the creation of the local forest protection committees, which are formed in each province and district, and composed of various representatives of the local administration, one or two foresters included, the justice of the peace or other justice, the county council, and two elected forest owners, in all nine to eleven members, under the presidency of the governor. The committee is vested with large powers. It decides without appeal what areas are included in protective forests and approves of the working plans for these, as well as for the unreserved forests. It determines what clearings may be made, and exercises wide police powers with reference to all forest matters, working in cooperation with the Forest Administration, which latter has the duty of making working plans free of charge for the reserved forest, and at the expense of the owner for the private unreserved forests. Owners of the latter are, however, at liberty to prepare their own plans subject to approval. Appeal from decisions of the forest committees lies through the Committee of the Minister of Crown Lands and Minister of the Interior. In case the owner refuses to incur the extra expense arising from measures imposed upon him, the domain ministry may expropriate him but the owner may recover within ten years by paying costs with six per cent interest in addition to the sale price in addition to the above cited and other restrictive measures some ameliorative provisions are also found all protected forests are free from taxes forever those artificially planted also for thirty years some of the best forest officials are detailed to give advice gratuitously to forest owners forest reviser, instructors, and prizes are given for the best results of silvicultural operations. At the recommendation of the forest committees, medals or money rewards or other distinctions are given to forest guards and forest managers of private as well as public forests. Plant material is distributed free or at cost price, and working plans for protective forests are made free of charge. The Imperial Loan Bank advances long-term loans on forests, based upon detailed working plans made by the state, which ensure a conservative management. In 1900, over 7 million acres were in this way mortgaged under such management. The minutest details are elaborated in the instructions for the execution of this most comprehensive law how far this law is really executed and what its results so far have been it would be difficult to ascertain it is however believed that it has worked satisfactorily by 1900 1 1.5 million acres had been declared protection forests nearly 2 million protected or river forests and nearly 100 million private and communal forests had been placed under the regime 
In 1907, the total area under the regime had grown to over 136 million acres. Of private forests, 18 million acres in 6,015 forests were being managed according to working plans made or approved by the forest committees. In these plans, usually the strip system or seed tree system with natural regeneration under 60-year rotation for conifers and at least 30-year rotation for broadleaf forest is provided. In 1903, the application of the law was extended to the Caucasus, the Transcaucasian, and other southern provinces. But in the absence of suitable personnel and in a half-civilized country, no result for the immediate future may be anticipated. The surveillance of the execution of this law lies with the assistance of the forest committees in the hands of the State Forest Administration. This latter, centralized in the Department of Agriculture, consists of a director general with two vice directors and so-called Bureau of Forests with seven division chiefs, a number of vice inspectors and assistants. The local administration in the governments is represented by the direction of Crown Lands with a superintendent or supervisor and several inspectors. The Crown Forests, divided into some 1,260 administrative units, are under the administration of superintendents, with foresters and guards of several degrees. The whole service comprised, in 1908, about 3,790 higher officials, some 850 of whom in the central office at St. Petersburg, and over 30,000 lower officials, some 20,000 of whom are educated under foresters. Large as this force appears to be, it is small in comparison with the acreage and inadequate. Although the net income from the 300 million acres of state forest which are actually worked is now close to $30 million, the expenditures being near $6 million, the pay of the officials is such as to almost force them to find means of subsistence at the cost of their charges. Perhaps nowhere else is there so much machinery and so much regulation with so little execution in practice. Nevertheless, progress is being made in gradually improving matters, and the forest property, or at least the cut, has become more and more valuable. While in the middle of the last century the income from the domain forest was only $500,000, by 1892 it had grown to $10 million dollars by 1901 to $23 million, and in 1908 to nearly $30 million, besides several million dollars worth of free wood. In 1908, the department spent over half a million dollars on planting and assisting natural regeneration. Timber is sold as a rule to contractors by the tree or acre, and a diameter limit is almost the only restriction. In 1897, however, an arrangement was made by which the lumberman was obliged to reforest, or at least pay a certain tax into a planting fund, and a part payment of $2 to $4 per acre as guarantee must be made before cutting. This order, however, has remained mostly a dead letter, the buyer preferring to allow his guarantee to lapse. In 1906, there stood $3 million to the credit of this planting fund, and only half of it had been applied. Meanwhile, the unplanted area increases, since natural generation generally proves a failure. Meanwhile, the unplanted area increases, since natural regeneration generally proves a failure. 3. Education and Literature The attempts at forestry education date back to the year 1732, when a number of foresters were imported from Germany to take charge of the forest management as well as of the education of foresters, each forstmeister having six pupils assigned to him. This method failing to produce results, the interest in ship timber suggested a course in forestry at the Naval Academy, which was instituted in 1800. Soon the need of a larger number of educated foresters led to the establishment of several separate forest schools, one at Zarskoy Siloy near St. Petersburg in 1803, another at Kozlovsk in 1805, and a third at St. Petersburg in 1808. This latter, under the name of the Forest Institute, absorbed the other two, and from 1813 has continued to exist through many vicissitudes. Now with 15 professors and instructors, 
and an expenditure of nearly two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and over five hundred students it is the largest forest school in the world it prepares in a four years course for the higher positions in the forest service the history of this forest institute is practically the history of forestry in russia a second school at novo alexandria near warsaw was instituted in eighteen sixty in these schools as in the methods of management german influence is everywhere visible in addition to these schools chairs of forestry were instituted in the petrovsk school of rural economy in moscow and in the riga polytechnic institute and also in seven intermediate schools of rural economy in eighteen eighty eight ten secondary schools were established after austrian pattern for the lower or middle service rangers and under foresters their number by nineteen hundred having been increased to thirty in nineteen o eight to thirty three with four hundred and sixty students these are boarding schools in the woods where a certain number of the students are taught free of charge the maximum number of those admitted being ten to twenty at each school the course is of two years duration and is mainly directed to practical work and theoretical study in silviculture the total expense of such a school is about thirty three hundred dollars of which the state contributes twenty five hundred dollars the total expenditure in nineteen o eight being eighty four thousand one hundred and thirty four dollars a number of experiment stations were established in various parts of the country by the administration of crown lands and a very considerable and advanced literature testifies to the good education and activity of the higher forest service two forestry journals lesnage journal since eighteen seventy and lesopromikalny vestnik the first bimonthly the latter weekly besides several lesser ones keep the profession informed there are in existence several general societies for the encouragement of silviculture probably the oldest which ceased to exist in eighteen fifty was the imperial russian society for the advancement of forestry which was founded in eighteen thirty two it published a magazine and provided translations of foreign books among which the forest mathematics of the noted german forester konig who also prepared yield tables for the society a society of professional foresters was founded at st petersburg in eighteen seventy one another exists in moscow and recently two associations for the development of forest planting in the steppe have been formed among the prominent writers and practitioners there should especially be mentioned theodore karlowish arnold who is recognized as the father of russian forestry he was the soul of the forest organization work for which he drew up the instructions in eighteen forty five and as professor afterwards director of the institute for agronomy and forestry at moscow since eighteen fifty seven he became the teacher of most of the present practitioners finally he became the head of the forest department in the ministry of apanages where he remained until his death in nineteen o two he is the author of several classical works on silviculture forest mensuration forest management etc and in conjunction with dr w a titsinoff published an encyclopedic work in three volumes in the first volume rusland's wald eighteen ninety which has been translated into german the author makes an extended plea for improved forestry practice and describes and argues at length the provisions of the law of eighteen eighty eight in eighteen ninety five he published a history of forestry in germany france and russia of other prominent foresters who have advanced forestry in russia we may cite count vargase de bedemar who made the first attempt to prepare russian growth and yield tables in eighteen forty to eighteen fifty professor a f rudsky who was active at the forest institute until a few years ago developed in his volumes especially the mathematical branches and methods of forest organization the names of tursky kravchinsky and kaigadorov are known to russian students of dendrology and silviculture and among the younger generations the names of morozov nesterov orlov and tolsky may be mentioned it is well known how prominent russian investigators have become in the natural sciences 
and to foresters the work of the soil physicists Ototsky and Dukachev would at least be familiar. 4. Forestry Practice While then a very considerable activity in scientific direction exists, the practical application of forestry principles is less developed than one would expect, especially in view of the stringent laws. So far, not much more than conservative lumbering is the rule. Generally speaking, the state and crown forests are better managed than the private, many of which are being merely exploited, and in the northern departments large areas remain still inaccessible. Some notable exceptions to the general mismanagement of private forests are furnished by some of those owned by the nobility, like those of Count Uroff, with 150,000 acres under model management by a German forester, and Count Stroganoff with over 1 million acres under first-class organization with a staff of over 230 persons. A regular forest organization was first attempted in the forests attached to iron furnace properties in 1840. By this time, some 100 million acres have come under regulated management, half of the area being government forests. The method of regulation employed is that of area division and sometimes area allotment, according to CODA. In some regions, a division by rides into compartments, ranging from 60 to 4,000 acres each, according to intensity of exploitation, has been effected. It is estimated that at the present rate of progress, it would take 300 years to complete the work of organization. The selection method is still largely employed, a felling budget by number of trees and volume being determined in the incompletely organized areas, while a clearing system with artificial reforestation is used in most cases where a complete yield calculation has been made. The rotations employed are from 60 to 100 years for timber forest, 30 to 60 years for coppice. In the pineries, the strip system in echelons is mostly in vogue, the strips being made 108 feet wide, leaving four seed trees per acre, and on the last strip, which is left standing for five years, the number is increased to eight, which are left as overholders. This method, according to some, seems to secure satisfactory reproduction. To get rid of undesirable species, especially aspen and birch, these are girdled. In spruce forest, 50 to 60 percent of the trees are left in the fellings, when, after three to four years, the natural regeneration requires often repair, which is done, if at all, by bunch planting. After eight to ten years, the balance of the old growth is removed. Well, for a long time, natural regeneration was alone relied upon. Now, at least, artificial assistance is more and more frequently practiced. Yet, although over 2 million acres were under clearing system, not more than 5% of the revenue, or $100,000, was in 1898 allowed for planting, as against 7.5% in Prussia. The total budget of expenses then remaining below $3 million. But ten years later, over half a million dollars was employed by the government in planting, the planting fund contributed by the lumbermen furnishing the means. The Forest Administration of the Province of Poland, where the state owns over 1.5 million acres, was for some time independent, but about 1875 was reorganized and placed under the Central Bureau at St. Petersburg. Although the forests of Poland are the most lucrative to the government, and with good market and high prices for wood, which are now rapidly increasing, would allow intensive management, the stinginess of the administration, the low moral tone of the personnel, and long-established bad practice have retarded the introduction of better methods. The private forests of Poland comprise over 4.5 million acres and are mostly not much better treated than the state forest. In the absence of any restrictive policy, they have diminished by 25% in the last 20 years. Considerable efforts have been made towards reforesting the steppes in southern Russia, first as in our own prairies and plains by private endeavor, but lately with more and more direct assistance of the State Forest Administration. This planting was begun by German colonists at the end of the 18th century, 
but without encouraging results, although over 25,000 acres had been planted by the middle of the 19th century. Since 1843, the government has had two experimental forest reserves in the steppes of the governments of Ekaterinoslav and Turaid, on which some 10,000 acres have been planted, the originator of this work being von Graf, a German forester, whose plantations, made with 8,000 plants to the acre, are still the best. Later, the number of plants was reduced to one half, and the results have not been satisfactory. Altogether, planting on large areas on soils unfit for the purpose and by wrong methods has produced poor results. At present, the policy is not to create large bodies of forest, but to plant small strips of 20 to 80 yards square in regular distribution, which are to serve as windbreaks. And the result has been satisfactory, especially in the government of Samara. There are now annually 2,000 acres added to these plantations. The reclamation of shifting sands and sand dunes has also received considerable attention, and to some extent the reboisement of mountain slopes in the Crimea and Caucasus. Of the former, some 10 million acres are in existence in European Russia, and in the province of Warrenesh alone, each year 100,000 acres are added. For 50 years, sporadical work in their recovery was done. Not until 1891 and 1892, when two droughty famine years had led to an investigation of agricultural conditions, was a systematic attempt proposed, and this was begun in 1897. By 1902, some 80,000 acres had been fixed, and by 1904, 150,000 acres. In this work, the government contributes 36% of the cost, the benefited communities, the balance. In addition, 1,500 square miles of swamps in western Russia were reclaimed by extensive canals and recovered with meadow and forest at a cost of $300,000, of which the imperial treasury paid one-third, the owners one-half, the local government the balance. While rational forest management, as we have seen, is far from being generally established, the government tries at least to prevent waste and to pave the way from exploitation to regulated management. End of section 13. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. Section 14 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Taylor Rourke. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernow. Section 14. Finland. The Grand Duchy of Finland in the northeast of Russia is still, in some respects, independent of Russia. Finland, the land of a thousand lakes and of most extensive forests, is hardly less important as a wood producer than Russia itself. Its wood exports amounting at present to around 200 million cubic feet and over $25 million in value, represent over 50% of its trade and its most important resource. Settled in the 7th century by an Aryan tribe, the Finns, congeners of the Magyars, who subdued the aboriginal Laplanders, Finland became by conquest in the 12th century and remained for 500 years a province of Sweden. In the wars between Sweden and Russia, parts of this province were conquered by Russia, and finally, in 1809, Sweden lost the whole. But the Finns succeeded in preserving national unity and partial independence under a constitution, adopted in 1772 and recognized by the Tsar. Finland stands very much in the same relation to Russia as does Hungary to Austria, the union being merely a personal one. The Tsar is the ruler or Grand Duke, but the administration is otherwise largely separate from that of the empire under a governor-general appointed by the Tsar, and a senate of 18 members at Helsingfors, 
with a national parliament of the four estates, nobles, clergy, burghers, peasants, which convenes every five years, the Tsar having the veto power over its legislation. The War Department of Russia, however, is in charge of military affairs, and other departments seem to be under more or less supervision of the Russian administration. Lately, repressive measures are threatening or have nearly accomplished the destruction of this autonomy. Of the 145,000 square miles of territory, nearly 50% is occupied by lakes and bogs, marshes or tundra. Less than 9 million acres, 9.7%, is in farms, and 37.5 million acres, or 42%, is forest land, actual or potential. The major part of this is located in the northern and eastern sections, where the population is scanty, agriculture little developed, and sand soils prevail. Beyond the 69th degree, forest growth ceases, and naturally near the forest limit, the scrubby growth partakes of the character of all northern forests. Not more than 2.5 million acres, mostly in the southwestern sections, are actually under cultivation the population being short of 2.5 million. The rigorous climate makes a large consumption of fuel wood necessary, and since houses are also mostly built of wood, the home consumption is over 32 cubic feet per capita. Over 10 million cubic feet of pine are consumed in making tar, and a like amount for paper pulp. The total cut is in the neighborhood of 370 million cubic feet, four-fifth of which comes from private forests of the middle and southern area, and over one-third of it is being exported. The country generally is a tableland with occasional low hills. The forest consists principally of pine, the latter a variety of the scotch pine, or species, called riga pine, which excels in straightness of bole and thrifty growth, and of spruce, 10% of the whole, mainly in the southeast. Aspen, alder, and birch, especially the latter, are considered undesirable weeds, and fire is used to get rid of them, where coniferous aftergrowth is desired. Although birch is also employed for fuel, bobbins, and furniture, and aspen for matches. Basswood, maple, elm, ash, and some oak occur, and larch, Larix siberica, was introduced some 150 years ago. Long, severe winters and hot, dry summers produce slow growth, the pine in the north requiring 200 to 250 years, in the middle sections 140 to 160 years to grow to merchantable size. Fires used in clearing have from time to time run over large areas and have nearly killed out the spruce except in the lowlands, but the pine being more resistant has increased its area and in spite of the deterioration of the soil by fire, reproduces well. Originally, the forest was communal property, but in 1524, Gustav Vasa declared all forest and water not specially occupied to belong to God, King, and the Swedish crown, although he allowed the usufruct to the people free of charge, or nearly so. These rights of user are still the bane of the forest administration, being left without supervision, it mattered little who owned the land. The forest was ruthlessly exploited. Later, the rights of user thus originating were bought off by ceding lands to the peasants. Not until 1851 did an improvement in these conditions occur when a provisional administration of the state forests was provided in connection with the land survey. But a rational organization materialized only after an eminent German forester, V. Berg, director of the Forest School of Tarant, had been imported, 1858, to effect a reconstruction. His advice was, however, only partially followed, and the organization was not perfected until 1869. Almost immediately, a powerful opposition to the administration developed, because it could not at once show increased profits, and the personnel, which had been scanty enough, was still further reduced, the large districts into which the state property had been divided were still further enlarged, and to this day, improvement in these respects has been only partial. 
The state forest area, situated mainly in the north, is stated as between 35 and 45 million acres, variable because of clearing for farms and new settlements. But it contains about 15 million acres of bogs and moors and much other wasteland, which reduces the productive forest area to about 12 million acres, 35% leaving 65% of the productive forest area to private ownership. This state forest was divided, 1896, into 53 districts, the districts being aggregated into eight inspections and the whole service placed under a central office, with a forest director and five assistants under immediate control of the Senate. The forest guards numbered 750, their ranges averaging 50,000 acres, while the districts averaged 600,000 acres and several contain as high as 2.5 million acres. The forestmeister in charge may live sometimes 200 miles from the nearest town and 60 miles from the nearest road. His function is mainly to protect the property, to supervise the cutting and sales, and to teach the people the need of conservative methods. In spite of this insufficient service, considerable reduction in forest fires and theft has been attained. Beyond restriction of waste by axe and fire, and conservative lumbering of the state forest, positive measures for reproduction have hardly yet been introduced, both personnel and wood values being insufficient for more intensive management. At present, with a cut hardly exceeding 100 million cubic feet, the revenue is still almost nominal, say $600,000, and hardly the annual growth is cut. Selection forest is, of course, the rule, but since no trees are marked and cut less than 10 inch diameter at 25 feet from the ground, at least the possibility for improved management will not be destroyed when, through the exhaustion of the private forest and increased wood prices, more intensive management has become practicable. When the market is good, a clearing system with 100 to 160 year rotation is practiced. On the clearings, about 20 seed trees are left, and after six years, the natural regeneration is repaired by planting. This latter method is especially prescribed on the government farms. These form an interesting part of the state property. Some 900 small farms with woodlots aggregating over 500,000 acres, mostly in the southern districts. These came into existence in the 17th and 18th centuries, being granted as fiefs to officers of the army as their only compensation. They reverted to the state and are rented for terms of 50 years, upon condition that the woods are to be managed according to rules laid down by the State Department, and special inspectors are provided to supervise this work. This system, in vogue since 1863, at first met with opposition on the part of the renters on account of the impractical propositions of the department. At present, the department manages many of these woodlots directly, as well as those which the clergy have received in lieu of emoluments. Since 1883, a corps of forest surveyors has been occupied in making working plans based upon diameter accretion at the curiously selected height of 25 feet from the ground. A commission was also instituted some years ago to segregate forest and farm soils in the state domain with the view of disposing of the latter preparatory to improved management of the remaining forest area. The state has also in a small way begun to purchase absolute forest soils in the southern provinces with a view to reforestation. The private forest areas located in the more settled southern portions are found mostly in small parcels and in peasants' hands, although the nobility also own some forest properties but the size of single holdings rarely exceeds 1,000 acres. These areas are mostly exploited without regard to the future, furnishing still four-fifths of the large export, and according to competent judges, will soon be exhausted. Although attempts have been made from time to time to restrict the use of private forest, practically little has been accomplished, and such restrictions as have been enacted are hardly enforced. A law, enacted in 1886, forbids clearing along waters adapted to fishing and orders the leaving of seed trees or providing otherwise for regeneration if more than 12 acres are cut at one time. 
The method of utilizing the ground for combined forest and farm use, which is still frequently practiced, was forbidden on the light sandy soils of the pineries or was otherwise regulated. Forest fire laws are also on the statutes. Propositions for further restrictions made in 1891 were promptly rejected by the Parliament. Educational opportunities are offered in the Forest Institute at Evois, first established in 1862 as a result of Wieberg's visit and reorganized in 1874. It accepts new students only every second year for the two years course. It has had a precarious existence being left sometimes without students, and is naturally not of a high grade, practical acquaintance with woods work being its main aim. Since 1876, a school for forest guards and private under-foresters has been in existence, where six students are annually accepted for a two years course. In addition, there are two instructors provided by the government, wandering teachers who are to advise private owners. Premiums are paid for the best managed woodlots on the government farms. The Finnish Forestry Association, which is in part a propagandist nature, was organized in 1877. It supplies, besides an annual report, other forestry literature and employs an experienced planter to direct efforts at reforestation. A forestry journal, quarterly, is also published and a professional literature is beginning to start into existence. It may be of interest in this connection to cite a rough calculation made by Dr. Mayer of the available material in European Russia and Finland combined, which he places at 4,500 million cubic feet and of which he considers one half available for export. It is impossible to prognosticate what position Russia and Finland, together the largest wood producers in Europe, will take in the future world commerce, and how rapidly better practices, for which the machinery is already half started, will become generally adopted. At present, especially in Russia proper, the general corruption of the bureaucracy is an almost insurmountable obstacle to improvement. End of section 14. Recording by Taylor Rourke. Section 15 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernow. The Scandinavian States. In the English language, the report on forestry in Sweden by General C. C. Andrews, U.S. Minister at Stockholm, 1872, revised 1935 pages, gives a statement of present conditions with historical notes. A very good idea in detail of the wood trade of Sweden may be obtained from the Wood Industries of Sweden, published by Timber Trades Journal of London in 1896. La Suede, son purple et son industrie, by G. Sundbog, 1900, two volumes, contains several pertinent chapters. It is an official work, very complete, and was translated into English in 1904. The Economic History of the Swedish Forest by Gunnar Schotter, 1905, 32 pages in Swedish, published by the Forestry Association, gives a brief account of conditions and data of the forestry movement. Norway, official publication for the Paris Exposition, 1900, contains a chapter on forestry by K. A. Fasholt, pages 322 to 350, with a map of forest distribution. Skogs ve Senets Historia Fed Skogs Directorin, First Del, Historic 1909, is an official publication of the Norwegian Forest Administration, giving a full account of the development during the 50 years from 1857 to 1907, with notes of the earlier history. La Denmark, Etat Actuel de sa Civilisation et de son Organisation Sociale, by J. Carlson, H. Ulrich, and C. N. Stake. 1914 pages. Denmark, its history and topography, etc., by H. Weitenmeyer, 1891. Bidrock till det danske Skovsbrugs Historia, by O. Lutkin, 1900, was not accessible to the writer. 
extensive notes are found through the German, Austrian, and French forestry journals, especially an article in the Centralblatt für das gesamte Forstwesen, 1905, briefed in Forestry Quarterly, Volume 3, page 292, and another, briefed in the same Quarterly, Volume 9, page 45, gives extended accounts of forest conditions in Sweden. Under the name of Scandinavian states, we may comprise the countries of Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, which were settled by the same group of German tribes, the so-called Norsemen. They originally spoke the same language, which only later became more or less differentiated. The settlement of the country by these tribes seems to have been accomplished in the main by the end of the 8th century, and the separation into the three several kingdoms in the ninth to 12th centuries, during which time... They were sometimes united, or at least under one ruler, sometimes at war with each other, and always torn by interior dissensions bordering on anarchy. In 1397, by the Kalmar Convention, a more permanent union into one kingdom was effected between Sweden, Norway, and Denmark under Margaret, the Semiramis of the North. After another period of variable fortunes, Sweden, about 1523, became an independent constitutional monarchy under Gustav Vasa, and Norway remained joined to Denmark under Frederick I. Sweden then started on a career of conquest, being almost continuously at war with all her neighbors and especially with Russia and Poland, whereby, especially under Gustavus Adolphus and the adventurous Charles VII, her territory was greatly enlarged. With the treaties of Stockholm and Neustadt, 1720 and 1721, she came into more peaceful waters, but permanent peace and a settled policy was not attained until the election of Bernadotta, one of Napoleon's administrators to the kingship, and by the Peace of Kiel in 1814, Sweden became a constitutional hereditary monarchy in the modern sense. At the same time, Norway was taken away from Denmark and forced to a union with Sweden, which persisted until 1907, when a peaceful separation took place by the action of the Norwegian people. The union has always been hateful to the Norwegians, although only the king and the Department of Foreign Affairs, in which Norway was represented by a delegation from its council, were in common, all other matters of administration being separate as well as the parliaments, Storthing in Norway and Riksdag in Sweden. Denmark, powerful in the 11th century under Canute, who subjugated not only Norway but England, losing both these countries shortly after his death, was shorn by Sweden of much of its territory in the 17th century, and, in 1814, was separated from Norway. Originally an elective monarchy, largely dominated by the nobility, the crown in 1661 became hereditary and absolute and Sweden did not become a constitutional monarchy until 1849. Sweden This country is of greatest interest to the world at large in forestry matters, because it has been until lately the largest exporter of wood and has only just fully waked up to its need for a conservative forest management. The law of 1903 promises to bring about very decided changes and to curtail the exports upon which other European nations so much rely. Sweden, with 172,876 square miles, occupies the eastern two-thirds of the Scandinavian peninsula. It is not like Norway, a mountain country, but the greater part consists of low granitic hills. The mountain range, Kirlin, which forms the boundary towards Norway, falls off in a long slope towards the Gulf of Bothnia and the Baltic Sea the coast being a broad level plain with a series of islands, larger or smaller, girdling the outer coastline and forming an archipelago. The country is cut into numerous watersheds, the many rivers, called elfs, furnishing means of transportation, expanding frequently into lakes, sur, in the upper reaches, and falling with cataracts into the lower plain, giving rise to fine water powers. Eight percent of the total area is in lakes, only 12% of the land area is in farms. The forest area, with nearly 50 million acres, occupies nearly 48%, leaving 40% waste land or otherwise occupied. Half of the population of over 5 million pursues agriculture, while iron manufacture and the lumber industry occupy one quarter. 
Of the three main divisions of the country, the southern Gotaland is richest in lowlands and agricultural soils, and as it has also a favorable maritime climate, farming is the main industry. Here, a population of 50 to 60, and in parts up to 190 per square mile, is found. Beech and oak are here the principal trees, with spruce occasionally intermixed. In the central part, Zvealand, or Sweden proper, the forest region begins with pine, spruce, pure, or in mixture, covering the granite hills and plateau. Birch and other hardwoods, oak, beech, elm, basswood, and aspen being found in the river valleys. But the third division, Norland, is the forest region of commercial importance, the seat of the extensive export trade. It is a vast, almost unbroken forest country with hardly more than three people to the square mile in the northernmost part called Lapland, Laps and Finns forming a not inconsiderable part of the population. Pine and spruce are the timber trees with white birch intermixed. Toward the northern boundary the pine increases in more and more open stands as one goes northward into the drier climate. An open, stunted growth of birch and aspen forms the transition to the treeless tundra. A treeless alpine region occupies the northwestern frontier, fringed at lower elevations by a belt of birch and natural coppice, a result of repeated fires. The northeastern part is a level coast plain, but the climate is too severe for agriculture and the forest growth also is short and of inferior quality. Large areas of swamp land are found in nearly all parts, recoverable for farm or forest use and mismanaged and devastated forest areas are found all over the country. The forest, nearly ten acres per capita, on account of its accessibility to the sea by means of the many rivers, plays an important role in the economy of Sweden, not only because it covers such a large area and favorable composition, 80% coniferous, but because it has long been a prominent source of income especially after the abolition of the English import duties in 1866 and of the Swedish export duties which had restricted trade in 1863, did a rapid increase in wood exports take place until, in 1900, it amounted to over $54 million, of which $12 million for wooden ware, being the leading export article and representing over one-half of all exports. In addition to this export, which may represent at least around 300 million cubic feet of wood, there are about 250 million cubic feet of pulp wood and 150 million feet used for charcoal, besides the domestic fuel consumption. The total draft on the forest may be estimated to come near to 1,200 million cubic feet, which is believed far in excess of the annual growth much of the nearly 50 million acres of forest area having been devastated or deteriorated by axe and fire, and being located in a northern zone where the growth is slow, one inch in 12 to 15 years. According to others, the cut remains below the increment by about 25%, the latter being figured at 25 cubic feet per acre. In the state forests, to be sure, mostly located in the more northern tiers, the cut is kept between six and seven cubic feet effective, but here a waste of sometimes 40% is incurred in the exploitation due to the difficulties in transport. 1. Property Conditions It was Gustav Vasa who, in 1542, declared all uncultivated lands the property of the crown. Parts of them, however, were given to colonists, and these, as well as the resident population, had the right to use the neighboring forest to supply their needs for wood and pasture. By the continued exercise of this right, the forest came to be considered commons, proprietary rights remaining long in doubt. Finally, a division came about, some of the lands becoming the property of the parishes, others of smaller districts, the hundreds, others again encumbered or unencumbered property of the state, and some remained in joint ownership of state and private individuals under various complicated conditions. The state now owns somewhat over 16 million acres, of which, however, only 70% are really forest, and controls more or less 4 million more, of which about 900,000 acres are ecclesiastical benefices and forests belonging to public institutions, 
and 2.7 million acres in state farms which are rented. Since 1875, the state has pursued a policy of purchase, which has added over 500,000 acres at $7 per acre to the domain. Lately, this policy has found considerable opposition. In this way, by reforesting and by settlement of disputed titles, the state property in absolute possession of the government has grown by nearly 5% to 10 million acres. In Lapland, the entire forest area used to belong to the state, but in order to attract settlers, these were given forest property for their own use, from 10 to 100 times the area which they had cleared. This forest area the settlers disposed of to wood merchants, lumbermen, until the law of 1873 intervened, restricting the settlers to the use of fruit alone, the government taking charge of the cutting of wood for sale and limiting the cut to a diameter of 8 inch at 16 feet from the base. This interference with what was supposed to be private rights seems to have been resented, and has led to wasteful practices in the absence of a sufficient force of forest guards. Nevertheless, the law was extended to Vesterbotten in 1882. In other provinces, Vermland, Gestrickland, etc., the government vested in the owners or ironworks the right to supply themselves with charcoal from state forests. But about the middle of the 19th century, when owing to railroad development in other parts, some of the ironworks became unremunerative and were abandoned, their owners continued to hold on to the forest privileges and by and by exercised them by cutting and sawing lumber for sale, and even by selling the forest areas as if they were their properties. And in this way, these properties changed hands until suddenly the government began to challenge titles and commenced litigation about 1896. Grants of certain log-cutting privileges on government lands were also made to sawmills and pastimes, usually by allowing sawmillers to cut a certain number of logs annually at a very low price. In 1870, these grants, which were very lucrative, were modified by substituting the right of an increased cut for a stated number of years at a modified price, after which the grant was to cease. In 1900, there were still some 300,000 acres under such grants. No wonder that under these circumstances the value of the state forest property was, in 1898, assessed at only a dollar sixty per acre, the net income being $1,680,753, or about 12 cents per acre. The expenditures for administration, supervision, and forest school amounting to $423,659, to which should be added an undetermined amount for the participation of the Domain Bureau, the Agricultural Department, and Provincial Governments, all taking part in the forest administration. Many of the towns and country districts, Herat, have received donations of forest areas from the Crown, which have been a considerable source of revenue to them. The parish of Orsa, for example, realized from its forest property some two and a half million dollars, and other similar results are recorded. These communal and institute forests of various description comprise somewhat over 2.6 million acres, or five and a half percent, and are placed under management of local committees with the governor of the province as chairman. The management consists in selling stumpage of all trees over 13 inches in diameter five feet above ground, to be cut by the purchaser under regulations. In the years from 1840 to 1850, the government sold to English wood merchants considerable tracts of timberland, and in the latter part of the 19th century, as the sawmill industry expanded, many mill firms acquired wood-cutting leases for 50-year terms for prices which were often realized from the forest in the first winter. At present, longer leases than for 20 years are prohibited by law, the diameter limit of 12 inches, 18 or 20 feet above ground, was usually the basis of the leases, and as the owners could then lease away other sizes, it might happen that two or three persons besides the original owner would have property rights in the same forest. Of late years, many of the mill owners have endeavored to get rid of the resulting inconvenience by buying the fee simple of the land. This movement has resulted in the aggregation of large areas in single hands, or more often in the hands of large mill companies. 
By the acquisition of these properties, a certain amount of cultivated land is usually included, which is then left to the former owner at a nominal rent, provided that he pays the taxes on the whole, thereby creating a class of renters in lieu of owners of farms. The area thus privately owned, mostly by sawmill companies, must be over 25 million acres. The total private forest area, which includes the bulk of the commercial forest, is about 30 million acres, 61.3%, unreclaimed wasteland swelling the figure to over 50 million. 2. Development of Forest Policy From the times of Olaf Trattalja, the first Christian king of Sweden about 1000 AD, who gained fame by the part he took in exploiting the forests of Vermland, down to the 14th century, Sweden suffered from a superabundance of forest. Nevertheless, by the end of that century, restriction of the willful destruction by fire was felt necessary, and an ordinance with that object in view was promulgated. It is questionable whether this order had any effect in a country where the homestead law provided that a seller might take up, quote, as much pasture and arable land as he could make use of, twice as much forest, and in addition on each side of this homestead as much as a lame man could go over on crutches without resting, end quote. Not till 1638 do we again find an attempt at forest conservancy, this time in the interest of supply of charcoal for the iron industry by the appointment of overseers of the public forests. The first general forest code, however, dates from 1647, which, among other useless prescriptions, made the existing usage of planting two trees for every one cut obligatory. And this provision remained on the statutes until 1789, in spite of this, and other restrictive laws, exploitation by the liege lords and the communities continued until, in 1720, a director of forests for the two southern districts, Halant and Bohus, was appointed. And, at least in this part of the country, the execution of the laws was placed under a special officer. This appointment may be considered the first germ of the later forest department. A policy of restriction seems to have prevailed during the entire 18th century, although it is questionable whether the restrictions were enforced, since there was no personnel to watch over their enforcement, and the governors, in whose hands the jurisdiction lay, had other interests more engrossing. A law, enacted in 1734, restricted the peasant forest owners in the sale of wood from their own properties, and in 1789 this restriction and other supervision was extended to those of the nobility. It appears that soon after this, a considerable sentimental solicitude inside and outside the Riksdag was aroused regarding an apprehended deterioration of climate, as well as scarcity of wood as a result of further forest destruction. In the light of present experience, a rather amusing anticipation. These Jeremiads, however, after an unsatisfactory attempt at legislation in 1793, led in 1798 to the appointment of a commission which reported after five years of investigation. A new set of forest regulations was enacted as a result in 1805. In further prosecution of these attempts at regulating forest use, a commissioner, Professor F. W. Ratloff, was sent to Germany in 1809 to study methods employed in that country. Long before that time, about 1762, some of the iron masters, owning large forest areas, had imported a commission of German forest experts, among them von Langen and Zantier, the same who had done similar work in Norway and Denmark, with a view of systematizing the forest use, but apparently without result. After much discussion of Radloff's report, in consultation with the provincial governors who suggested the propriety of different plans for different localities, new legislation was had in 1810, 1818, 1823, and new regulations for the crown forests were issued in 1824. Yet, at this very time, not only the partition of the communal forests, but also the sale of town forests was ordered, and this policy of dismemberment lasted till 1866, over one million acres having been sold by that time. Nor was any diminution in wasteful practices to be noted as a result of legislation, 
and it seems that, while on the one hand restrictive policies were discussed and enacted, on the other hand unconservative methods were encouraged. Indeed, in 1846 the then-existing restrictions of the export trade were removed. Apparently a reversion of restrictive policy had set in, and exploitation increased, in the belief of inexhaustible supplies. On the other hand, encouragement of reforestation was sought by giving bounties for planting wasteland, and for leaving a certain number of seed trees in the felling areas, also by paying rewards for the best plantations, all without result. Meanwhile, a check to the wood trade had occurred through the imposition of exorbitant custom duties by Great Britain, and at the same time the government imposed an export duty to discourage export from Norland, and this was not abated until 1857. A further project of forest supervision was attempted through a report by a new commission appointed in 1828, which formulated rules for the control of public and private forests, and recommended the establishment of a central bureau for the management of forest affairs, as well as the organization of a forest institute for the teaching of forestry. The institute was established at Stockholm in 1828, but instead of organizing the bureau, the director of that institute was charged with the duties of such bureau. Again for years, committee reports followed each other, but led to no satisfactory solution of the problems. In 1836, however, a forestry corps, Skokstaten, was organized for the management of the state forests under the direction of the Forest Institute, and as a result of persistent propaganda, a central bureau of forest administration, Skokstirilsen, was created in 1859 with Jorkman at the head. Charged with the supervision of all the state, royal, communal, and other public forests, and the control of private forest use. The law in 1859, however, did not settle upon any new policy of control over private forest properties. Again and again, forest committees were appointed to propose proper methods of such control, but not until 1903 was a general law enacted, which was to go into effect in January 1st, 1905. Previous to this, locally applicable laws were enacted. In 1866, a law was passed which referred only to a particular class of private lands, namely those forests of Norland which the state was to dispose of for ground rent, or which had been disposed of and on which the conditions of settlement had not been fulfilled. In 1869, a law applicable only on the island of Gotland provided a dimension limit, and that in case of neglect of regeneration on private fellings, the owner may not cut any more wood for sale until the neglect had been remedied. Exactly in the same manner as the homestead and other colonization laws in the United States have been abused to get hold of public timberlands, so in Sweden large areas of government land had been taken up for settlement, but actually were exploited. It was to remedy this evil that in 1860 an examination of the public lands was ordered with a view of withdrawing portions from settlement and of making forest reservations. The Royal Ordinance of 1866 resulted, which was to regulate the cutting on settled lands, and in such new settlements as were thereafter allowed. Here, private owners at first were allowed to cut only for their own use, and the new law prescribed the amount of yearly cut, and required the marking of timber designed for sale by the government officers. This compulsory marking, or Lapland Law, with the dimension limit was in 1873 extended to all private forests in Norbotten, and in 1888 to Vesterbotten. This law limits the diameter to which fellings are to be made, 8 inches at 15 feet from base and if the cutting of smaller trees is deemed desirable for the benefit of the forest, these are to be designated by forest officials. The law for Gotland was renewed in 1894, adding a reforestation clause, the governor being authorized to prohibit shipping of timber under 8-inch diameter, and that not until new growth was established, or at least no new fellings may be made until this condition is fulfilled. The same law applies to sand dune plantations in other southern districts. Altogether, one quarter of the private forest property was in this manner subjected to restrictions until the present conservation law came into existence. This law, of 1903, 
which became operative in 1905, was the result of a most painstaking, extended canvas by the Legislative Committee, appointed in 1896, which reported in 1899, and of a further canvass by the Director of Domains, who reported in 1901. A large amount of testimony from private forest owners, sawmill men, provincial and local government officials, etc., was accumulated, and it may be reasonably expected that this new legislation will be more effective than most of the preceding seems to have been. The law requires, in general terms, the application of forestry principles in the management of private woodlands. For this purpose, a forest protection committee, one for each province, is constituted which has surveillance over all private forests, an institution similar to that existing in Russia. The committee, or Forest Conservation Board, consists of three persons who are appointed for three years, one by the government, one by the county council, one by the managing committee of the county agricultural society. In addition, where the communities desire, elected forest conservation commissioners may be instituted to make sure of the enforcement of the law. The board secures the services of an expert advisor from the state forest service, paid by the government, but leaves to the board discretion as to the interpretation of the law which is for the most part expressed in general terms, to secure conservative management. Hence, different boards have worked in different ways, but gradually all are coming to similar methods and all apply persuasive means rather than force. The law requires regeneration, but does not prescribe detailed methods as to how regrowth is to be obtained leaving these to be determined by the board in consultation with the owners. If no agreement can be arrived at, or if the measures stipulated are not taken by the owner, the board may enforce its rulings by court proceedings, in which injunctions to prevent further lumbering, confiscation of logs or of lumber or money fines may be adjudged. The time of contracts for logging rights is reduced from twenty to five years, Short courses of instruction to forest owners and the issuing of popularly written technical publications, Volkskrifte, is one of the efficient methods of securing the results which seems to have been attained in the few years since the law is in operation, namely, in arousing such interest that opposition has become very small. In export duty, four to eight cents per one hundred cubic feet of timber, eight to fourteen cents per ton of dry wood pulp, is levied for the purpose of carrying out the law, the export duty amounting to over $160,000, and a more general export duty is under contemplation. The management of communal forests is to be placed under the State Forest Administration, the corporations paying 1.6 cents per acre, but this feature does not seem entirely settled. Protective forests under special regulations are established at the Alpine frontier, and on the drift sand plains which are planted up. 3. Forest Administration and Forestry Practice The Central Forestry Bureau as it exists now was organized in 1883 as the Domain Bureau in the Department of Agriculture with, at present, a forester as General Director and under it a Forestry Corps, Skogstaten, reorganized in 1890, which has charge of the public forests and also of the forest control in the private forests where such control exists outside of the conservation boards. For the purpose of this administration, the country is divided into ten districts, each under an inspector, or offer Jeg Mestara. The districts are divided into ranges, revier, now ninety, each under a chief of range, or Jeg Mestara, with assistants and guards, Krona Yagara. The nomenclature of the officers suggesting the hunt rather than the forest management. In addition, six forest engineers are employed on working plans, engineering works, and in giving advice and assistance to private owners who pay for such service. When it is stated that the ranges in the northern provinces average over 300,000 acres of public and 400,000 acres of private forest, in central Sweden, 150,000 acres of public and 145,000 acres of private forest, and in the southern provinces nearly 55,000 acres of state and communal forest, it will be understood that the control cannot be very strict. The net revenue from the state forest during the last 30 years has increased from $300,000 to $1,750,000. 
the management of even the state forests can only be very extensive. The state still sells mostly stumpage, rarely cutting on its own account. The lumbering is carried on very much as in the United States by logging contractors, and the river driving is done systematically by booming companies. Selection forest is still the general practice, now often improved in the group system, although a clear-cutting system with planting has been practiced, but is supposed to be less desirable, probably because it entails a direct money outlay or else because it was not properly done. A seed tree management preferred by private owners for pine seems frequently not successful. Of the state forests, 90% are under selection system, and of private forests, 60%. In the southern provinces where planting is more frequently resorted to, two to three-year-old pines and two to five-year-old spruces, nursery grown, 2,000 to the acre, are generally used, or else sowing in seed spots is resorted to, which is more frequently practiced in the middle country. Some 10,000 acres were, for instance, planted by the Forest Administration in 1898, at a cost of $2 per acre, and the budget contains annually about $20,000 for such planting. That private endeavor in the direction of planting has also been active, is testified by a plantation of over 26,000 acres, now 35 years old, reported from Finspong Estate. Complete working plans are rare, even for the state forests, a mere summary felling budget being determined for most areas, the trees to be cut being marked. Under instructions issued in 1896, working plans for the small proportion of state forest management by clearing system are to be made. In these, an area allotment method is employed with rotations of 100 to 150 years. Forest fires are still very destructive, especially in northern Sweden, although an effective patrol system, greatly assisted in some provinces by watchtowers, has reduced the size of the areas burnt over. The coniferous composition and the dry summers in the northern part together with the methods of lumbering are responsible for the conflagrations. In this direction, too, the activities of the conservation boards have been highly useful. 4. Education and Literature Among the propagandist literature which had advanced the introduction of forestry ideas in Sweden, it is proper to mention the writings of Israel Adolf of Strom, who, after extensive travels in Germany, established the first private forest school in 1823 and was instrumental in securing the establishment of the State Forest Institute in Stockholm, 1828. In regard to education, a most liberal policy prevails— at the Institute, the tuition is free, and in addition, four students receive scholarships of $250 per year. Appointment to assistantships follows immediately after promotion, and in ten years the position of Yagmastara may be attained. The number of students is limited to 30. The director of this school is also general advisor in forestry matters. Besides the director, six professors are employed. The course at this school is two years of eleven full months. There are now a higher and a lower course, the former requiring previous graduation from another preparatory forest school, either the one at Omberg, founded 1886, or that at Clotten, 1900, where a one-year course mainly in practical work is given. For the lower service, there are not less than six schools in various parts of the country, each with one teacher and assistants, managed under a chief of range. In these, not only is tuition free, but ten pupils receive also board and lodging, the course lasting eight months. These schools prepare for state service as well as for managers of private forests. A forest experiment station was organized in 1903, an independent institution in the Domain Bureau under the direct charge of a practitioner. Every third year, a commission is to determine what work is to be undertaken. The appropriation, which so far is hardly $5,000 per annum, will not permit much expansion. The first number of its publication, Madelanten von Staten's Skogs for was issued in 1904, and work of a superior character has been accomplished since then. That a forest republic exists in Sweden is attested by a forest association with an organ, Skogsvats Föreningens Tidskrift, which was founded in 1902. 
This journal is really the continuation of an earlier magazine, Titskrift for Skogs Hushalning, a quarterly begun in 1869 and running until 1903. A forestry association for naught and alone, which also issues a yearbook, was organized a few years ago. A periodical for rangers, etc., is also in existence under the name of Skogs Finnen. In 1902 also, there was formed a lumberman's trust to regulate the output which the forest owners proposed to meet by an associated effort to raise stumpage charges. The attempt of the lumbermen to restrict the cut in 1902 was, however, a failure, for the export of that year was 10% larger than the previous year. It is expected that the new law will have the tendency of decreasing the cut and of inaugurating a new era in forestry matters generally. End of section 15. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 16 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. Section 16. Norway. Originally divided up among a number of petty kings, Norway was brought under one rule by Harald in 863 and united to Denmark in the 11th century, becoming gradually a mere dependency. Its later political fortunes and changing relations with Denmark and Sweden have been referred to on page 286. The history of the forestry development, however, has proceeded more or less independently of the other two countries. Norway, occupying with 124,445 square miles, over one-third of the Scandinavian peninsula, is for the most part a mountainous plateau with deep valleys and lakes. Its numerous fjords and waterways make accessible much of the interior mountain forest, yet a large part of the inland area still remains inaccessible and trackless. More than 75% of the country is wasteland and water, only 3% in farms, leaving for the forest area 21%, or little over 17 million acres. According to latest data, 1907, from this productive area, a further 2 million acres must be deducted as non-producing. The distribution of this forest area is most uneven. The bulk and the most valuable portions of it is found in the southeastern corner around Christiania, in eight counties, in which the forest per cent exceeds 40 to 50, with conifer growth, pine and spruce, up to the 3,000 foot level. Again, in the three counties around Trondheim, a large and important forest area is located at the head of the fjords. But the entire western coast and the higher elevations are devoid of valuable forest growth, and the northern third of the country, north of the Arctic Circle, is mostly heath and moors with only 7% wooded, mainly birch growth of little commercial value. The commercially important forest area is, therefore, locally confined. It is estimated that one half of the territory has to import its lumber, one quarter has sufficient for home consumption, and the excess which permits exportation is confined to the last quarter. This export, mostly in logs and staves, which amounts to nearly $20 million, 40% of the total export, half of it wood pulp, is estimated to represent only one-fifth or one-sixth of the total cut, which is stated as about 350 million cubic feet, or at the rate of 23 cubic feet on the productive area, while the annual growth is estimated at less than this amount, namely at the rate of nearly 21 cubic feet in the southern districts, and in the northern not over 12 cubic feet. Scotch pine is the principal timber, and occurs beyond the Arctic Circle, the northernmost forest in the world, where its rotation becomes 150 to 200 years, with Norway spruce more or less localised, these two species forming 75% of the forest growth. Oak, ash, basewood and elm occurring sporadically, and white birch being ubiquitous. Forest property develops on the same lines as in Sweden and in other European countries, hence we find state, communal and private property. When in the 9th century, upon Harold's accession, the commons were declared the property of the king, the rights of user both to wood and grazing were retained by the Merke, and the so-called state commons, Stats Aniningia, remain to date encumbered by these rights, similar to conditions in Sweden. From the end of the 17th to the middle of the 19th century, it was policy of the kings to dispose of these commons whenever their exchequer was low, and the best of these lands became, by purchase, property of the districts, 
Big Dal Minim. Provinces, cities, and village corporations, or else became private property on which the rights of use are continued. Prevetal Minimia. At present, the state owns largely in the northern districts somewhat over 4.8 million acres, 28.5%. But of this, hardly 2 million acres are productive, and of these productive acres, half a million consists of encumbered commons from which the state receives hardly any income. The district commons, or communal and other public institute forests, comprise around 7,800,000 acres, 46%. But here again, only 580,000 acres are productive. The balance then, or a full one quarter, is in private hands. Export trade in wood had been very early carried on and had been considered developed in the 13th and 14th century. By the middle of the 17th century, the coast forest of oak had been cut out by Dutch and English wood merchants who had obtained logging privileges under special treaties of 1217 and 1308, and by Hasiatic cities, especially Hamburg, entering this market in the middle of the 16th century. There are records which would make it appear that at least some of the now denuded coast was forested in olden times. The development of the iron industry increased the drain on these supplies, which forest fires, insects and excessive grazing prevented from recuperating. As early as the middle of the 16th century, we find attempts to arrest the devastation by regulating the export trade and supervising the sawmills, forbidding especially the erection of sawmills intended to work for export only. In the 17th century, various commissions were appointed by Christian IV to make forest reconnaissances and elaborate rules for proper forest use. In 1683, Christian V issued a forest ordinance increasing the number of forest inspectors instituted by his predecessor and giving in detail the rules governing forest use, many of which proved impractical. In 1725, a commission, the so-called Forest and Sawmill Commission, was appointed to organise a forest service. It functioned until 1739, when the first General Force Stamp was established, and the first attempt at real forest management was made. This came into existence through the efforts of two famous German foresters, J. G. von Langen and von Xanthia who, with six assistants, were called in from the Harz Mountains, as also afterwards to Denmark and Sweden, during the years 1736 to 1740, to make a forest survey and organise a management. Descriptions and instructions were elaborated in German, and the service was largely manned by German wood foresters, Holz for Stern. The strictness of the development which had been organised after von Langen's departure in 1739 made it, however, unpopular, and in 1746 it was abolished, von Xanthia returning to his country, the sole survivor, the other assistants having succumbed to scurvy. The administration was again placed in the hands of a commission, which continued till 1760. Only the forests connected with mines remained under the administration it instituted, and those belonging to the copper works of Auroras continued under its forest inspectors until 1901. In that year, 1760, another short-lived attempt to organise a forest administration was made, but the new organisation did not fare any better and was superseded in 1771. Then followed an interim regimen, during which the general government and district officers were in charge. The old orders, under which forest use had been regulated, remained mostly in force until, in 1795, all the reasonable and the unreasonable obstructions to export were removed. The sawmill privileges, under which English lumbermen held large areas for long terms and devastated them without regard to the impractical regulations, were, however, not ended until 1860. The wood industries were then relieved entirely from restrictions, and forest destruction progressed even more rapidly with the increasing facilities for transport. This final cessation of the destructive policy was the outcome of a campaign which started once more with a forest commission instituted in 1849 to take stock and make new propositions. This commission reported in 1850 and pointed out not only the necessity of terminating the sawmill privileges, which was done in 1854, giving time till 1860, but also very wisely accentuated the need of technically educated foresters if anything for forest recuperation was to be done. To meet this latter want, young men were sent to Germany at government expense to study forestry. Some 10 or 12 men were educated in this way during the next decade, and thereby the basis for a technical forest management was laid. In 1857, the first two professional foresters, Mitchell and Bath, were placed in charge of affairs under the Interior Department, and when, in 1859, a new commission was charged with organising a forest service, these two men were members. 
Gradually, an organisation took shape under the direction of these two forest masters. And finally, in 1863, the modern forest department and forest policy was established by law, placing the state domain and other public forests under an effective management, making provision for the extinction of the ruinous rights of user and also for reducing the mismanagement of private forests. The Forest Service, as now constituted after a reorganisation in 1906, is in the Department of Agriculture under a director, Skov Director, and four Forstmeister, or inspectors with some executive officers under various names, and 360 rangers, Skogsvogtoners, including the rangers employed in the public forests outside the state domain. The ranges are so large, sometimes several million acres, and many of them so accessible that only the most extensive management is possible, the officials being poorly paid and poorly educated. The management is, of course, not of a high order. Besides the forest engineer, who is a public lecturer, the officers of the forest department are under the obligation of advising private forest owners in their management, under contracts somewhat similar to the present practice of the US Forestry Bureau, the owners agreeing to follow the advice. Since 1860, the state has begun to purchase forest lands for reforestation in the forestless districts, and where, for protective reasons, it is desirable. In late years, regular appropriations of $15,000 to $20,000 were annually made for this purpose, besides extraordinary grants. In this way, the cutover lands neglected by their owners are cheaply acquired by the state. Besides its own planting, the state assists private owners by advice and money grants and plant material in reforesting their wastelands. The communal forests are under government supervision. They are usually worked under plans and under supervision of foresters with a view to supply the needs of the community. Only when the area is more than sufficient may they obtain the right to cut for sale outside of their parish. On the other hand, all fellings may be prohibited by the government if this is found desirable. As regards private property, there seems to be little or no supervision, although the law of 1863 had declared culture plight and culture bank, i.e. the duty of reforesting, but it had not defined that duty, and the law remained a dead letter. In 1874, a special commission was charged to consider the forest policy, which the public welfare required. The commission reported in 1879 with propositions which were submitted to the officials of the department and the district. A new proposition was worked out and submitted in 1882, but it was pigeonholed until 1891, when the Forest Administration brought in not a general law, but one merely forbidding the export from Nordland, Tromso and Finnmarken, the thinly forest northern provinces. Finally, in 1893, legislation was had enabling municipalities to protect themselves against destruction of forests needed for their protective function. This gives to them the right to formulate rules which are to prevent devastation, as for instance a diameter limit for felling or reforestation of clearings. But the costs of such restriction must be borne by the municipalities as well as half the cost of inspection, the other half being paid by the state. The procedure to determine the protective qualities of forests and the financial difficulty have left the law unused. In 1878, however, a committee of private owners formed itself to fix the sand dunes, which with the state's subvention started work the following year. Many of the state forests are so burdened with rights of user, which were granted to help in developing the country, that the financial restrictions of the forest administration and the conditions of the state property are most unsatisfactory, and the application of silviculture greatly circumscribed. The silvicultural system applied is most generally the rough selection forest, or an approach to group system, relying upon voluntary reproduction entirely. Management is much hampered by rights of user to certain dimensions, and in the more distant districts by the difficulty of disposing of any but the best sizes. An orderly organisation is still almost unknown. The stumpage is sold and removed by the buyer and the axe is still mainly used. Higher forest schools there are none, but three schools for the lower grades had existed for some time, the first having been established in 1875 at Kongsberg. One of them was abandoned in 1889. Forestry is also taught at two farm schools. Until recently, the higher class foresters had to get their education in Germany or in the Swedish Forest Institute at Stockholm. But in 1879, a chair of forestry was instituted in the Agricultural College at Christiania. In 1881, the first forestry association was formed, which by 1898 had over 500 members and then was reorganised with a special view to elevate private forestry practice. It has now, 1907, 
1,500 members and employs a forester paid by the state to give professional advice and works with state aid. It has set out over 50 million trees besides sowing 8,000 pounds of seed. It publishes a journal, Tidskruf for Skogsbruk, and a yearbook. There is also another journal, Forstlia Tidskruft, and a professional society of foresters. Altogether, forestry is not yet on a high level in this country, but the subject is now being brought even into the primary schools, and the efforts to improve conditions are widespread. End of section 16. Section 17 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. Section 17. The Scandinavian States. Denmark. Forestry in Denmark is of interest especially on account of the intensive methods developed on small areas, and of the efforts of reforestation of sand dunes, moors, and heaths. Greatly curtailed an area when, as a result of the War of 1864, Prussia detached the provinces of Schleswig and Holstein, Denmark now has an area of 15,360 square miles, with 2.5 million people, or 163 to the square mile. It is largely a farming country. 80% being productive, only 6.3% of it, or less than 600,000 acres being under forest, and this also mostly on soil capable of farm use, hence an import of over $7 million worth of wood material is required. In addition, there are about 75,000 acres of heaths and other wastes in process of reforestation. Especially on the island of Hueyland, on which the capital Copenhagen is situated, the forest area is now increasing by planting. The balance, or nearly 20% of the land area, consists of heaths, moors, peat bogs and sands. Half of the forest area is located on the islands, and as these represent about one-third of the total area, they are twice as densely forested as the peninsula of Jutland. This latter along the north and west coast for 200 miles represents a large sand bank with extensive sand dunes, shifting sands, heaths and moors, a desolate, almost uninhabited country of sterile downs, called Kleeton the recovery of which has been in progress for a hundred years. According to some, this once bore a coniferous forest. More likely, it was never forested. While original beech was and is still the predominant timber, 60%, with considerable additions of oak, 7%, and other hardwoods, a conifer forest of spruce and pine, covering more than 20% of the forest area, has been established by planting. This planting has been mainly done on the dunes and sand wastes, and in the reclamation of the extensive heaths and moors or peat bogs, especially in the northern Limfjord district, which occupy one-sixth of the unproductive area. As was natural, the forest stocking on good farmland had to yield early to plough and pasture. Attempts at conservative use of the forest area date back to 1557, when Christian III issued a forest ordinance directing his vassals, or liege lords, to permit the peasants to secure their domestic wood requirements at a cheap rate, but not to permit cutting for sale or export, and reserving to himself all returns from such sales. There were also regulations for the pasture, especially as to goats, and for the use of the mast, which then formed more than one quarter of the income from the royal forests. In the 18th century, the needs of forest management was recognised, and in 1762, the two eminent German foresters, von Langen and von Xanthia, see page 88, were invited to visit Denmark and Norway, see above, with a view of organising such management. In 1760, eight young Danes were sent to von Langen in Wernigerode to study his methods for three years, and these with the two German foresters returned in 1762, and under the direction of von Langen, organised the Sealand Forest Areas and started the first plantations of conifers, which are now the pride of Danish foresters. In 1781, the state forests were altogether placed under an organised administration. By the beginning of the 19th century, the reduction of forest areas had progressed to such an extent that, in 1805, a law was enacted providing that the then existing forest area containing beech and oak should be maintained as such forever, or at least that any new clearing and equivalent area be planted to forest. This law was perhaps the result of a journey in 1802 to Germany made by two leading officials of the Forest Department, German influence through Kota and Hartig being at this time visible everywhere. 
Other restrictions in the disposal of peasants' farms or woodlands, and in the manner of farming the large estates, otherwise than by renting to farmers, were also enacted in order to secure stability of the peasant class. It was at this time that the accumulative taxing of landed estates now under heated discussion in Great Britain was used effectively to break up the aggregation of landed property and change the country from one of baronial estates to small farmers' holdings. In this reform movement, the name of Count Reventlow, chief of the State Forest Department, appears as the leading spirit. The forest area, which until 1820 was on the decrease, had since that time increased steadily, and is especially now increasing through reforestation of wastelands. At present, most intensive forest management is practised in the state forest as well as in the communal and private forest areas, which latter is stated are largely in farmers' wood lots since the law forbids the union of small farms into large estates. There is little communal property, and large private estates are also rare. The state owns about 24% of the forest area, or 142,000 acres, of which one-third is non-productive or otherwise occupied, and one-third consists of coniferous plantations. Excepting in the beech forest, most of the timber is of the younger age classes, below 60 to 80 years, and it is anticipated that the cut will have to be reduced and the import of wood and woodenware increased. Artificial reproduction is the most general silvicultural practice, except in the beech forest, which is reproduced naturally after preparation of the soil and sowing acorns for admixture at the same time, spending altogether $12 to $15 per acre in this preparation. Since 1880, thinnings have been based on the idea of favouring final harvest trees somewhat after the French fashion. They are begun in the 20th to 30th year and are repeated every three years, aided by pruning. Then, in each subsequent decade, the return occurs in as many years as the decade has tens. Especially in the direction of thinnings, the German practice and even theory is outdone, the thinnings being made severer and recurring more frequently. More than a hundred years ago, the state began the reclamation work of the dunes and heaths, but it progressed more actively only since the 60s of last century, as a result of legislation had in 1857. In 1867, a special dune department was instituted, and through the effort of a state engineer, Captain Dalgas, an association was formed for the reclamation of heaths and moors. A small subvention of $600 started the work of the association in its useful campaign under the advice of Staatsplanter, state forest planter, Jensen Tushk. The state subvention now amounts to about $40,000 annually, and the success of the association has been such that it has been almost a fad for large landowners and others to buy up these wastelands, and have them planted through the agents of the Heath Association. The planting is mainly of spruce in plough furrows at a cost of $10 to $12 per acre, 60 to 80 year old stands of earlier plantings testifying to the possible results. In the last 40 years, nearly 200,000 acres of heath have been planted, of which over one half are to the credit of the association. For the education of the higher grade foresters, a department of forestry, now with two professors, was instituted in the Royal Veterinary and Agricultural High School at Copenhagen in 1869, with a course of five years, including one and a half years of practical work. This education is given free of charge. The Heath Association educates its own officers, including in their subjects the management of meadows and peat bogs. A forestry association composed one half of forest owners with its organ Titskrift for Skulvesen in existence since 1888 and a valuable book literature in which the problems of the heath are especially fully and authoritatively treated places Denmark in the foremost rank in the forestry world in these particulars. Among the prominent contributors are to be mentioned besides Reventlow and Dal Gass, P. E. Muller, well known by his discussions of the problems of more soils. From 1876 to 1891, he issued a magazine in which Opperman contributed a history of Danish forestry. The latter author also, in cooperation with Houch, published in 1900 a handbook of forestry. End of section 17. Section 18 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. Section 18. The Mediterranean Peninsulas. 
Turkish and Slavish territories. The Mediterranean Peninsulas Geographically, and to some extent climatically, the three peninsulas of the Mediterranean Sea, the Iberian, Italian and the Balkan, are situated alike. Their people, if not in race, are in temper and characteristics and in their political economy more or less alike. They represent the oldest civilization in Europe, and in their long history have been frequently in collision with each other. Their forests, through centuries of abuse, are wherever accessible in poorest condition. Long-continued political disturbances, which have prevented peaceful development and poverty, have been the greatest hindrances to economic reforms, like the recuperation of forests, which require sacrifices. Ancient rights of user, and the necessity of politicians to respect them, are also responsible for the fact that, while praiseworthy attempts in legislation have been made, execution has been usually lagging behind. The accessibility to sea, permitting readily importation, the temperate climate, the simple life, and abstemiousness of the people, and the lack of industrial development, have made the deficiency of wood material less felt than it would otherwise be. But the detrimental influence of forest destruction is being repeatedly experienced in floods and droughts. There is probably no more potent cause of forest devastation in all this section of the world than the pasturing of the woods, especially with sheep and goats. While Italy is now a united country, and only two peoples, Spain and Portugal, occupy the Iberian Peninsula, the Balkan Peninsula is occupied by eight separate peoples, if we include all the countries south of the Danube River and east of the Carpathian Mountains. Turkish and Slavish Territories The Turks for centuries warred with, had under vassalage, or otherwise controlled and misruled all the Slavish states, as well as Macedonia and Greece, a territory of around 170,000 square miles and 16 million people, until, by the Congress of Berlin, 1878, ending the Russo-Turkish War, these states were recognised as independent kingdoms, namely Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, Rumelia and Romania, while Bosnia-Herzegovina was placed under Austrian administration. See pages 155 and 166. With the exception of Romania, these people are still in the lower stages of civilization. The country is undeveloped, the forest still serves largely for the mast and pasturage, probably less than 24% of the country being forest covered, mostly with deciduous trees, oak, beech and walnut, etc. Romania alone has systematically taken advantage of her freedom from Turkish rule in developing a modern civilization and can also boast the beginning of a forestry system. Rumelia, comprising Macedonia, Albania and Thrace, the Turkish possessions in Europe, with 67,000 square miles and 5 million people, contain large areas of untouched forest, not less than 5 million acres in Macedonia alone, with valuable oak and walnut, which have remained unused owing to their inaccessibility and the undesirability of developing them under Turkish rule. Where accessible, the forest is maltreated or destroyed. Bulgaria, to which, in 1885, East Romelia was attached, represents now 38,000 square miles and over 4 million people, independent under a German prince as king since 1879. The forest area of 7.5 million acres, 30% of the land area, mostly deciduous, oak, beech, walnut, etc., and largely confined to the mountains, is one-half in communal ownership, one-sixth in private hands, mostly small woodlots, and one-third state property. But ownership rights are still much in doubt, and until 1869 the state forests were freely open to the use of all, when some sort of regulation of the cut according to the needs of different communities was attempted. Since within ten years such rights of user establish ownership, endless litigation has resulted, until in 1883 a law was enacted ordering the stoppage of rights of user, substituting money payment, 10% of value, and another restricting the diameter to which the most valuable export timber, walnut, may be cut. Changes in detail were made in 1897, but political exigencies, absence of an adequate organisation and other undeveloped conditions have largely prevented enforcement of these laws, and rough exploitation continues in spite of the nominal state control. Owing to inaccessibility of many of the agricultural districts to the wooded mountains, a large import was necessary, but lately export almost equals the import, and indeed the export of walnut has increased fourteenfold in a few years. The Forest Administration is vested in a bureau under the Minister of Commerce and Agriculture, with a chief, 
an inspector general, and two assistant chiefs. When it is stated that in 1905 the entire budget for forestry was $150,000, the inefficiency of the service is apparent. Serbia, a kingdom with 19,000 square miles and 2 million people, has over 42%, 5 million acres, according to others only 32%, still in untouched forest, with valuable oak and walnut, the forest being mainly used for hog raising. Over 36% is state forest, over 43% communal and institutional forest, leaving about 20% in private hands. But, just as in Bulgaria, property conditions are still somewhat unsettled. Like Bulgaria also on account of the uneven distribution of forest area, lack of transportation and systematic development, a large part of the population are more cheaply supplied by importation, which amounts to near $1 million. Curiously enough, by the law of 1891, only the wood cut from state and church forests could be exported free of duty. This export duty was abolished in 1904, and the first attempt was made by the Minister of Agriculture to bring order into the forest administration by importing German foresters. The law of 1891, with various subsequent additions and changes, placed private forest property located on exposed mountain slopes or on shifting sands, or on bog soils, under government surveillance, and relieved plantations made under direction of the government of taxes for ten years. Romania, with 50,000 square miles and nearly 6 million people, under the capable administration of a Hohenzollern prince, King Charles, was in Roman times as Dacia Felix, one of the most prosperous provinces, half of it hilly and mountainous, the other half in the rich alluvial valley of the Danube, now largely deforested. The hill and mountain country was, until the end of the 18th century, still well wooded. A rapid depletion then took place by the demands of the Turkish markets, until now not quite 17%, according to others 18 or 20%, of the area is forested, and multifarious rights of user, which made commons of the woods, have naturally led to widespread devastation in the accessible parts. In 1847, the National Assembly attempted regulation of the cut and of the rights of user, but with little effect. In 1894, the total area had decreased to less than 5 million acres, according to others 6.7 million acres, of which two-fifths is in private hands, two-fifths state property and royal forest, formerly until 1863 in the hands of the monks, the small balance belonging to communities and institutes. In the higher mountains, fir and spruce with some pine and larch form the forest, but broadleaf forest, especially oak and beech, is the prevailing type occupying the middle altitudes and the hill country. The private forest of small owners is being rapidly depleted, only the state forest and that of large proprietors being in good condition. In 1863, when the cloister property was secularised and taken over by the state, the rights of user in this property were suspended, and sales at auction to contractors were inaugurated, under condition that a certain number of seed trees per acre be left. There was little enforcement of this rule. The first comprehensive law, organising the state property and inaugurating a protective policy, was enacted in 1881. This law recognised state, royal and communal property as of public concern, and also placed such private property under supervision as was situated on steep slopes, near watercourses and near the boundaries of strategic importance. These areas, coming under the protective policy, comprise 84% of the whole forest area. They were not to be cleared except by special permit, and not to be exploited except under specially approved working plans. In 1885, three French foresters were called in to organise a state forest department and to inaugurate the making of working plans. The personnel, 25 inspectors and 89 district officers, being insufficient and wood prices low, the income from state property being not over $400,000, the progress of the work was slow. Although, in 1894, the income had doubled, the administrative forces had not been enlarged to any great extent, 137 foresters of various grades, and by that term only 150,000 acres had been brought under working plans. By 1900, about 200,000 acres of state property, or 14%, and 500,000 acres of private forest, or 22%, were organised in some fashion. Lack of means of transportation, however, prevents a really well-regulated management. Altogether, only 65% of the state property is accessible, so that it can be worked, and the working plans consist mainly in leaving a number of seed trees. In 1889, a forestry association, 
progressal sylvic was formed, which with its organ, Revista Pajurillo, pushes the propaganda. In 1890, an energetic minister of domains, Carp, sought strenuously to bring improvement into the situation. A budget of $500,000 for foresters' dwellings was secured to bring the forest managers into closer contact with their charges. A planting fund of $100,000, later increased to $140,000 per annum, was voted, and reforestation and reclamation of sand dunes was begun. A forest improvement fund was inaugurated in 1892 by setting aside 2% of the gross forest yield. But, in the political struggles, Carp's party was displaced, and depression in agricultural prosperity causing financial distress. An era of increased exportation followed, so that the export of forest products, largely cooperage, mainly to Greece, Italy and France, which had been declining to less than half, rose again to about $4 million annually. The financial embarrassment of the state led even to a proposition to sell state forests, but before contracts for this purpose were consummated, relief came and the danger was averted. The state cuts about 22,000 acres annually, yielding about a million dollars, the administration costing, in 1903, $240,000, leaving a net yield of 30 cents per acre. In 1898, the Forest Department, in the direction of domains under the Ministry of Agriculture, consisted of a forest director with 156 foresters academically educated, mostly in France, and since 1892 in the Agricultural Institute at Bucharest, and over 2,500 underforesters and guards. Of some 30,000 acres of sand dunes, one half belonging to the state, about 18,000 acres have been recovered by planting black locust, and some 9,000 acres of plains country have been reforested, for which 330 acres of nurseries furnish the material. In spite of all these efforts, excessive pasturing, although forbidden in the state forest, and fires continue to devastate the property. Private forestry is, of course, much less developed, yet some large properties, Princess Schoenberg with 20,000 acres, are under efficient German forest management. Here, money is spent on developing means of transportation, and a better revenue is secured than in state forests. End of section 18 Section 19 of A Brief History of Forestry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. Section 19. Greece. The history of the country has been so unfortunate and political conditions so unsettled that only lately efforts at improvement in economic conditions could hope to receive attention. For centuries after Greece had become a Roman province, 146 BC, it changed rulers, Romans, Byzantines, Franks, Venetians following each other, until, between 1460 and 1473, it came under the Turkish yoke. As a result of an insurrection started in 1821, freedom, but no settled order as yet, was attained in 1829, through the assistance of Great Britain, France and Russia, and the elected kings Otho of Bavaria, Alfred of England and George of Denmark successively tried to secure social order and efficient constitutional government. By the time this new era had arrived, there was probably little valuable forest worthy of the name left, except in the inaccessible mountain districts. 1. Forest Conditions Although certain districts, like Attica, were already practically denuded in Plato's time, there is little doubt that originally the whole of Greece, with small exceptions, was a continuous forest. The destruction of the forest, protected by thousands of gods and nymphs in holy groves, proceeded slowly under the regime of the ancient Greeks, until the fanaticism of the Christian religion led to a war against these pagan strongholds, and the holy groves were reduced by axe and fire. Turkish misrule for centuries, overtaxation, reckless cutting, extensive herding of goats and sheep, and fires, have reduced the forest area until now it occupies only 12 or 14 per cent of the land area, 25,000 square miles. In 1854, a survey developed about 2 million acres of woodlands, probably an excessive figure, for the now 2.5 million people, while 67 per cent of the surface is a useless waste, and only 20 per cent under cultivation, so that the general aspect of the country is desolate. The many islands are entirely deforested, and so are the seashores. 
where in olden times dense shady poplars stood, now only infertile sand and dreary rock waste remain. The forest in northern and middle Greece is confined to the two rugged mountain ranges, with numerous spurs which run parallel north and south with Mount Olympus, nearly 9,000 feet, and Mount Pindus, 6,000 feet, the highest elevations. The large fertile plains of Thessaly and Boeotia are forestless. So is the large Arcadian plateau of the Peloponnesus, and the other smaller, hot but fertile plains and plateaus. The most valuable conifer forest is found on the higher ranges between the 2,500 and 5,000 foot level, below the snow-clad mountain tops, where especially two species of fir, Abies apollinis and Abies reginae amelae, a species remarkable for its sprouting habit, with other firs and several species of Juniperus and Supressus, form sometimes extensive forests. Other common trees are chestnut, sycamore, several species of oak and poplar, and on the coast, Pinus halepensis. The firs occupy about 35% of the forest area, oaks and deciduous forest 45%. Among the forest products which are exported we find galls, vermilion and sumac prominent. It is believed that Greece in ancient times was more fertile than it is now, and that the deterioration is due to deforestation. Undoubtedly, Soil conditions favoured such deterioration, for, with the exception of the Pindus range, which is composed of metamorphic rock, a poor dry limestone is characteristic of the country, except where fertile alluvial and diluvial deposits cover it in valleys along the coast. The climate is, however, so favourable that even the poor soil would readily reclothe itself if left alone. The winters are short, hardly three months, and with hardly any snow or ice except on the high mountains, making the vegetative period nine months, and with temperature ranges from 20 to 106 degrees Fahrenheit, rainfall average 400 millimetres, the summers, to be sure, rainless and dry, but the other seasons humid, somewhat less than in middle Europe. Rapid growth is the result of these conditions. But the continued pasturing of goats and sheep, some 6 million, prevents any natural reforestation. Increased taxation on this industry has had no effect, and the practice of permitting the people to gather dry wood for fuel is an incentive for making dry wood by setting fires, which also serve to improve the pasture. Perhaps nowhere are forest fires more frequent in spite of heavy penalties. That a baneful influence on the water condition and river flow has been the result is historically demonstrated by Chloros. In the mountains, some fine and quite extensive bodies of fir still exist, lack of transportation having preserved them. Elsewhere, the rights of user and the herding of goats are so well established that reforms appear indeed difficult. Firewood, three loads for each person, supposed to be taken from the dead or otherwise useless trees, and a small dimension material, is free to all. For the right to cut workwood, the government charges a tax of 25-30% to 30 of the value of the material, the price for this being annually determined. On the material cut in private forests, the government also levies a tax of from 12 to 18 per cent of its value. This pernicious system of promiscuous cutting leads to the most wasteful use imaginable. Not only high stumps, but large amounts of good material are left in the woods so that it is estimated that hardly 50 per cent of what is cut is really utilised. The cut, as far as the tax gives a clue to it, amounts to around 2.7 million cubic feet workwood, but with the firewood included, it was estimated that near 90 million cubic feet are cut annually. Importation to the amount of $1.5 million, mostly from Austria and Romania, make up the deficit in work material, especially for the box factories which manufacture the packages for the large export of currants, some 2 million boxes. The tax during the decade from 1862 to 1871 produced an annual income of $600,000, a little less in 1895. The forest has been from olden times and is now almost entirely state property, some 80 or 90 per cent, and in nearly all the remaining private communal and cloister property, the state has a partial ownership or supervision. The wasteland of probably three million acres extent also belongs to the state, the whole state property covering over 30 per cent of the land area. 2. Development of Forest Policies a first definite attempt to regulate matters was made by Otho, who, being a German, took a personal interest in this forest property, and instituted for each province forest inspectors, de chassis, under one chief inspector, with forest guards to prevent devastation by fire and theft. The mistake was made of employing in these positions superannuated Bavarian army officers, who were merely a burden on the treasury. 
no management or even regular fellings were attempted. The population could, as before, supply its need upon permits, always granted, from the governor of the province, one of the forest guards being supposed to advise these, and to see that the wood was properly employed, not, however, to supervise the cutting. In 1877, further legislation was had, instituting in the Ministry of Finance a forest inspector, technically trained, with two assistant inspectors also technically trained, to superintend the outside work. A forest survey was begun in 1879, but interrupted in 1888 for lack of funds and personnel. The same law placed the duty of guarding the state property in the hands of the General Police or Gendarmerie, 50 officers and some 340 guards, and during the fire danger, June to October, 110 more, being detailed for this service under direction of the Minister of War. The pernicious permit system, however, was continued. Dr. Kloros, who obtained his education in Germany, became finally forest director and was responsible for securing further legislation in 1888, the object of which was, as a first step towards improvement, to survey and delimit and round off the state property. It provided that enclaves and all absolute forest soil was to be expropriated. If no amicable agreement with the owner could be reached, the price was to be determined by the net yield which had been obtained from the property during the last five years, capitalised at 5%. No attempts, however, at an efficient organisation of change of the destructive permit system were made. By general law, the state has the right to surveillance of private property, although the extent of this right is not fully defined. The government may take for its own use, by paying for it, upwards of one-sixth of the annual cut. It collects a tax of 12 to 18% for all woodwork cut. It forbids the pasturing of woods that have been burned within 10 years, and obliges all owners of over 1,200 acres to employ forest guards. This and other interference with property rights naturally acts as deterrent to private forest management. A notable exception is the small private royal forest property near Athens, which, since 1872 under a Danish forester, appears to have been managed under forestry principles. A thorough reorganisation of the Forest Service was effected in 1893 when 20 district foresters were employed, the number of forest inspectors was increased to four, and a regular division of forestry was instituted in the Finance Department. The General Police, or Gendarmerie, were continued as forest guards. Until the native personnel could be educated by sending young men to Germany, foreigners were to be employed for the making of working plans. Yet, in 1896, the then director of the Forest Department, a lawyer, still complains of the absence of a proper organisation and of any personnel with forestry knowledge. Apparently no progress had been made. In that year, however, the gendarmerie was to be replaced by forest guards, 52 superior and 298 subaltern, who were to be appointed from graduates of a special secondary school, which had been instituted at Vitina some two years before. This replacement could, of course, not be effected at once, since hardly more than 25 men could be graduated annually. Hence, even this improvement in the lower-class police would not be completed for six or eight years. No steps had been taken to educate officers for the higher grades, and in this direction propositions merely were discussed. In 1899, a change in the permit system was made, but hardly for the better, justices of the peace being empowered under certain conditions to issue such permits nor do we find in 1901 anything more than expressions of good wishes and desire for further legislation, besides some attempts at popular education through the formation of tree-planting associations under the patronage of the Crown Princess. In 1905, no change in conditions are reported. Forest fires still continue as a common occurrence. While the government makes efforts to improve conditions, the indifference, stupidity, cupidity and malevolence of the people and the long-established abuses prevent rapid progress at reform. End of section 19For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau Section 20 Italy The efforts to secure improvement in the treatment of forest resources have been more active and strenuous in Italy than in Greece. They were induced especially by the urgent need of protecting watersheds, the rivers throughout Italy having been turned into torrents by deforestation. 
but, owing to the weakness of the government and to poverty, the actual execution of the very good laws has lagged behind. Indeed, while ample legislation has been enacted, the people, overburdened with debt and needing the small income that can be derived from pasturing or renting the pasture in the woods, make it difficult to carry on any reform, and the enforcement of the laws has again and again led to serious trouble. Forestry is a sore point in the national economy of Italy, as it involves sacrifice of money and time. Italy, therefore, is still in the transition period from forestal rapine to forest culture. Densely populated, 33 million on 110,600 square miles, with fully one-fifth of its area unproductive or at least unused, and one-quarter of this almost or quite beyond redemption, no country offers better opportunities for studying the evil effects of deforestation on soil and water flow. As a result of the combination of geology, slates and limestones, topography, steep slopes, climate and forest devastation or destruction, mainly by pasturage of goats, two million, the Italian rivers are invariably flooded in March and mostly dry in summer. The melting of the snow coinciding with the heavy spring rains turns them into raging torrents, fiumare, silting over the fertile lands in the valleys and occasional landslides in the mountain country, where extensive tracts are nearly bare of vegetation. Especially the rivers around Bologna, which in 1897 again caused damage in excess of $1 million, are dreaded. 1. Forest conditions. Situated similarly to Greece as regards accessibility and climate, and similarly torn by wars and political strife, and in unstable conditions for centuries, Italy has in proportion to population, if not to area, reduced her forest resources even more than Greece. Less than one third of an acre per capita remains, with a total of somewhat over 12 million acres, or about 17% of the land area, and this includes much useless brushland, over 2 million acres. Apparently, if the uncertain statistics may be relied upon, a reduction of several million acres has taken place since 1870. Some 15 million acres of wasteland and swamps offer ample opportunity for increasing this forest area without infringing on the 42 million acres of usefully employed agricultural soil. Of the forest area, 25% is to be found in the Alps, about 50% on the Apennines, the one mountain range which forms the backbone of Italy, Less than one quarter is distributed over the plains, and the small balance is found on the islands, especially Sicily, which is a hill and mountain country, once magnificently wooded, now largely denuded, 4% wooded. And on Sardinia, which, with nearly 45% under forest, is the best wooded part of Italy, although the condition of the forest is here no better than elsewhere. With the exception of the slopes of the Alps, 2.5 million acres of spruce, fir, beech, larch, and the tops of the Apennines and remote plateaus, 4.5 million acres, and of a few special places on which now and then even magnificent remains of virgin forest may be found, lack of transportation having preserved them, most of the area is occupied by miserable brush forest, coppice, or else open forest with scattered trees among a shrub undergrowth of thorns, hazel, and chestnut, called macchia, i.e. chaparral, so that most Italians have never seen a real forest. Nevertheless, Italy is by no means as treeless as this condition of forest would imply, for trees, poplar, ash, elm, are dotting the plains and slopes, planted for vine supports and boundaries, unshapely through pollarding and lopping the branches for firewood. Olive and chestnut groves on the hills, of the former two million acres, of the latter over 400,000 acres planted for the fruit, and 8.5 million acres in vineyards, add to the wooded appearance of the country and to the wood supply. The annual product of firewood from these planted trees is estimated at 6 million cords. On the sand dunes and near the seashore, especially in the marshes, the maritime, the Aleppo pine, and the umbrella-shaped Pinus pinea and picturesque cypresses are sometimes found in small groves, while the calcareous hills in this region up to 1,200 feet are studded with olives, cork, and evergreen oak. Osha growing is here also quite extensively practised. In the mountains, above the 2,700-foot level, conifer forest composed of Pinus sylvestris and Laricio and Abies pentinata has been reduced to less than 7% of the whole. Mixed conifer and deciduous forest represents 4%, the bulk being a deciduous forest of oak, several species, and beech with chestnut. 48% of the forest area is in coppice, sedio, 
and of the 52% of high forest, the bulk is managed under selection system, a skelter. A small part under clearing system, ad alto fusto, although management can hardly be said to exist except in small groves. That supply of workwood is insufficient for the needs of the population and is decreasing is attested by the fact that the importations more than doubled in the decade from 1892 to 1903 to near $14 million, 80% of which was saw material, in addition to $2 million of wood manufactures, while nearly $5 million worth was exported in the last named year, mostly cork, casks, thin box boards, olive wood manufactures and charcoal. No better picture of the forest conditions can be had than by a statement of the home production, which in 1886, last official data, was placed at 48 million cubic feet of workwood, valued at $3.4 million, 223 million cubic feet firewood, valued at 4.1 million, 106 million cubic feet charcoal, worth 3.6 million, and byproducts to the large amount of $6.4 million, altogether a little less than $17.6 million firewood and charcoal, which represent over 80% of the product, are of course furnished by coppice and in addition by the pollarded material, almost the only fuel to be had. The ownership of the forest area is for the greater part private, 53%, and communal, over 43%, the state owning a little over 400,000 acres, less than 4%. The state property being so small, supervision of communal and private forest has become the policy. The state forest is of two classes, the alienable, under the Department of Finance, the larger part, about 375,000 acres, and the inalienable, so declared by law of 1871, which was then about 115,000 acres and was placed under a forest administration in the Department of Agriculture. But of this, about 20% is not forest, and even in 1896, some of this small area was sold so that now only 40,000 acres remain. This area is to serve for demonstration of model management and to supply government needs. Beech and oak with fir, pine and larch, mostly in timber forests, characterise this property, which is managed mostly in selection system. Curiously enough, in 1888 the difficulty of disposing advantageously of the old timber is complained of due to the lack of means of transportation. The personnel of the administration consists of a central bureau with one inspector general, three inspectors and a council. For each province, and in some cases for two or more provinces together, an inspector with several sub-inspectors and a number of guards or brigadieri are charged with the management of the state property and the enforcement of the forest laws. 2. Development of Forest Policy For centuries since the fall of the Roman Empire, 476 AD, until the end of the 18th century, Italy had been the victim of war and strife with neighbours or within its borders, being divided into numberless commonwealths, almost each city being independent. Hence, no economic improvements could take place until, under the influence of the French Revolution, the regeneration period began. Not, however, until the seven or eight states which the Congress of Vienna, 1815, had established, were moulded into one united Italy under Victor Emmanuel during the years 1859 to 1870, could an effective reconstruction be inaugurated. It is true that some of the republics in earlier times paid attention to their forest property. Notably, in Venice, old forest ordinances date back to 697, and in 1453 a regular forest administration was instituted, especially to take care of the large forest area in Istria and Dalmatia, which fell into the hands of the Venetians about 1420. A tolerably conservative management continued here until the beginning of the 18th century, when, in consequence of political complications, supervision became lax and devastation began which continued through the century, leaving to the new century and finally to the Austrians the legacy of the caste. See page 173. Florence, too, managed to prevent the deforestation of the summit of her mountains until the beginning of the 18th century and in other republics, kingdoms, and duchies, similar efforts at forest administrations existed. Yet Genoa, which in Strabo's time was the principal timber market of Italy, had by 1860 nearly all its mountain slopes denuded. Before the general legislation for all Italy was enacted, there were at least a dozen laws and operations in the various provinces. 
in Lombardy, the law of 1811, in Naples, the law of 1862, in Rome of 1827, in Umbria of 1805, in Bologna of 1829, in Tuscany of 1829, in Piedmont of 1833, in Sardinia of 1851, etc. If these had been heeded, much better conditions would have been inherited by the new kingdom. With the arrival of a national spirit, many schemes for the promotion of forestry and of forest policy were discussed. The academies of Florence, Milan, Modena, Palermo and Pissarro offered premiums for reforesting of mountains and called for popular treatises on silviculture. A forestry journal came into being furthering the propaganda. In 1860, a very well-written account of present conditions of forestry and production of sulphur in Sicily, a collection of reports, was published in Shiro. In 1860 also, an investigation of forest conditions in each province was ordered by royal decree, and propositions for their improvement were called for, which led to legislative proposals introduced in 1862 and legislation enacted in 1863. The law of 1863 still treated each province independently, Forest inspectors for each province, and for Naples an inspector general, with district foresters and a large number of forest guards were appointed. Another law, applicable only to certain parts of the kingdom, was enacted in 1874, intended to check the progress of deforestation and prevent turning waste woodlands into pasture. These absolute forest soils were to be reforested within five years. The law remained a dead letter, yet it is still in force in part with the modifications enacted in 1886. The final unification of the country, as far as legislative unity is concerned, was completed in 1877, and in that year the first general forest law for all Italy was also enacted. This law, which has mainly in view the protective influence of forest cover as a factor in the public welfare, leaving all private property not falling under the character of protective forest entirely free, established provincial forest commissions, conservation boards, unpaid, who were to enact rules and regulations best adapted to their localities. The Board of Commissioners consisted of the Prefect of the Province, ex officio, President, an Inspector of Forests, the Technical Officer who administers the government property, an Engineer appointed by the Governor, and three members chosen by the Provincial Council. In addition, each Communal Council was to send one member to take part in the deliberations of the Board as far as his particular Commune was interested. By this law, the country is divided into two sections vertically, namely the territory above the limit of Chestnut and that below this limit, the latter representing the farming country, the territory above being unfit for agricultural use. To the former, the restrictions of the law apply as a rule, Tereni Sogerti al Vincolo Forestale, ban forest, to the latter as exception, namely where the removal of forest or brush cover might cause landslides or affect stream flow or health conditions unfavourably. The chestnut limit naturally varies in different parts, but generally speaking, lies between 1,800 and 2,000 feet elevation. The determination of these areas was to be made by the provincial forest committees, and it is significant to note that in these the state forest administration did not have the majority. The territory under restriction was, in 1887, after various revisions, established as comprising 7.5 million acres of forest and 2.5 million acres of brush and waste, nearly 71% of the forest area being thus placed under restriction, leaving 2.5 million acres of forest and over 2 million of brush and waste outside the working of the law. These latter areas are left entirely without restrictions, except as general police regulations apply. The execution of the law and regulations is left to the State Forest Department with an organisation of forest guards, some 3,000 in 1883, appointed by the Prefect of the Province with the advice of the Forestry Commission, but acting under the State Forest Administration. Their pay was to come to the extent of two-thirds from the communes, the other third from the provincial treasurer. In the forests placed under the law, clearing and agricultural use is forbidden. Fellings and cultures must be made under direction of the committee. No compensation is made for this limitation in use, except where hygienic influence was the basis for placing the forest under ban. If the regulations of the commissions had been observed to their full extent, all would have been well in time, but it is evident from subsequent legislative efforts that the execution of the laws was not what could be desired. 
political exigencies required leniency in the application of the law. An interesting report on the results of the first quinquennium shows that during that time 170,000 acres were cleared, over 40,000 without permission, and by 1900 it was estimated deforestation had taken place on about 5 million acres. Wrangling over the classification of the lands under banned has continued until the present, and local authorities have continued to favour private as against public interest, to withdraw lands from the operation and to wink at disregard of the law. Moreover, rights of user to dead wood, pasturage, goats are by law excluded, and other privileges continue to prevent improvement, although several laws to affect their extinction had been passed. The devastating floods of 1882 led to much agitation, and upon a report of a special commission in 1886, the law of 1874, which had obligated the communities to reforest their wastelands within five years or else to sell, was revived, extending the term of obligatory reforestation in the endangered sections to ten years. By that time, out of 800,000 acres originally declared as requiring reforestation, not more than 40,000 acres had been planted, but the acreage involved had also been gradually scaled down by the forest committees to 240,000 acres. The report, on the other hand, found that the area needing reboisement was at least 500,000 acres, requiring an expenditure of $12 million. The law of 1877 did not contemplate enforced reforestation of ban forests. It sought to accomplish this by empowering either the Department of Agriculture or the provinces or the communities or special associations to expropriate for the purpose of reforestation. Results were nil. A revision and broadening of the law led to the General Reboisement Act of 1888, which has in view the correction of torrents, fixing of mountain slopes and sand dunes, one of the best laws of its kind in existence anywhere. The principal features of the law are obligatory reboisement of mountains and sand dunes according to plans and under direction of the Department of Agriculture, the areas to be designated by the department with approval or disapproval of the forest committees, contribution to the extent of two-fifths, finally raised to two-thirds, of the expense by the government, expropriation where owners do not consent or fail to carry out the work as planned, right to reclaim property by payment of costs and interest or else sale by government, right of the department to regulate and restrict pasture, but compensation to be paid to restricted owners, encouragement of cooperative planters associations. The area to be reforested was estimated at somewhat over 500,000 acres and the expense at over $7 million. The execution of the law was not any stricter than before. In 1900, the Secretary of Agriculture reports that the laws do not yet receive effective application. The difficulty of determining what is and what is not necessary to reforest, what is and what is not absolute forest soil, made ostensibly the greatest trouble and occasioned delay. But financial incapacity and political influences bidding for popularity are probably the main cause of the inefficiency. Meanwhile, the Forest Department tried to promote reforestation by giving premiums from its scanty appropriation and distributing from its 130 acres of nurseries during the years from 1867 to 1899, some 46 million plants and over 500 pounds of seed, and furnishing advice free of charge. In 1897, again a commission was instituted to formulate new legislation. This commission reported in 1902, declaring that all accessible forests were more or less devastated, accentuating the needs of water management and proposing a more rigorous definition of banned forests, a strict supervision of communal forests, and the management of private properties under working plans by accredited foresters, or else under direct control of the forest department, the foresters to be paid by the state, which is to recover from the owners. It was found that in the past 35 years of the 125,000 acres needing reforestation urgently, only 58,300 acres had been planted at an expense of $1,340,000. In 1910, conditions seem not to have much improved, for again a vigorous attempt at reorganisation and improvement on the law of 1877 was made by the Minister of Agriculture, so far without result. It is to be noted that Italy is perhaps the only country where forest influence on health conditions was legally recognised by the laws of 1877 and 1888. The belief that deforestation of the Maramne, the marshy lowlands between Pisa and Naples, had produced the malarial fever which is rampant here, 
led the Trappist monks of the cloister at Trefontaine to make plantations of eucalyptus, 84,000, beginning in 1870, the state assisting by cessations of land for the purpose. A commission, appointed to investigate the results in 1881, threw doubt on the effectiveness of the plantation, finding the observed change in health conditions due to the improvement of drainage, and lately the mosquito has been recognised as the main agency in propagating the fever. The new propositions, however, did not any more recognise this claimed influence as a reason for public intervention. Incidentally, it may be stated that to two Italians is due the credit of having found the true cause of salubriousness of forest air, namely in the absence of pathogenic bacteria. 3. Education and Literature The first forest school was organised by Balestrieri, who had studied in Germany at the agricultural school near Turin about 1848, transferred to the Technical Institute in Turin in 1851. This school continued until 1869, and from 1863 on had been recognised by the state, assuring its graduates employments in state service. In 1869, the state established a forest school of its own, Institute Forestale, at Vallombrosa, near Florence, with a three years course, since 1886, four years, and in 1900 with 11 professors and 40 students. In spite of the state's subvention of $8,500, it appears that some peculiar economies are necessary, for owing to the absence of stoves, the school is closed from November 1st to March 1st. In spite of the existence of this school, the state service is recruited also from men who have not passed through this school. The legislative propositions brought forward in 1910 also provide for transfer of this school to Florence, leaving only the experiment station in Vallombrosa, and also for raising the standard of instruction. At the same time, however, there was at the old institution ordered a rush course to be finished in 15 months, since it appeared that not enough foresters were in existence to carry out the proposed reorganisation. In 1905, a school of silviculture for forest guards was instituted in Cita Ducale, the course being nine months. Besides the technical school at Vallombrosa, agricultural schools have chairs of forestry or arboriculture, as for instance the Royal School at Portici. As an educational feature, the introduction of Arbor Day in 1902, La Festa de Alberi, should also be mentioned. The existence of a forest school naturally produces a literature. While a considerable number of popular booklets attempts the education of the people who are the owners of the forest, there is no absence of professional works. Among these should be mentioned Di Berenga's Selvicultura, a very complete work, which also contains a brief history of forestry in the Orient, Greece and Italy. G. Collis Simoni's Manuel d'Art Forestale, 1864, and the earlier Scienza Silvana by Dondi, 1829, are encyclopedias of inferior quality. In 1859, R. Mathie, a private forester, began to publish the Revista Forestale del Regno d'Italia, an annual review for the purpose of popularising forestry in Italy, afterwards changed into a monthly, which continued for some time under subventions from the government. A number of propagandist forestry associations were formed at various times, publishing leaflets or journals, one of these L'Alp, a monthly, in 1902. In 1910, the two leading societies combined into a federation, Promontibus et Enti Affini, merging also the Revista Forestale Italiana with LALP, which serves both propagandist and professional needs. End of section 20. Section 21 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau Section 21 Spain Poor Spain is the expression which comes to the lips of everybody who contemplates the economic conditions of this once so powerful nation, almost the ruler of the world. Once, under the beneficent dominion of the Saracens, a paradise where, as a Roman author puts it, nil otiosum nihil sterile in Hispania. It has become almost a desert through neglect, indolence, ignorance, false pride, lack of communal spirit, despotism of church, and misrule by corrupt bureaucracy. With the exception of a narrow belt along the seashore, the whole of the Iberian Peninsula is a vast high mesa, 
plateau or tableland, 1,500 to 3,000 feet above sea level, traversed by lofty mountain chains or sierras, five or six in number, running parallel to each other, mainly in a westerly and southwesterly direction. These divide the plateau into as many plains, treeless and for the most part arid, exposed to cold blasts in winter and burning up in summer. They are frequently subjected to severe droughts, which sometimes have lasted for months, bringing desolation to country and people. The rivers, as they usually do in such countries similar to our arid plains, form canyons and arroyos, and being uncertain in their water stages, none of them are navigable, although hundreds of miles long, but useful for irrigation on which agriculture relies. The great mineral wealth has made Spain the California of the Carthaginians and Romans, and it is still its most valuable resource. Spain awakened to civilization through the visits of Phoenicians and Carthaginians, followed by the Romans. During the first centuries of the Christian era, there occurred one of the several periods of extreme prosperity, when a supposed population of 40 million exploited the country. After the dark days of the Gothic domination, a second period of prosperity was attained for the portion which came under the sway of the industrious and intelligent Moors, or Saracens, 711 to 1000 AD, who made the desert bloom, and whose irrigation works are still the mainstay of agriculture at present. Centuries of warfare and carnage to re-establish Christian kingdoms still left the country rich when, in 1479, the several kingdoms were united into one under Ferdinand and Isabella, and the Moors were finally driven out altogether, 1492. This kingdom persisted in the same form to the present time, with only a short period as a republic, 1873. Spain was among the first countries to have a constitution. After the conquest of the Moors, and with the discovery of America, again a period of prosperity set in for the then 20 million people, but through oppression by state and church, Inquisition, which also led to the expulsion of the Jews and large emigration to America, the prosperity of the country was destroyed, the population reduced to 10 million in 1800, and the conditions of character and government created which are the cause of its present desolation. Since the beginning of the century, the population has increased to near 18 million, but financial bankruptcy keeps the government inefficient and unable to accomplish reforms, even if the people would let it have its way. 1. Forest conditions. It has been a matter of speculation whether Spain was or was not once heavily wooded. See page 11. In Roman times, only the Provence of La Manca is reported as being unforested, and in the 13th and 14th centuries, extensive forest zones are still recorded. The character of the country at present and the climate, both resembling so much our own arid plains, make it questionable to what extent the forest descended from the mountain ranges, which were undoubtedly well wooded. At present, the forest is mainly confined to the higher mountains. The best is to be found in the Pyrenees and their continuation, the Cantabrian Mountains. The area of actual forest, Bosques, is not known with precision, since in the official figures, mere potential forest, i.e. brush and wasteland, is included, Montes, and the area varies, i.e. diminishes through new clearings, of which the statistics do not keep account. Moreover, the statistics refer only to the public forests, leaving out the state and private forest areas, if any. In 1859, this area was reported as over 25 million acres, or 20% of the land area, 196,000 square miles. In 1885, the acreage had been reduced to about 17.5 million acres, and in 1900, about 16 million acres, or 13% of the land area, remained as public forest, and the total was estimated at somewhat over 20 million acres. The following peculiar classification, published in 1874, gives, in round figures, at once an insight into the meaning of Montes and the probable condition of the public forest area. State reserves, 865,000 acres. Saleable state property, 4,550,000 acres. Public institute forest, 20,000 acres. Communal forest, 9,860,000 acres. Open commons for wood and pasture, 1,880,000 acres. Common pasture for draft animals, 425,000 acres. Total, 17,600,000 acres. An estimate of the actual forest, timber and coppice, does not exceed 12 million acres, 
for a population of 18 million or 0.7 acres per capita. The latest official figures claim as state property around 600,000 acres and municipal institutional property 11.5 million acres, these constituting the public forests. According to official classification, these public forests are to the extent of 5.3 million acres high forest, 3 million coppice, the balance brushwoods. In spite of this evident lack of wood material, except for firewood or charcoal, the importations in 1903 did not exceed $13.5 million, accentuating the absence of industrial development. The official statement of imports reports $6.5 million more than the above figure, but this includes horses and cattle enumerated as forest products, products of the Montes. These also figure in the exportations of $15 million, which to the extent of one half consists of cork, some $5 million from 630,000 acres, and tan bark, while chestnuts, filberts, and esparto furnish the balance. In 1908, the imports of lumber and staves alone amounted to $7,382,000. In 1882, all the public forests produced from wood sales only $900,000 but the value of the products taken by rights of user was estimated at nearly twice that amount. In 1910, the average income of the Forest Service was reported as having averaged for the decade in the neighbourhood of $2 million, and the expense approximately $1 million, a net yield of about $0.30 cents per acre on the area involved, resulting the total cost being 5.7 million cubic feet annually. The forest flora and its distribution is very similar to that of Italy, and is described fully in two volumes prepared by a special commission appointed for this purpose. 2. Development of forest policy Spain is noted for its comprehensive legislation, without execution. It is also known that official reports are rarely trustworthy, so that what appears on paper is by no means always found in reality, hence all statements must be accepted with reservations. The forest laws of Spain are somewhat similar to those of Italy, yet show less appreciation of the needs of technical forest culture. The value of forest resources and need of economy in their use was indeed recognised early. Recommendations for their conservative use are recorded from the 13th century on. An ordinance of Pedro I in 1351 imposed heavy fines upon forest destroyers. Ferdinand V, in 1496, expressed alarm at the progressing devastation and, in 1518, we find the system of forest guards established, and even ordinances ordering reforestation of wastelands, which were again and again repeated during the century. In 1567 and 1582, notes of alarm at the continuing destruction proved that these ordinances had no effect. The same complaints and fears are expressed by the rulers during the 17th and 18th centuries, without any effective action. In 1748, Ferdinand VI placed all forests under government supervision, but in 1812 the Cortes of Cadiz, under the influence of the spirit of the French Revolution, rescinded these orders and abolished all restrictions. An awakening to the absolute necessity of action seems not to have arrived until about 1833, when a law was enacted and an ordinance issued at great length defining the means of Montes and instituting in the Corps of Civil Engineers a forest inspection. At the same time, a special school was to be established in Madrid. This last proposition does not seem to have materialised, for, in 1840, we find that several young men were sent to the forest school at Tharant, Germany. No doubt under the influence of these men on their return, backed by La Sociedad Económica of Madrid, a commission to formulate a forest law was instituted in 1846, and in the same year, carrying out ordinances of 1835 and 1843, a forest school was established at Villa Viciosa de Odon, later, 1869, transferred to the Escurial near Madrid. This school, under semi-military organisation, first with a three-year, later a four-year course, and continually improved and enlarged in its curriculum, one director and thirteen professors in 1900, is the pride of the Spanish foresters to all appearances deservedly so. It was organised after German models by Bernardo de Torre Royas as first director. The creation of a forest department, however, Cuerpo de Montes, had to wait until 1853, this department, under the Minister of Public Works, now under the Minister of Agriculture, is a close corporation made up of the graduates of the school as Ingenieros de Montes, 
acceptance into which is based upon graduation and four years' service in the forest department as assistance besides the performance of some meritorious work. The school stands in close relation to the department service. The first work of the new administration was a general forest survey to ascertain conditions and especially to determine which of the public forests under the laws of 1855 and 1859 it was desirable to retain. The investigation showed that there was more forest, defined as in the above classification, than had been supposed, but that it was in even worse condition than had been known. The public forests, i.e. those owned by the state, the communities and public institutions, were divided into three classes according to the species by which formed, which was the easiest way of determining their location as regards altitude and their public value, namely the coniferous forest and deciduous oak and chestnut forests, which were declared inalienable. The forests of ash, alder, willow, etc., naturally located in the lower levels, therefore without interest to the state, which were declared saleable and an intermediate third class composed of cork oak and evergreen oak, whose status as to property of sale was left in doubt. In 1862, a revision of this classification left out this doubtful class, adding it and the forest areas of the first class, which were not at least 250 acres in extent to the saleable property. The first class, which was to be reserved, was found to comprise nearly 17 million acres, of which 1.2 million was owned by the state, whilst the saleable property was found to be about half that area. Ever since, a constant wrangle and commotion has been kept up regarding the classification and repeated attempts, sometimes successful, have been made by one faction, usually led by the Minister of Finance, to reduce the public forest area, Desa Motizadoro, opposed by another faction under the lead of the Forest Administration, which was formed again and again to reclassify. In 1883, the alienable public forest area was by decree placed under the Minister of Finance, the inalienable part remaining under the Minister of Public Works, Fomento, very much the same as it was in the United States until recently. The public debt and immediate financial needs of the corporations gave the incentive for desiring the disposal of forest property and, to satisfy this demand, it was ordered, in 1878, that all receipts from the state property and 20% of the receipts from communal forests were to be applied towards the extinguishment of the debt. The ups and downs in this struggle to keep the public forests intact were accentuated on the one hand by the pressing needs of taking care of the debt, on the other hand by drought and flood. Thus, in 1874, the sale in annual instalments of over 4.5 million acres in the hands of the Minister of Finance was ordered, but the floods of the same year were so disastrous, causing $7 million damage, 760 deaths, 28,000 homeless, being followed by successive droughts that a reversal of sentiment was experienced, which led to the enactment of a reboisement law in 1877. This law, having in view better management of communal properties, ordered with all sorts of unnecessary technical details the immediate reforestation of all wastelands in the public forests, creating for that purpose a corps of 400 cultivators, Capitacas de Cultivos. To furnish the funds for this work, the communities were to contribute 10% of the value of the forest products they sold or were entitled to. But funds were not forthcoming, and by 1895, under this law, only 21,000 acres had been reforested, three-fourths by sowing. The financial results of the management of the public forests, although the forest department probably did the best it could under the circumstances, had indeed not been reassuring. In 1861, a deficit of $26,000 was recorded. In 1870, $600,000 worth of material was sold, $1.3 million worth given away, and $700,000 worth destroyed. Altogether, by fire and theft, it was estimated that 15% of the production was lost. In 1885, this loss was estimated at 25%, when the net income had attained to 15 cents per acre, or on the 17.5 million acres to less than $3 million. When it is considered that the governors of provinces and their appointees, beside the village authorities, had also a hand in the administration, it is no wonder that the forest department was pretty nearly helpless. While under the law of 1863 the department was specially ordered to regulate the management of communal forests and to gauge the cut to the increment, the political elements in the administration, which appointed the forest guards, made the regulations mostly nugatory. At last, in 1900, a new era seems to have arrived, 
a thorough reorganisation was made which lends hope for a better future. The technical administration was divorced from the political influence and placed under the newly created Minister of Agriculture. The machinery of the Cuerpo de Montes was remodelled. This consists now of one Chief Inspector General, four Division Chiefs, ten Inspector Generals for Field Inspection, fifty Chief Engineers of District Managers, 185 Assistants and 342 Foresters and Guards the latter now appointed by the departments instead of the governors, and not all, as formerly, chosen from veteran soldiers. The better financial showing referred to above was the result. In 1910, a special reboisement service, the Servicio Hidrological Forestal, was also placed on a new footing, the country being divided into ten districts for this purpose, and an engineer placed in charge of each. But from a statement that, in 1910, of some 300,000 acres planned to be recovered, only 31,000 had been completed, it may be inferred that financial difficulties still retard the work. Private forests, which had been without any interference, were, in 1908, placed under government control, so far as located within a defined protective zone, Zona Protectora da Socratica. Such must be managed under plans provided by the Forest Service, and in case of refusal on the part of owners, expropriation proceedings are provided, but the money for taking advantage of this provision would probably not be in the Treasury. Indeed, according to Professor Miguel del Campo at the Esquerial Forest School, results so far are nil. Since 1896, popular education is attempted through Arbor Days, various associations fostering the idea. In 1904, La Fiesta del Arbor, was made a national holiday, and premiums are distributed for plantations made on that day. The Revista de Montes, a semi-official monthly journal, began its publication in 1877 and serves the purpose of propaganda, as well as the professional needs. A considerable book literature is also developed. End of section 21「Section 22 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernow. Section 22. The Mediterranean Peninsulas. Portugal. The small kingdom which occupies the west coast of the Iberian Peninsula with 34,000 square miles and 6 million people, is in many respects similar to Spain, except that a larger portion is fertile, being situated in the littoral region. The climate less excessive and the people somewhat more enterprising. Not much more than one half of the country, however, is utilized, nearly 15,000 square miles being waste. Three sections or zones are recognized, the northern bounding on spain which is mainly mountainous but also contains extensive sand dunes is the best wooded the central which is hilly and less well wooded contains in extremadura and beira one of the most desolate regions of europe and at the same time the best managed forest the southern the richest in farmlands with semi-tropic climate and flora the zone of evergreen broadleaf flora about ten per cent of the land area or four million acres are under forest although two million more are wooded with olive fig almond plantations or open woodlands and brushwood of the actual forest area the state owns only eighty two thousand acres thirty thousand of which reforested areas or sand dunes in process of recovery the composition is nearly one half of pine pinus maratima and pinea one-fifth cork oak with pastures, a little over one-fifth, other greenwood oaks with pastures, and the balance chestnut and deciduous oaks. The fact of the extensive private ownership and the reference to the pastures and the enumeration of forest areas suffice to give an idea of the condition of most of them. The oak forest is also to a large extent still used for hog raising. Besides the native forest areas, there are in existence a number of parks and plantations of exotics, the climate of Portugal in parts resembling that of California, and permitting a wide range of introductions, even tropical. There is perhaps nowhere such a good opportunity of seeing the most varied forest, flora, and fine development 
as the forest parks of montserrat of busaco and in the various botanical gardens extensive eucalyptus and acacia plantations some fifteen hundred acres of highly economical value near abrantes are the enterprise of a private landowner w c tate the deficiency of wood supplies is covered by an importation of about one point five million dollars against which there is an export of a little over half a million mainly cooperage stock the best developed forest industry is the growing of cork giving rise to an export of around five million dollars a considerable naval store production is also developed the first attempt at a real management of the state's property dates from eighteen sixty eight a regular organization however did not take place until eighteen seventy two when under the director general of commerce and industries a forest administrator with a technical staff of three division chiefs corresponding to the three sections of country and six forest masters were installed at present the staff of the inspector consists of eight technically educated assistants each in charge of some branch of service under these there are a number of field agents or supervisors some fourteen in 1903 with less education and under foresters and guards the only really well managed forest the pride of the portuguese foresters is the forest of leira in extremadura a planted pinery of about twenty five thousand acres on which over fifty men of various grades are employed with naval store distilleries impregnating works and sawmills its management and natural seed tree system dates from eighteen ninety two besides attending to the management of the state forests a committee composed of the administrator and some of the technical staff were to examine the country and decide what parts needed reforestation as a result of a very full report in eighteen eighty two a reboisement law was enacted under which some of the sand dunes were fixed in nineteen o three a more thorough organization of this work took place which with liberal appropriations promises more rapid progress the law recognizes two ways of placing private property under a forestry regime namely obligatory and facultative or voluntary territory in the mountains and on sand dunes may if deemed by the superior agricultural council as requiring it from the point of view of public utility be placed under the regime by royal decree or else private owners may ask to have their property so placed either merely securing police protection obligating themselves to keep the property wooded or working under a working plan or reforestation plan provided by the forest service in either case the owner is obliged to pay the guards and at the rate of about two cents per acre for the working plans planting material is furnished free or at cost price and exemption from taxes for twenty years is granted for reforested lands expropriation of waste lands declared as of public interest is provided if owners object to enforced reforestation some two hundred and seventy five thousand acres have so far been placed under the forestry regime there are provisions for forestry education in the school of agriculture at lisbon or the education for the higher positions in the forest service may be secured at german or french forest schools and some have secured it at Valabrosa. End of section 22. Section 23 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernal. Great Britain and Her Colonies. Historical Inquiries Concerning Forests and Forest Laws by Percival Lewis, 1811, gives a full account of the practices in the old banned forests. English Forests and Forest Trees, 1853, Anonymous, gives an interesting account of the old forests and their history. Our Forests and Woodlands by John Nisbet, 1900, has a chapter on the historical development of forest laws. William Schlich, Manual of Forestry, Volume 1, 3rd Edition, 1906, brings in convenient form an amount of conditions in various parts of the British Empire. Schwabach, Forstliche Zustande in England, Zeitschrift für Fürst und Jagdwesen, 
1903, is an account of forest conditions from the pen of a practical observer. B. Ribbentrop, Forestry in India, 1900, also various reports of the forest departments of the various British colonies. It is a remarkable fact that the nation which can boast of the most extensive forest department in one of her colonies has at home not yet been able to come to an intelligent conception even, not to speak of application, of proper forest policy or forest economy. One of the English authorities on the subject writes still in 1900, with so much land of poor quality lying uncultivated in many parts of the British Isles, the apathy shown toward forestry in Britain is one of the things that it is impossible to understand. If we should venture to seek for an explanation, we would find it in geographical and physical conditions, but still more in personal and political characteristics historically developed, such as also in the United States, make progress of forestry slower than it would otherwise be. Due to her insular position, with which in part the development of her naval supremacy is connected, England can readily supply her needs by importations. Situated within the influence of the Gulf Stream, the climate is much milder than her northern location would indicate, and is in no respect excessive. The topography is most gentle, except in Scotland and Wales, and the river flow even all the year. Hence, the absence of forest cover has not been felt in its physical influences. Britons, Picts, Scots, Scandinavians, Anglo-Saxons, and Normans are the elements which have amalgamated to make the English people. Through endless warfare and political struggle, the three countries, England, Scotland, and Ireland, had by the year 1600 come under one ruler, although final legislative union with Scotland did not take place until 1707, and with Ireland not until 1800. Theoretically, forming a constitutional monarchy, practically an aristocracy with republican tendencies, the history of the islands has been a struggle, first to establish race supremacy, then to secure the ascendancy of the nobility and landholders over the king and the commoners, in which the former have been more successful than the barons in other parts of Europe. Politically, the Englishman is an individualist, jealous of his private interests and unwilling to submit to government interference for the public welfare. Hence, state forestry, which is finally the only solution of the forestry problem, appears objectionable. Commercial and industrial enterprise rather than economic development appeals to him, the practical issue of the day, rather than the demands of a future, and systematic preparation for the same, occupy his mind. He lacks, as Mr. Roseberry points out, scientific method, and hence is wasteful. Moreover, he is conservative and self-satisfied beyond the citizens of any other nation. Hence, if all the wisdom of the world point new ways, he will still cling to his accustomed ones. In the matter of having commissions appointed to investigate and report, and leaving things to continue in unsatisfactory condition, he reminds one of Spanish deletoriness. This would appear to us the reasons for the difficulty which the would-be reformers experience in bringing about economic reforms. 1. Forest Conditions Caesar's and Strabo's descriptions agree that Great Britain was a densely wooded country. The forest area seems to have been reduced much less through long-continued use than through destruction by fire and pasture, and by subsequent formation of moors, so that it is now, excepting that of Portugal, the smallest of any European nation in proportion to total area, and excepting that of Holland, in proportion to population. Of the 121,380 square miles which Great Britain and Ireland represent, less than 4%, or 3 million acres, 880,000 in Scotland, 303,000 in Ireland, are forested, one-fourteenth of an acre per capita. But there are nearly 33% of wastelands, namely over 12 million acres of heaths, moors, and other wastelands capable of forest growth, and another 12 million acres partly or doubtfully so, while the agricultural land and crops and pasture comprises about 48 million acres. The waste areas reforested, it is believed, could meet the consumption now supplied by importations. Notably in Scotland, extensive heaths and moors of many hundred square miles in the northern highlands and the Grampian Mountains well wooded in olden times, 
the woods having been eradicated supposedly for strategic reasons, are now without farms or forests, and are mainly used for shooting preserves. In the last thirty years, the land under tillage has continuously decreased, and now represents less than twenty-five percent of the whole land area, grasslands occupying thirty-eight percent. The agricultural land, as well as the mountain and heathlands, are to the largest extent owned by large proprietors. In 1876, 11,000 persons owned 72% of the total area of the British Islands. With the exception of 67,000 acres of crownlands, the entire forest area is owned privately, and that mostly by large landed proprietors, there being no communal ownership, except that the municipality of London owns a forest area, Epping Forest, devoted to pleasure, and the water board of Liverpool has begun to plant some of its catchment basins. Practically, the entire wood supply is imported, and the rate of importation is rapidly increasing. While in 1864 it was 3.4 million tons, in 1892, 7.8 million tons worth $92 million, in 1899, 10 million tons and $125 million, in 1902 it had grown to $138 million, and in 1906 to 141 million, 700 million cubic feet, in which 7.4 million of wood manufactures, against which an export of 19 million mainly wood manufactures must be offset. This makes England the largest wood importer in the world. Germany coming next, and the amount paid to other countries exceeds the value of her pig iron output. Nearly 90% of the import is coniferous material, from Sweden, Russia, and Canada. The home product, mostly oak ties, mine props, etc., satisfies about one-sixth of the consumption. In addition to timber and lumber, over $10 million of wood pulp and $60 million of byproducts are imported. The total wood consumption per capita is between 12 and 14 cubic feet, half of what it was 50 years ago. Pine is the only native conifer of timber value, and oak is the most important native deciduous tree found mostly in coppice or in old, overmature, straggling pasture woods. Compact, larger forest areas are entirely absent, but there are many small plantations and parks. For... While Englishmen have not been foresters, they have been active tree planters, and the mild climate has permitted the introduction of many exotics, especially American conifers. Most of these plantings have been for park and game purposes. The most noted forest plantations are found in Scotland. Among them the larch plantations of the Duke of Atoll, begun in 1728, of at one time over 10,000 acres, the ducal woodlands now covering over 20,000 acres, the pinery of 25,000 acres belonging to the Countess of Sealfield, the best managed forest property, partly in natural regeneration, and others. But these plantations, too, are mostly widely spaced and trimmed, hence not producing timber of much value, so that timber of British production is usually ruled out by architects. 2. Development of Forest Policies the Saxons and Normans were primarily hunters, and this propensity to the chase has impressed itself upon their forest treatment into modern times. The Teutonic Saxons, undoubtedly brought with them the feudal and communal institutions of the Germans, under which territory for the king's special pleasure in the chase was set aside as forest, and this exclusive right and privilege was on other territory extended to the vassals, while the commoners were excluded from the exercise of hunting privileges on these grounds. The Normans not only increased the lands under ban, but they increased also in a despotic manner the penalties and punishments for infraction of the forest laws, and enforced them more stringently than was done on the continent. The feudal system was developed to its utmost. Besides forests, in which the king alone had exclusive rights, and in which a code of special laws administered under special courts was applied, there were set aside chases, hunting reserves without the pale of the forest laws, parks, smaller enclosed hunting grounds, and warrens, privileged by royal grant or prescription as preserves for small game. Whole villages were wiped out, or lived almost in bondage to satisfy this taste for sport. In the forests, of which in Elizabeth's time not less than seventy-five distinct ones were enumerated, 
withdrawing an immense area from free use. Both vert and venison, wood and game, belonged to the king, a host of officers, stewards, verderers, foresters, regarders, agisters, woodwards, exercised police duties, and oppressed and ground the people by extortions, while special courts, woodmote, swainmote, court of justice seat, enforced these savage and cruel laws. The first of these laws was supposed to date from Canute the Great in 1016, but was eventually found to be a forgery perpetrated by William I in order to lend historical color to his assertion of forest rights. A partial reduction of forests and a modification of the cruelty and unreasonableness of the laws was obtained by the Charta de Foresta in 1225, which formulated the laws into a code, and again by the Forest Ordinance of 1306. But not until 1483, under Edward IV, were the people living within forests permitted to cut and sell timber, and to fence in for seven years portions of the reserved territory. The last territory was aforested, in other words, withdrawn for purposes of the chase, under Henry VIII, but he had to secure the consent of the freeholders. The long Parliament in 1641 stopped at least the extension of forests and modified the application of the laws to a more reasonable degree. The forest laws are still on the statutes, but have fallen into desuetude. The last forest court of justice seat was held under Charles I. The forests themselves have also almost entirely vanished, some being abolished as late as Queen Victoria's time by Act of Parliament. But the last action under the forest laws was had in 1862, when the Duke of Atoll tried to establish his right as forester for the crown. A full account of the forest laws is contained in Manwood's volume, title page of which is here reproduced. A treatise of the laws of the forest, wherein is declared not only those laws as they are now in force, but also the original and beginning of forests, and what a forest is in his own proper nature, and wherein the same doth differ from a chase, a park, or a warren, with all such things as are incident or belonging therein too, with their swirl proper terms of art. Also, a treatise of the pure allay, declaring what pure allay is, how the same first began, what a pure allay man may do, how he may hunt and use his own pure allay, how far he may pursue and follow after his chase, together with the limits and bounds as well of the forest as the pure allay. Collected, as well out of the common laws and statutes of this land, as also out of sundry learned ancient authors, and out of the Assises of Pickering and Lancaster by Ian Manwood, whereunto are added the statutes of the forest, a treatise of the swirl officers of verderers, regarders, and foresters, and courts of attachments, swanimote and justice seat of the forest, and certain principal cases, judgments and entries of the Assises of Pickering and Lancaster, never heretofore printed for the public. London, printed for the Society of Stationers, Anno Dominum 1615, cum Priolegio. In Scotland the same usages and laws existed, only very much less rigorously enforced, until, in 1681, the extension of forests was discontinued by Parliamentary Act. It will be understood that the term forest did not only distantly refer to woodland, and that no economic policy had anything to do with the laws. Only, incidentally, was forest growth protected and preserved for the sake of the chase, the same medieval policy which still largely animates the forest policy of the state of New York. The woods outside the forests, which had mainly served for the raising of hogs and for domestic needs, experienced at various times unusual reduction by fire. General Monk, among others, laid waste large areas on the Scottish borderland in Cromwell's time. The first serious inroads by extensive fellings occurred under Edward III in the first half of the 14th century to enrich the treasury for the French wars. Again, Henry VIII in the 16th century, when he seized the church properties for his own use, turned them into cash. A hundred years later, James I reduced the forest area, especially in Ireland, by his colonization schemes. Yet both Henry VIII and James I are on record as encouraging forest planting for utility. Charles I, James's successor, always in need of cash, alienated many of the crown forests and turned them into cash, 
besides extorting money through the forest courts. During the revolution, beginning in 1642 and during Cromwell's reign, a licentious devastation of the confiscated or mortgaged noblemen's woods took place. Finally, under Charles II, the needs for the Royal Navy forced attention to the reduction of wood supplies, and as a result of the agitation to encourage the growth of timber, a member of the newly formed Royal Society was deputed to prepare an essay, which published in 1662 has become the classic work of English forest literature, namely John Evelyn's Silva, or A Discourse of Forest Trees, which has experienced eleven editions. It should, however, be mentioned that an earlier writer, whom Evelyn often quotes, Tougher, before the reign of Elizabeth in 1526, published his Five Hundred Points of Husbandry, a versification in which tree planting received attention. Ever since that time, periodically and spasmodically, the question of forestry has been agitated, without much serious result. From 1775 to 1781, the Society of Arts in London offered gold medals and prizes for tree planting, and in the beginning of the 19th century a revival of arboricultural interest was experienced, perhaps as a result of an interesting report by the celebrated Admiral Nelson on the mismanagement of the Forest of Dean, concerned for naval timber giving the incentive, in which he recommended the planting of oak for investment. At that time, a surveyor-general with an insufficient force was in charge of the Crown Forests. In 1809, the management was placed under a board of three commissioners, one of whom, being a member of the Parliament, was to be changed with the administration. Under this management, graft became so rampant that, in 1848, a committee of the House of Commons was appointed, whose report revealed the most astonishing rottenness, placing a stigma on government management such as we still uncover in the United States from time to time. A reorganization took place in 1851. At that time, the Royal Forests and Parks, reduced in extent to about 200,000 acres, showed a deficiency of $125,000, mostly, to be sure, occasioned by the parks. There was then still a tribute of some 600 bucks to be delivered to various personages, as was the ancient usage. At present, there are some 115,000 acres classed as Royal Forest, but only 67,000 acres are really forest consisting of more or less mismanaged woods under the administration, not forest management, of the commissioners of woods and forests with deputy surveyors in charge of the ranges. Although there are a few notable exceptions in the management, it is to be noted that the same stupid ignorance which introduced the clause into the Constitution of the State of New York was enacted into law in 1877 by the English Parliament, forbidding in the new forest all cutting and planting. In 1900, there existed just one planting plan, made by the professional forester, namely for a portion of the Forest of Dean, while now only two other state properties, or two or three private estates, are managed under working plans. In 1887, a committee appointed to inquire into the administration of this property expressed itself most dissatisfied. But a committee of Parliament in 1890 whitewashed the administration and reported that the management was satisfactory. These committees, as well as an earlier one in 1885, were also able to recommend measures for the advancement of forestry. They laid in their recommendations the main stress upon education, but no action followed. And it can be said that the government has never done anything for the advancement of forestry in the home country, whatever it may have done for the dependencies. A departmental committee again reported in 1902 with all sorts of recommendations, which have remained unheeded. The interests of forestry as far as the government is concerned are at present committed to the Board of Agriculture, an unwieldy body created in 1889, from which this departmental committee was appointed. There is now, however, a strong movement on foot, led by foresters returned from India, to commit the government to some action with reference to the wastelands and towards providing for educational means. Another committee, appointed in 1908 to inquire into prospects of afforestation in Ireland, reported in favor of acquiring 300,000 acres of wood and 700,000 acres of unplanted land, dwelling especially on the benefit to be secured by providing employment and a check upon immigration of the rural population. Instead of acting upon this proposition, the government redirected the Royal Commission on Coast Erosion, which had issued its first report in 1907, 
to suspend its inquiry into the inroads of the sea and apply themselves to the inquiry as to whether in connection with unclaimed lands or otherwise it is desirable to make an experiment in afforestation as a means of increasing employment during periods of depression and how and by whom such experiments should be conducted in 1909 the royal commission on afforestation and coast erosion reported at length proposing the reforestation by a special commission of nine million acres of wasteland at a rate of 75,000 or 150,000 acres a year to be acquired by purchase, an elaborate plan which so far has remained without result. The government, although various committees have recommended it, has remained also callous in respect to educational policy, except that in 1904 the commissioners of woods and forests instituted a school, one instructor, and the Forest of Dean for the education of woodsmen and foremen. As illustrative of the government's peculiar attitude to forest policy in general, we may note a curious anachronism, namely the Act of 1894, which relieves railway companies from liability for damage from locomotive fires, if they can prove that they have exercised all care, although traction engines cannot offer this excuse. The first attempt to secure educational facilities dates to 1884, when a chair of forestry was established in the Royal Engineering College at Cooper's Hill, an institution designed to prepare for service in India purely. Through private subscriptions, another chair of forestry was instituted in 1887 at the University of Edinburgh and several agricultural colleges, noticeably that of Sirenchester, as well as the universities of Cambridge and Oxford, had made provisions for teaching the subject in a way, but outside of Cooper's Hill, no adequate education in forestry was obtainable in Great Britain until 1905. In 1905, the forest department in Cooper's Hill was transferred to Oxford, the three years course, one year to be spent in the forests of Germany or other countries, being as before designed mainly for aspirants to the Indian Forest Service. Now, besides Oxford, some nine other institutions offer courses in forestry, the reason for this educational development being difficult to imagine. The name of Sir William Schlich, a German forester and for some time the head of the Indian Forest Department now in charge of this school, is most prominently connected with the reform movement. Altogether, forest management and silvicultural practice are still nearly unknown in England, and until within a few years the useful idea of working plans had not yet penetrated the minds of owners of estates. This apathy is no doubt in part due to the fact that the government is in the hands of the nobility, who prefer to keep their shooting ranges, and do not see even a financial advantage from turning them into forest, as long as they can derive a rent of from ten to forty cents per acre for shooting privileges. Private endeavor has been active through the two arboricultural societies, the Royal Scotch, founded in 1854, and the Royal English, beginning its labors in 1880. The transactions of these societies in annual or occasional volumes represented the current magazine literature on forestry since the monthly Journal of Forestry and Estates Management, which began its career in London in 1877, transferred to Edinburgh in 1884, ceased to exist in 1885. At present, a very well-conducted quarterly journal of forestry, started in 1907 by the Royal English Arboricultural Society, replacing its transactions and that of the Irish Forestry Association, also the Journal of the Board of Agriculture, occasionally supply the needs of the continuously improving chances for development on forestry lines. Until within a short time, the English professional book literature has been extremely meager, although a considerable propagandist, arboricultural, and general magazine literature exists. Schlisch, Manual of Forestry, first in three volumes published from 1889 to 1895, now in its second to fourth edition, enlarged to five volumes is the most comprehensive publication. Another author deserving mention is John Nisbet, known for his Studies in Forestry, 1894, who also engrafted continental silvicultural notions into later editions of James Brown's The Forester, an encyclopedic work of merit. Several German and French works have been translated into English, notably K. Geyer, Die Forstbenutzung, R. Hess, Der Forstschutz, and here first, Waldschutz. 
John Crumby Brown's sixteen volumes on forests and forestry in various countries may be mentioned among the propagandist literature. The Arboricultural Societies mentioned also make a brave effort to advance professional development of forestry in their publications. End of section twenty three. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 24 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shashang Jakmola. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernhard Fernow. Great Britain and her colonies, India. While so neglected of her forest interests at home, Great Britain has developed in her possessions in the East Indies a far-seeing policy and, under the lead of German influence, has established there one of the largest, if not most efficient, forest departments in the world. Contrary to a frequently expressed idea that the conditions and problems of India are comparable to the conditions and problems of the United States, so that the example of Great Britain in India rather than that of any European country might serve us in the United States, the writer thinks that the very opposite is true. Not only are the natural conditions for the most part different, India being mainly tropical with an entirely different flora and different conditions of growth, but industrial, cultural, social and political conditions are also entirely different, all of which entails difference in methods of procedure. There are, to be sure, a few points of similarity the large size of country under one government and that in the hands of an English speaking race. The fact that the fire scourge, as with us, but from different reasons, is still the greatest problem. That there are arid regions and deserts, not over 10%, and irrigation problems and flood dangers to deal with. And finally, the long delay in establishing a definite forest policy. Although this policy was inaugurated over 40 years ago, India has not yet, and will, by the nature of things, not soon pass out of the first stage of development which we may confidently expect to pass through much more rapidly due to the conditions in which we resemble Europe more closely. The greater part of India, namely 62% of the 1,773,000 square miles, is under British administration and is peopled by a subject race of nearly 240 million without a voice in their government, which is carried on by a small handful of the conquerors. About 100,000 Englishmen are living in India, while the balance, around 700,000 square miles with 53 million people, is divided among a large number of more or less independent native states, very different in their civilization from ours. Industrially, the difference will appear from the statement that about 70% of the population is engaged in agricultural pursuits, hence there is no active wood market as with us, except for domestic purposes, and as the woods, like those of the most tropical forest, are mainly cabinet woods, even the export trade is insignificant, amounting to hardly $3 million, while minor forest products, lac, kutch, and gambia, myrobelin, and couchuch, etc., represent about $12 million. Climatically, as is to be expected, on such a large territory, great variation exists, which is increased by differences in altitude from the sea level to the tops of the Himalayas. The climate is, of course, largely tropical, with a rainfall which varies from the heaviest known of 600 inches to almost none at all. Nevertheless, in spite of these differences from our condition, much may be learned from Indian experience in the matter of organization, both to follow and to avoid, and the fact that this can be done without the need of a foreign language will be attractive to most Americans. The British, like other nations, gained a foothold in India for trading purposes during the 17th century. This they extended during the 18th century, especially after they had attained the ascendancy by Clive's subjection in 1757 of the great Mughal, one of the most powerful native princes. By conquest and amicable arrangement, the territory of British influence was gradually increased through the agency of the East India Company 
until, in 1858, the British government in India was formally established by royal proclamation and, in 1877, it was declared an empire. As stated, native princes still control, under British influence and restrictions, over one-third of the country, or a territory of nearly 700,000 square miles, divided into 13 feudatory states. The total area under direct British control and government is 1,087,000 square miles, of which 25%, which is 280,000 square miles, is probably forested and waste, some 232,000 square miles or nearly 150 million acres of which are so far declared government property. The British territory is divided into three presidencies, Madras, Bombay and Bengal and nine provinces, each with a separate government under a governor or commissioner, with a council and all subject to control by the resident governor-general or viceroy and his council, and he in turn is responsible to the secretary of state at home. There is, however, little centralization of government function, the provincial governments being to a large degree at least semi-autonomous like the states in the United States and considerable variation exists in the conduct of affairs. The difficulties in introducing something like a uniform for this policy were, indeed, not small, and much credit is due to the wisdom and tact of the three German foresters, who in succession filled the difficult position of head of the Imperial Forest Department and organized the service, Brandis, Schlich, and Ribbentrop. 1. Forest Conditions In the tropics, rainfall conditions more than any other factor determine forest conditions. The rains of India depend on extraordinary sea winds or monsoons, and the distribution is regulated by the topography of land and relative position of any district with regard to the mountains and the vapour-laden air currents. The successive rainfall characterises the coastline along the Arabian Sea to about latitude 20 degrees north, and still more along the coast of Lower Burma and to a lesser extent also the delta of the Ganges and the southern slopes of the Himalayas. A moderately humid climate, if gorged by annual rainfall, prevails over the plateau occupying the larger part of the peninsula and the Lower Ganges Valley, while a rainfall of less than 15 inches occurred over the arid regions of the Lower Indus. The rainfall so unevenly distributed territorially is, moreover, as unevenly distributed through the year. In most districts, the principal rains are experienced in summer, the rainy season being followed by a long dry season. But, on the eastern coast, the summer rains are slight, and the principal rainy season is delayed into October and November, while in northern India and the Himalayas, also winter rains occur, irregular and of short duration. Even where a relatively large rainfall prevails, the climate is dry on account of the high temperature, hence some 30 million acres of the cultivated acreage, which comprises 225 million acres in all, depend on irrigation over half of this irrigated area lying in the tropical zone. Roughly speaking, at least four climatic zones with many subtypes may be recognized. The truly tropic, intensely hot and wet, over 75-inch rainfall, prevailing on the plains and tablelands of the lower half of the peninsula, the hot and dry, below 15-inch rainfall, climate of the northwestern Indus Plain and Plateau, the moderately warm and dry to humid, 30-75-inch to 75 inch rainfall, climate of the Ganges Plain and Central Plateau, and the temperate to alpine humid climate of the Himalaya Mountain, with snow and ice in winter, and moderate heat in summer. In keeping with this great diversity of climate, both as to temperature and humidity, there is a great variation in the character and the development of the forest cover. At least six types can be recognized, namely the evergreen forest, found along the west coast, in Burma, Andaman Islands and the sub-Himalaya zone, which is composed of broad-leaved species with a dense undergrowth of small trees and tangled lianas, vines, but few shrubs as is characteristic of most tropical forest, the deciduous forest, mainly in the interior of central India, with sal, teak and ironwood as characteristic trees, the arid region forest, found in the Punjab, in Raipatana and in Sindh, of varying composition, from the open shrub forests of the latter province, composed of acacias, 
tamarisk and mesquite to the denser more diversified dry low tree forest of the former the alpine coniferous forest of the himalayas and of the mountains of afghanistan baluchistan and burma composed of pine deodar juniper with oak walnut boxwood approaching our own forest types in addition there may be segregated the coast forest of small extent composed of trees which like the mangrove will bear salt water the overflow forest along rivers and river forests in the desert regions of which latter large areas exist the natural differences in the forest cover are emphasized by the action of man who for many centuries has waged war against the forest clearing it permanently or temporarily for agriculture purposes or else merely burning it over to improve grazing facilities or for purposes of the chase statistics except of government properties are somewhat doubtful apparently the forested area of the whole of india comprises somewhat over 40% of the land area the government forests settled and unsettled represent at present about 24% of the area under british rule 149 million acres not over 20% being under cultivation leaving about 56% either natural desert waste or grazing lands the great forests of india are in burma extensive wood clothe the foot hills of the himalayas and are scattered in smaller bodies throughout the more humid portions of the country while the dry northwestern territories are practically treeless wastes large areas of densely settled districts are so completely void of forests that millions of people regularly burn cow dung as fuel while equally large districts are still impenetrable wild woods where for want of market it hardly pays to cut even the best of timbers the great mass of forests in india are stocked with hardwoods which in these tropical countries are largely evergreen or nearly so although the large areas of dry forest are deciduous by seasons only a small portion of the forest area is covered by conifers both pine and cedar these pine forests being generally restricted to higher altitudes in the himalayas the hardwoods most of which in india truly deserve this name belong to a great variety of plant families some of the most important being leguminosae verbenaceae dipterocarpae combretaceae rubiaceae ebenaceae euphorbiaceae myrtaceae and others and a relatively small portion represented by cupuliferae and other families familiar to us the most important valuable species are teak sal and deodar in the greater part of india the hardwood forest consists not of a few species as with us but is made up like most tropical forest of a great variety of trees unlike in their habit their growth and their product and if our hardwoods offer on this account considerable difficulties to profitable exploitation the case is far more complicated in india several thousand species entering into the composition in addition to the large variety of timber trees there is a multitude of shrubs twining and climbing plants and in many forest districts also a growth of giant grasses bamboos attaining a height of 30 to 120 feet which is ready to take possession of clearings these bamboos valuable as they are in many ways prevent often for years the growth of any seedling trees and thus form a serious obstacle to the regeneration of the valuable timber the growth of timber is generally quite rapid although to attain commercial size teak requires usually a rotation of 150 years but in spite of their rapid growth and the large areas now in forest capable of reforestation india is not likely at least within reasonable time to raise more timber than it needs in most parts of india the use of ordinary softwoods such as pine seems very restricted for only durable woods those resisting both fungi and insects of which the white ants are especially destructive can be employed in the more permanent structures and are therefore acceptable in all indian markets at present teak is the most important hardwood timber while the deodar a true cedar is the most extensively used conifer teak occurs in all moist regions of india except the himalayas grows usually mixed with other kinds single or in clumps is girdled two or three years before felling is generally logged in a primitive way commonly hewn in the woods and shipped usually floated as timber round or hewn and rarely sawn in size 
In 1905 to 1906, the cut in the state forest area was 240 million cubic feet timber, 25% and fuel, of which 20% was given to grantees or those holding rights of user free of charge and less than 2% was exported. In addition, over 200 million bamboos and nearly $2 million worth of byproducts such as lac, couch couch, couch, cambier, myrobalance were secured. 2. Property Conditions Prior to the British occupation, the native rulers or rajas laid claim to a certain proportion of the produce from all cultivators of the soil. They also reserved absolute right to the forests and to all unseated or wastelands, although usually the people were allowed to supply their needs from these. The English government, by right of conquest, fell ire to these rights as well as to the properties, but without care in asserting its rights, the unimpended use of unguarded forest property led to the assertion of rights of user by the people, and such were also sometimes granted by the government. Joint village communities in some parts that is, settlements which occupy contiguous areas, claimed and occupied large areas of forest and waste as commons, and, in general, the original property rights of the government became uncertain. The necessity of bringing order into this question led to various so-called settlements by which the rights were defined, properties delimited, and payment in kind changed into cash payments. After attempts to regulate these matters by local rulers, the first General Indian Forest Act, passed in 1865, modified by the Forest Act of 1878, laid down the basis upon which the rights of forest property were to be settled. These acts divide the forests into three classes, namely, those in which the right of the state is absolute, those in which the state has property rights, but which are burdened with prescriptive or granted rights of user and those which are private property, but on which the state reserves the right to cut certain kinds of tree for government use, teak, sandalwood and in some parts deodar, these being considered royal trees. The Forest Act being throughout applicable only at the choice and under the construction of the provincial governments, modified acts applicable to different parts of the empire and different in details were passed from time to time and many different local rules were issued by the provincial governments, but all agree in fixing one definite policy, namely declaration or demarcation of government forests after inquiry into all existing rights and division of the declared government forests into three classes classes, reserves, or permanent state forests, protected forests, and unclassed, the latter two still open to change in ownership and adjustment in rights of user, etc. The absolute and relative areas of government property, therefore, are continuously changing. In 1900, the reserve forests comprised 81,400 square miles or 8.6% of the total territory controlled by the British government, the protected forest 8,800 square miles and the demarcated but unclassified area 117,000 square miles. These figures had, in 1904, changed to 91,567 for permanent reserves, 58 million acres, 9,865 for protected, and 131,269 for unclassed, showing the rapid change now taking place in the status of classification. The name of B. H. Baden Powell, at one time conservator of the Punjab and acting inspector general of forests during 1872 to 1874, is closely connected with placing this forest legislation on a sound basis. The object of this legislation was mainly to settle the question of ownership and rights. Hence, reserved forests are not necessarily set aside for forest purposes like the forest reservations in the United States, although ultimately this will probably be their condition. Rights of users were under this legislation regulated or commuted. In some parts, even on the reserved forest areas, there are still retained rights to cut tongyas, i.e. 
to make partial clearings for temporary agricultural use under the restriction of not destroying teak trees over 18 inches in diameter and with the right of the cultivators to supply their domestic needs under obligation to cut out fire traces, burning the brush and instituting similar protective measures. The title to the forest property having been secured, its permanent demarcation and a survey of the same were the next steps, the first having gradually been nearly accomplished, the latter being still far in areas. The area of private and communal forests is not precisely known, but, including wasteland and lands of uncertain conditions, there are at least 500,000 square miles so owned, including those of feudatory rulers within the provinces. Of these, some 500 square miles or more of forest are leased to the government and under its control and in some cases forest administrators are instituted by the Rajas themselves. In the Act of 1878, there was a clause calling for protection of private forest property against trespass and encroachment, but this remained a dead letter. By later legislation, the government is entitled to exercise control over private forests and lands if it appears necessary for the public weal or if the treatment which such forests have received from their owners affect the public welfare or safety injuriously. But in such cases, the owner can require the government to expropriate the land in question. The Forest Act also provided that the government may assign to village communities from the reserve forest area so-called village forests and make rules for their protection, use and management. How far this policy has been applied does not appear. There are still areas the ownership of which is not settled and rights which are still in doubt, the work of the so-called forest settlements still going on, several thousand square miles being annually changed in status and several thousand dollars annually spent to quiet rights of user. 3. Development of Forest Policy Through the long history of India that preceded the arrival of the Mohammedans in the 10th to 12th centuries, it appears that the forest area was only slowly encroached upon by the Hindu civilization. Even when the invaders, nomads by habit, drove many of the native race into the jungle to eke out a precarious existence, owing to the remarkable recuperative powers of a tropical nature, the impression made was not permanent. Although much forest growth was then destroyed, cleared or mutilated, changes took place only slowly. It has been claimed that in consequence of the destruction which was incident to the nomadic life of the Mohammedans and the shifting agriculture of the aborigines, climatic changes were produced, but the proof for this assertion has remained questionable. When in the 18th century the British entered India in rivalry with the French and other European nations, it was, of course, only for purposes of exploitation and for a long time after the British had attained the ascendancy and had subjected most of the territory now ruled by them, not much concern was had about the forests. They furnished but small values, excepting in one particular, namely supplies of teak for naval purposes. In the beginning of the 19th century, the government became concerned regarding these supplies, which under the rough exploitation threatened to become exhausted. The first step towards securing some conservative management dates back to 1806, when Captain Watson was sent to India as conservator of forests to look after the interests of the East India Company in this direction. His inability to compromise with those who had secured timber privileges led to his removal and an abandonment of the office in 1823. Ineffective, sporadic efforts at administration by the provincial governments then followed. In 1839 to 1840, the government of the Bombay Presidency stopped the cutting of teak trees on government property. In 1834, M. Connolly, collector of Malabar in the Madras Presidency, began to plant teak on a large scale at Nilambur. In 1847, Dr. Gibson was appointed conservator of forests in Bombay. From 1848 to 1856, Lieutenant, now General, CSI, James Michael conducted the government timber operations in the Annamalaiti forests, Madras, and made the first recorded attempts to protect Indian forests from injury by annual jungle fires. 
In 1856, Dr. Hugh Cleghorn was appointed conservator of forests in Madras. He checked the destructive practices of temporary cultivation in the government forests of that presidency, a measure which at first was strongly opposed by the people, but his well-known desire to promote native interests inspired the rulers of the country with confidence and finally his measures were successful. Various attempts at some kind of regulation of the exploitation by lumbermen were also made by the general government after various examinations and reports, and in 1847, even a small and ineffective forest department was organized. The annexation of the province of Pegu in the Lower Burma in 1852 introduced a new complication and proved the turning point in forestry matters. In this province, the right to cut teak had been reserved by the native princes and hence became a right of the crown. But private lumbermen began to cut this timber and after an investigation and report, it was decided to take definite steps to regulate the use of these valuable teak forests at least. Lord Dalhousie, the then Governor General, upon the basis of the report of the Superintendent of Forests at Pegu, Dr. McClayland, in 1855 laid down in statements-like manner an outline of a permanent forest policy for the government and introduced the first professional advisor. In 1856, a German forester from Hesse, Dietrich Brandes, afterward Sir, was installed as superintendent of forests for Pegu with white powers under contract for 10 years, at a liberal salary and pension after retirement. The only possible check that could at first be applied was to force the lumbermen to make contracts, limit the diameter to which the exploitation was to be allowed, and mark the trees to be felled. This was done, naturally not without a large amount of friction. The result of this experiment in forest conservancy, as the English are pleased to call it, was so satisfactory that, in 1862, it was decided to organize a forest department for all India. Brandes was entrusted with the organization and, in 1864, he was appointed head of the new department under the Secretary of Public Works with the title of Inspector General, acting as advisor of the various provincial governments. The forests of India during the next 20 years, during which Brandes held office, were, province by province, brought under the resume of the Imperial Forest Department, although the provincial governments retained full and independent administrative powers. The first problem was to settle ownership conditions, which was done in the manner described before by the Act of 1865 and by later Acts. The discontent which was created by this Act came very near wrecking the whole enterprise, and much difference of opinion between the local and general governments existed, the government of Madras going so far as to declare the impossibility of establishing state property in view of the acknowledged rights of the villagers over waste lands. The general policy, however, finally prevailed, and an increasingly harmonious cooperation of the provincial governments has allowed the development of an efficient forest service. Various provincial legislation was considered, passed and repeated until in 1878, the Indian Forest Act 7 settled the policy at least for the majority of the provinces, Madras and Burma and some minor districts still declining to extend its provisions to their forests. The Burma government enacted, however, similar legislation in 1881 and the Madras government in 1882 and much later the other outstanding governments followed. 1886 to 1891, so that, while the detail of application varies not inconsiderably, the general policy regarding forest property of the state is the same throughout the empire. Whatever of uniformity exists had to be secured mainly by persuasive means. The Forest Acts, as stated on a previous page, contains certain provisions regarding formation of village forests and control of private forest property, but no interference with private forest property has been attempted, although in some parts this is more important and larger than the state holdings. Most of the owners merely exploit their property, but some of the larger, more enlightened native princes have established forest administrations, imitating the example of the imperial government. Those of Mysore and Kashmir and Hyderabad have placed this administration under an imperial forest officer for logged for this purpose and derived handsome revenues. The Kashmir forests of about 2,500 square miles yielding around $180,000, those of Mysore near 2,000 square miles over $330,000, this largely derived from sales of sandalwood, 
those of the Nizam of Hyderabad, with 5200 square miles in reserves and 4400 in protective forests, deriving a revenue of $75,000, seven times the what it was 10 years before. 4. Forest Organization and Administration The condition of affairs in the Forest Department can briefly be summarized as follows for the year 1909. Total area under government control, 241,774 square miles, namely, reserved, 94,561, protected, 8,835, unclassed, 138,378. Officials, in 1905, higher grades, 312, lower grades, 1,663, guards, 8,533. The controlling staff was, in 1909, increased by 34. A number in all other grades increased. Rounded off expenditure. $4,500,000 revenues. $8,225,000 net proceeds. $3,675,000, 45% of gross. Variation in the value of the rupee makes comparison with earlier years uncertain. In spite of the many difficulties, a poor market, no market at all for a large number of herds, wild, unsurveyed and practically unknown woodlands, requiring unusual and costly methods of organization and protection, the forestry department has succeeded, without curtailing the timber output of India, in so regulating forest exploitation as to ensure not only a permanence in the output, but also to improve the woodlands by favoring the valuable species. It has prepared for an increase of output for the future and at the same time has yielded the government a steadily growing revenue, which bids fair to rank before long among the important sources of income. In 1865, the net revenue was only $360,000. It had about doubled by 1875 and more than tripled by 1885 and since then has more than quadrupled. While in the period of 1870 to 1874, the expense of the administration was still 70% of the gross income, it has gradually been reduced to near 45%, while the outrun in material has in the last five years increased by 35% over the preceding quinquennium. At first, the department and its operations as well as its finances were imperial, the local governments having no control over its officers or over the revenue derived, but in 1882 decentralization was affected, the local governments obtaining a direct interest in the revenues. As a result, the financial interest overruled the conservative policy and overcutting was the consequence. In 1884, the general government recognized the need of a change. After some struggle, the imperial department was placed at least in charge of preparing the working plans and pressure for their execution if not direct enforcement can be brought through appeal to the general government by the inspector general which, however, has never been necessary to use. The organization of the forest service passed through various stages and arrangement in the different provinces is even now not quite uniform. The forest service then is peculiarly organized as regards division of responsibilities and relationships between the imperial and the provincial governments, the autonomy of the latter being geniusly guarded. It is divided into the imperial and the provincial service, the former consisting of the higher grade officials entirely recruited from England, the latter, the executive service, being in administrative functions independent of the former. An inspector general, directly under the Secretary of Revenue and Agriculture, for some time under the Home Department, is the head of the service and acts as professional advisor both of the imperial and the provincial governments. But this head of the service is shorn of most of executive functions, all administrative matters being reserved to the provincial authorities. The inspector general has charge only of the forest school administration, of forest surveys, and of the making of working plans which later, after approval by the provincial government, are in their execution inspected and critically supervised by him but without power to enforce them or to give direction directly to the conservators in charge, at least in Madras and Burma. He also watches over and reports on the progress of all forestry matters in the empire.
peculiarities and great variety are also found in other official relations and in the appointing power, the general and provincial governments exercising certain rights in this respect. The controlling staff, 57 officers in 1869, now about 300, under the Inspector General, consists of conservators, deputy conservators and assistant conservators. The conservators, now some 20, so far as they are not directly acting as assistants in the Inspector General's office, are the heads of the provincial departments and conservatorships and, in that capacity, directly subordinate to the local government, which in Madras and Bombay also has their appointment. Each is in charge either of the entire forest business of the province or of a circle forming part of a province and the administration unit in India. These are, therefore, the most influential and most responsible agents in introducing forestry practices. Conservatorships are divided into divisions, each in charge of a divisional forest officer, a member of either the imperial or the provincial controlling staff. But these have to acknowledge subordination to the chief civil officer, the collector of the district in which they are located, in order to harmonize the financial and forestal interests. About 80% of the controlling staff in the Imperial Service are appointed by the Secretary of State from graduates formerly from the Forest School at Cooper's Hill College, now Oxford, the remaining 20% from Englishmen in the Provincial Service, the member of which have passed through the Dehradun Forest School and through the lower branches of the service. In addition to the superior staff, a subordinate staff of extra deputy conservators and extra assistant conservators form the provincial service, which is mainly recruited from the natives. The districts are divided into ranges, for which an executive service is organized of rangers, over 400, who are now selected from graduates of the forest school in Dehradun. Deputy rangers and foresters, a lower grade, some 1,700, and guards, having their separate beats, over 8,500, form the protective service, mostly or all recruited from the better class of natives. 5. Forest Treatment With the irregular distribution of forests, the peculiarities of Indian government affairs and population, and the wild and difficult forest conditions themselves, it is but natural that the work thus far has been chiefly one of organization, survey and protection. In the protection against unlawful felling or timber stealing and grazing, the government of India has shown itself fully equal to the occasion by a liberal policy of supplying villages in proximity of the forests with fuel, building materials, pasture, etc. at reduced prices or gratis. Over $1,500,000 worth is thus disposed of annually, the incentive to timber stealing being thereby materially reduced. A reasonable and just permit system for grazing, where again the needs of the neighbouring villages are most carefully considered, not only brings the government a yearly revenue of over $800,000, but enables the people to pasture about 14 million head of animals in the state forests without doing any material damage to tree growth. 31% of the total forest area is open to grazing. The work of preventing and fighting fires can, with the means available, not be carried on over the entire forest area, of which large tracts are not even crossed by a footpath, and in a land where the regular firing of the words has become the custom of centuries, and where, in addition, intensely hot and dry weather, together with a most luxuriant growth of giant grasses, render these jungle fires practically unmanageable. Each year, however, additional territory is brought under protection. In 1902, nearly 37,000 square miles, or nearly 40% of the area in reserve, but only 12% of the total government forest area, were under protection at a cost of $4 per square mile, or less than 1% per acre, half of what it was 10 years before and over 2% of the gross revenue. Nearly 5,000 fires occurred, to be sure, which burnt over 3 million acres, that is to say over 90% of the area the protection was effective. For nearly half the fires, the cause remains unknown. Danger from fire has, however, become less in protected areas because of the changes in herbage and moisture conditions. 
yet it costs still about 2% of the gross revenue to protect the area and the figures just cited shows that this expenditure is only partially effective. In 1909, the protected area has increased to 43,000 square miles, the cost to $5, the efficiency to 94%. The first successful attempt to deal with forest fires were made in 1864 by Major, later Colonel, G. F. Pearson, who was then Conservator of Forests in the Central Provinces and who devised a system of clearing fire lines or fire traces surrounding the areas to be protected which were cut and burnt over early in the season, a system now in vogue in all India. In the jungle forests, the traces must be brought. The grass often taller than an elephant must be cut and burned before the grass on either side of the fire lane is dry enough to burn. This protection forms the most important duty of the forest officials, a trying one as it has to be carried on during the hot season. A separate branch of the forest service carried on the work of surveying and mapping the forest area instead of the regular survey of India, with the result of cheapening the cost. Some 74,000 square miles had been mapped on the scale of 4 inch to the mile, the standard, some smaller areas on smaller scale at the rate of $25 per square mile. In 1908, however, this work was handed over to the survey. Silviculture Silviculture practices are naturally but little developed. Protection against fire, grazing, overcutting has been the first requisite. The unregulated selection system with a diameter limit, which Brandis introduced, still prevails mostly, although beginnings of a compartment and group system in converting miscarried selection forest of deodar, pine and sal have been made, or rather of an improved selection method which seeks to secure reproduction in groups. Clear-cutting with seed trees held over is practiced in the coniferous mountain forest. Coppice and coppice, with standards, reserves of sprouts, is a natural condition over large areas, especially with teak and sal. Even improvements cuttings or sowing on barren hillsides with remarkable success are not absent. The attempts at securing reproduction, especially in the truly tropic forests, have often miscarried, inferior species filling the openings. Girdling of inferior species to favour the better classes has hardly had the desired result. In the deciduous forest, the same difficulty of undesirable aftergrowth is experienced, deteriorating the composition, except in the case of the gregarious salt tree, Shoria robusta, the treatment of which for reproduction has, after many failures, been well established. Other gregarious species can also be satisfactorily reproduced. The culled and burned over forests, of which there are many, are rehabilitated in a manner by merely removing the old overmature and defective timber with comparative success. In some parts, the larger gregarious bamboos are a serious obstacle to reproduction. Here, the only chance for reproduction exists when they flower and die. Killing the bamboos by cutting the annual shoots proved a failure, but burning over the whole area and sowing seems to be followed by success. In other parts, as in the large teak forests of Burma, as well as of other provinces, the useless kinds of trees are girdled, huge climbers are cut off, and a steady ward is which against all species detrimental to teak regeneration with satisfactory results. With teak, even planting on a larger scale is resorted to, especially by means of tongyas, that is, plantations, where the native is allowed to burn down a piece of woods, use it for a few years as field, though it is never really cleared, on condition of planting it with teak, being paid a certain sum for every hundred trees found in a thrifty condition at the time of giving up his land. Similarly, the department has expanded large sums in attempting to establish forests in part of the arid region of Baluchistan and, on the whole, during 1894 to 1895, about $150,000 were expended on cultural operations, which up to that time involved about 76,000 acres of regular plantation and 36,000 acres tongas, mostly teak.
making a total of 112,000 acres, besides numerous large areas where the work consisted merely in aiding natural reproduction. But in 1909, the plantation seemed to have been reduced to 59,000 acres. Probably through failures, the Tongas, however, increased to 84,000 acres and the budget for plantings and other cultural measures formed a little over 2% of the gross revenues. We see then that though the forests of India are now and will continue for some time to be little more than wild woods with some protection and a reasonable system of exploitation in place of a mere robbing or culling system, yet the work of actual improvement steadily increases in amount and perfection. In disposing of its timber, the government of India employs various methods. In some of the forest districts, the people pay merely a small tax and get out of the woods, what and as much as they need. In other cases, the logger pays for what he removes, the amount he fells being neither limited in quantity nor quality. The prevalent systems, however, are the permit system. When a permit is issued indicating the amount to be cut and the price to be paid for the same and the contract system, when the work is more or less under the control of government offices and the material remains government property until paid for. To a limited extent, the governments carry on their own timber exploitation. Working plans. Only a relatively small part of the total forest area, each year, however increasing, is as yet worked under plans. In 1885, only 109 square miles, in 1899, 20,000 square miles, and in 1903, nearly 30,000 square miles, about 13% of the total or 30% of the reserved area were operated under working plans and each year, about 4,000 square miles are added, so that now, 1909, over half the reserved area is under working plans. Only gradually was the character of these plans brought into practical form, and their execution, in spirit at least, enforced, the conservators having the right to deviate from the plans. A map prepared by the survey branch naturally forms the basis of the plan, the form of the plan is prescribed by the provincial regulations and the preparation is also carried on by the provincial service under advice and supervision of the imperial department. The strip valuation survey which Brandes introduced covering sometimes as much as 30% of the area is employed in determining number of trees and sizes, growing stock and cut modelled after the European practice except that little, perhaps too little, money is spent on their elaboration, especially on determining the proper amount of cut. That the cut is controlled at all is the most important result. 6. Education and Literature In 1866, Sir Dietrich Brandes selected as assistants to young men who had been trained in the forest schools of Germany, in turn his successors, and at the same time arrangements were made for the training of young Englishmen in the forest schools of France and Germany. At the end of 1875, the professional education was entirely transferred to Nancy. The present force of conservators is composed largely of these men. For some reason, the training of men in Germany and France became unpopular and this objection finally led, in 1884, to the establishment of a chair of forestry at Cooper's Hill College for engineering in England. At first, the course of study extended over 26 months, during 22 of which the candidates prosecuted their studies at the college, the remaining four months being spent under suitable supervision in selected British and continental forests. In 1905, this department was transferred to Oxford University and the course extended to three years, one year to be spent in continental forests. At present, this time may, however, be reduced to two years and the vacations in continental forests. This is a government affair and probationers receive stipends from the government. Mr. Brandes, as early as 1869, saw also the necessity of providing the means of giving the natives of India some sort of technical education in forestry. The first step in this direction was to place natives, selected ones, under one or two officers of the imperial service who were deemed fit to instruct them, and in this way a few good men were turned out. 
another experiment after the German pattern was made by apprenticing likely young men under some forester for a year or two and then sending them to an engineering school for theoretical instruction. This was also a failure. After much hard work, the Indian Forest School at Dehradun was established in 1878. The forests between the Jumna and the Ganges River were set aside at training grounds, formed into a special forest circle and placed under the control of the director of the school. These forests have been subjected to regular systems of management based on European experience and excellent results have been obtained. The first course of systematic theoretical instruction was opened on the 1st of July, 1881. In 1884, the school was made an imperial institution by the Government of India, and the Inspector General of Forests was charged with its supervision under a board of control consisting of the Inspector General, the Director and the three conservators, with the Assistant Inspector General as Secretary. This board meets once a year at Dehra conducts the examination and looks into all of the workings of the school very carefully. There were two courses, one in which the teaching was given in English for Rangers, the other in which the instruction was given in the vernacular for foresters, courses extending over 24 months. In 1906, the school was raised to the rank of a college and the course in the vernacular abolished. The graduates may aspire to the rank of division officers. The training of low-grade officers is left to the provinces. The Bombay Presidency had for some time their own forest school in connection with the engineering college at Pune, but this is now abandoned. Another school, however, is located at Tharavaddi, with a two-year course in Burmese and one in Madras with a one-year course, so that the education of lower-grade officials is well attended to. Forest experiment and investigations have never been systematically instituted, being left to individual initiative, but lately, 1909, provision has been made in this direction in connection with the Dehradun School by the establishment of an imperial research institute. Besides the monthly journal, the Indian Forester which came into existence in 1875 through Schlecht's initiative and the annual reports of the various conservators and of the Inspector General, a small book literature has developed within the last 10 or 15 years. Descriptive volumes of notes are J. S. Gamble's Manual of Indian Timbers, New Edition, 1902, Trees, Shrubs and Woody Climbers of Bombay Presidency by W. A. Talbot, 1902, Ribbentrop's Forestry in British India, 1900, and the earlier publication of H. R. Morgan, Forestry in Southern India, Brandes's Indian Forestry and Distribution of Forests in India, of professional interests are E. E. Fernandez's Manual of Indian Silviculture, unfortunately out of print, the same author's Forest Industries, DRC's Manual of Forest Working Plans, C. C. Rogers' Manual of Forest Engineering in India, and B. H. Baden-Powell, Forest Law. The influence of the development of the Indian Forest Service on the forest policy of other British colonies and of the home country has been considerable and is growing, Indian forest officers being detailed to assist in developing forest policies in these other parts of the British Empire. End of section 24. Section 25 of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernauer. Section 25. Canada. The largest single colony of Great Britain, and the most important as regards forest supplies, both as to quantity and character, Canada has been for a long time supplying the mother country with a large proportion of her imports. Although in size larger than the United States, its land area being estimated at over 3,600,000 square miles, Canada has so far attained only one-fifteenth of the population of her neighbor, namely less than seven million, 
although now rapidly growing. Much of her territory is still unknown, and will remain for a long time unavailable for civilization, owing to its inhospitable climate. Indeed, as yet not one-third of its territory may be considered opened up to civilization, and not much more than 100,000 square miles can be said to be occupied, one-half improved in farms, and two-thirds of this in crops. Much of the northern country remains unorganized, and the vast Northwest Territory, 2,656,000 square miles, between Hudson's Bay and the Rocky Mountains, as well as Labrador, are for the most part uninhabited, except by Indians and a few military and trading posts. The central interior region, dotted with lakes and intricate river systems, is a continuation of the forestless arid and sub-arid plains and prairies of the country west of the Mississippi River, toward the north changing by steps into lowlands, studded with open tree growth, and barren tundra frozen all the year, a million square miles answering to this last description. The Pacific Slope is a rough and lofty mountain country, the extension of the Rockies and coast ranges, with a variable, in part humid and temperate, in part dry and rigorous climate, more or less heavily wooded, about 600,000 square miles, with the Fraser River in the south forming the most important drainage basin. The Atlantic portion, south of the plateau-like, bare or scantily wooded Hudson Bay and Labrador country, with a climate somewhat similar to northeastern Germany, is formed by the slopes of the watersheds of the Great Lakes and their mighty outlet, the St. Lawrence River, and its gulf, the slopes rising gradually northward to the low range of the height of the land, a plateau with low hills, not over 1,500 feet elevation, which cuts it off from the northern country and forms the limit of commercial forest. This region, the bulk of square miles, with 93,000 square miles in the maritime provinces, around 250 million acres in all, represents, outside of British Columbia, the true forest region of Canada, and at the same time, the center of Canadian civilization. Although the Cabot brothers discovered Cape Breton and Labrador in 1497 and 1500, the first settlement of Canadian territory was not made until 1541 by French colonists, after the first Captain General of Canada, Jacques Cartier, the discoverer and explorer of the St. Lawrence in 1534, had taken possession of the country for Francis I. But not much progress in colonizing was made until Champlain's arrival in the first years of the next century. Quebec was founded as early as 1608, and Montreal in 1611, but Ottawa dates its first beginnings not farther back than 1800. The northern country around Hudson's Bay was, under the name of Rupert's Land, after Prince Rupert, the head of the enterprise, undefined in limits, granted by Charles II in 1670 to the Hudson's Bay Company, a powerful fur-trading corporation which had not only a commercial monopoly, but except for occasional interference by the French, held absolute governmental sway over the country through 200 years, its jurisdiction at one time extending to the Pacific coast. Friction and warfare with the English resulted in the latter acquiring by the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, Newfoundland, and settling their rights on Hudson's Bay. The final conquest of New France by the English ended French rule in 1763. But the French colonists remained peacefully, and their descendants formed today, at least in Quebec, the predominating influence. Indeed, in 1774, by the so-called Quebec Act, the first permanent system of self-government was established much on the lines of the French feudal system, and the French civil law was retained. At first, under English rule, the territory, then including the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, formed one colony. But after the War of the Revolution in 1791, the territory remaining English was divided into two separately governed provinces, Upper and Lower, or West and East Canada. They were reunited in 1840 and continued so until 1867, 
when the so-called Union or British North America Act effected the present organization of the Dominion of Canada, a federal union comprising only the provinces of Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. After various combinations and subdivisions, all of the British possessions in North America, except Newfoundland and its dependencies in Labrador, came into the Union, and in 1882 the Union was completed with the then seven provinces, those mentioned with Prince Edward Island, Manitoba, and British Columbia, and all the organized and unorganized territory. In the same year, four territories, Isonobia, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Athabasca, in 1895, the territory of Ungava in Labrador, and in 1898, that of Yukon were organized. With a view of their eventual elevation into provinces, the relations of the Federation being quite similar to that of the states and territories in the United States. In 1905, the Western Territories were organized into two provinces, Saskatchewan and Alberta. The government, although practically much like a republic and largely independent of the home country, is theoretically a limited monarchy, the king being represented by a governor-general, appointed by the king, and a privy council selected by the governor. The latter also appoints, now 81, senators for life to form the upper house of the parliament or legislative body, while the lower house of commons is elected by the people. Besides this imperial government, each province has its own separate government with a lieutenant governor, appointed by the governor-general, and an elected legislature this autonomy being somewhat similar to that of the states of the United States, and the division of functions between federal and provincial governments being also similar. Although the home government retains the veto power, the supreme jurisdiction and various other powers, although apparently by the appointment of officials, its influence is guarded. Practically, the party management as exercised in Great Britain prevails, and independence from imperial influence and from home government is continually increasing. In regard to the crown lands, including forests, this division as well as this relationship becomes important. Each provincial government, except those of the three middle provinces, administers the crown lands within its boundaries in its own way, yet on similar lines, while the Dominion government controls only the lands located outside of the provinces together with those of the Middle Provinces and the so-called Railway Belt in British Columbia. These latter lands were mostly acquired by purchase from the Hudson's Bay Company, the company relinquishing its territorial rights in 1868, and the transfer being completed in 1870, upon payment of £300,000. 1. Forest Conditions the forest area has at various times and by various authorities been roughly estimated as between one and a quarter of over one and three-quarter million square miles, which would make the forest percent at least over 32. But this includes the open woodlands of the Northern Territory and of the prairies, which, while of great importance to the local settlers, are for the most part probably or surely not of commercial value. Commercially valuable forests, actually or prospectively, are found almost only in British Columbia and in the old provinces, the two forest regions separated, just as in the United States, by a forestless region, except that north of the prairie region a continuous belt of open woodland extends to near the mouth of the Mackenzie River. A careful examination of the sources of information has led the writer to the conclusion that less than 350,000 square miles, or around 200 million acres, would cover fully the commercially valuable forest land, although the wooded area of the provinces in which the commercial timber occurs is stated officially as around 450 million acres, two-fifths of which is to be found in British Columbia. Indeed, although we are accustomed to look upon Canada as a great forest country, it really possesses about 60% less commercial forest than the United States, and about one quarter of the mature timber of that country. It will be understood that all such statistics are merely rough estimates, the data being slim and eked out by conjectures based on geographical conditions which predicate the character of the country. 
most unreasonable speculations and calculations as to the amount of timber standing and value have been made on impossible assumptions. As an instance, one statistician by mere mathematical figuring, namely deducting the known crop and pasture area from the total land area, would make the forest area of Quebec alone over 209 million acres. This includes the country north of the height of land of 163 million acres, which by another mathematical calculation is made to be able to furnish over 65 billion feet of lumber besides over 600 million cords of pulpwood and 370 million railroad ties. But under present conditions, owing to topography and character of the timber, it cannot be utilized and its commercial value is altogether problematic. This calculation would leave as really or potentially available forest land south of the height of land 46 million acres in addition to over 5 million on farms. It is claimed that this forest area may still produce some 100 billion feet of coniferous and 1.5 billion feet of hardwoods, or 2,500 feet to the acre. The chief of the Provincial Forest Service lately made the forest area of the province 131 million acres, including 2 million acres of wasteland. While by the change of standards and by local needs, forest areas may become commercially valuable, which were not so considered before, and thereby the above figures may be eventually increased from the standpoint of valuable lumber supply for the world trade. The above-named area may be assumed to set the limit for the present. A computation based on slender information has placed the country with open woodlands in the central region as exceeding 280,000 square miles. The Director of Forestry estimated that 150,000 square miles of this area might contain nearly 200 billion feet merchantable lumber. The southeastern territory south of the height of land was originally all densely wooded. From it, a farm area of around 25 million acres has been cut out, less than 7% of the land area included. Especially the southwestern half of Ontario, between the Great Lakes, which contains the most fertile land, is densely settled, as also the shores of the St. Lawrence. A large part of the remaining forest area is cut over and culled, especially for pine. The amount of white pine remaining, according to estimates made in 1895, would now be less than 20 billion feet. Extensive areas have been turned into semi-barrens by repeated fires. The statistician of the Dominion in his report made in that year comes to the conclusion that the first quality pine has nearly disappeared and that we are within measurable distance of time when the exception of spruce as to wood and of British Columbia as to provinces, Canada shall cease to be a wood exporting country. The composition in general is the same as that of the northern forest in the United States hardwoods, birch, maple, and elm prevailing, with conifers mixed, the latter especially spruce becoming occasionally pure. The nearly pure hardwood forest of the southern Ontario Peninsula has been almost entirely supplanted by farms, and here, even for domestic fuel, coal imported from the United States is largely substituted for wood. Although white pine, the most important staple, is found in all parts of this forest region, the best and largest supplies are now confined to the northern region north of Georgian Bay. Unopened spruce and fir land still abound, especially in Quebec on the Gaspé Peninsula and northward. Spruce forms also the largest share in the composition of the New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland forest the pine in the first two provinces having practically been cut out. Extensive, almost pure balsam fir forest, fit for pulpwood, still covers the plateau of Cape Breton, while Prince Edward Island is to the extent 60% cleared for agricultural use. Much of this eastern forest area is not only culled of its best timber, but burnt over and thereby deteriorated in its composition, the inferior balsam fir appearing in largest number in the reproduction. North of the height of land in Nungava and westward, spruce continues to timberline, 
but outside of narrow belts following the river valleys, only an open stand, branchy and stunted, hardly fit even for pulp, for the most part with birch and aspen intermixed. This open spruce forest, interspersed among muskegs, continues more or less to the northern tundra and across the continent to within a few miles of the mouth of the Mackenzie River and the Arctic Ocean, the white spruce being the most northern species. In the interior, northern prairie belt, groves of aspen, dense and well-developed, skirt the water courses and form an important wood supply. The forests of British Columbia partake of the character of the Pacific Forest of the United States, the coast range along the coast for about 200 miles being stocked with conifers of magnificent development. Douglas fir, giant arborvitae, hemlock, bull pine, and a few others. The Rocky Mountain range also of coniferous growth, pine, and larch, but of inferior character. Large areas being covered with alpine fir, Abus labiascarpa, and lodgepole pine, important as soil cover and for local use in the mining districts, but lacking in commercial value. If much of the forest area in the settled provinces is burnt over and damaged by forest fire, much more extensive destruction is wrought in this northern forest by fires sweeping annually over millions of acres unchecked, many of them said to be started by lightning. About 50% of this country is said to be fire-swept. Among the large notable forest fires, the Great Miramichi Fire in New Brunswick in 1825 destroyed more than 6,000 square miles in a few hours. In 1880, the loss by forest fires in the Ottawa Valley alone was still estimated at $5 million annually. In 1909, reports indicate over half a million acres burnt over in that year. The river systems of eastern Canada, with the mighty St. Lawrence permitting seagoing vessels to come up to Montreal, have been most potent factors in the development of the lumber industry and export trade, without the need of railroads. Yet, although, as a consequence, this trade was early developed to a relatively large figure, it has not grown at as a rapid rate as might have been expected, and today, with an export in excess of imports of less than $40 million, is considerably below that of the United States. The small export trade of earlier times, having been stimulated by exempting Canadian timber from paying duties in the home country, or at least allowing it a preferential tariff, had, by 1820, grown to 15 million cubic feet, all squared timber, and sent to England. In 1830, it had crept up to only 20 million cubic feet, but by 1850, it amounted to over 50 million cubic feet, two-fifths of which was sawed material, the 2,632 mills being reported by the census, 1851, as having cut 776 million feet BM. By 1867, when the Dominion was formed, the total export of forest products had advanced in value to 18 million, the next decade, with a climax year in 1873 of 26 million, saw an increase to $20 million in the average, the proportion of sawn material being nearly three times that of hewn wood, and the entire cut of Ontario going to the United States. At that time, it was computed that the waste of value in shipping square timber amounted for the province of Ontario alone still to over $350,000 annually. At present, sawed lumber, deals, boards, planks, etc., form 70% of the total export. In the last 20 years, a steady increase in exports at an average rate of about 3% per annum is noted, the total in 1903 culminating at nearly 41 million, but in the following year sinking to 36.7 million. In 1910, the total export amounted to 53 million, against which an import of nearly 16 million is to be offset, nearly double what it was three years before. Adding wood manufactures, the net export must be increased by some 36 million. The bulk of the export goes, of course, to the United States, but while exports of forest products thus increased absolutely, relatively to other exports, they have considerably declined, i.e. the lumber industry has not grown proportionately to other developments. 
For while, in 1868, forest products formed 34% of the total export, in 1904 they represented only about half that figure. The same conclusion, namely that the lumber business has not increased rapidly in the last 25 years, may be derived from the report of the decennial census. Well, for 1890, the total cut amounted to over 5 billion feet and its value to nearly 80 million. In 1900, the cut, or at least the census report, fell below 4 billion and its value to 53 million. In 1909, the total lumber cut was reported as 3.8 billion feet BM, and its value, 62.8 million. A measure of the depletion of the great staple white pine is found in the statement that from 1865 to 1893, the average size of pieces decreased by one quarter to one third, and that in 1863, over 23 million cubic feet were exported from Quebec as against 1.5 million feet in 1904. Well, the price had more than quadrupled in that period. Spruce has here taken the place of pine, and Ontario is now the main producer of pine. Yet in 1909, the white pine cut in amount almost equaled that of spruce, and in value exceeded it by 40%. Spruce, and especially pulpwood, forms an ever-increasing item in cut and export, export of pulpwood having increased sevenfold in the last decade to nearly two million, and of wood pulp to over four million. A notable economic improvement has taken place during the last 10 or 15 years in that the proportion of raw materials exported, especially logs and square timber, has decreased in favor of manufacturers. While originally the home country took the bulk of exports of forest products, the cut of Ontario has been always, duty or no duty, sent almost entirely to the United States. In the last six or eight years, the export to the United States has been doubled, amounting now to about half of the total export. And as the state's return of its own forest products, largely in the form of manufactures, to the extent of about $6 million worth, a balance of trade for the Canadian forest product of $12 million is left. 2. Ownership When the French took possession of the country, all the land belonged to the king, and could be held by others only under feudal tenure, i.e. as a gift under obligation of counter-service. The whole country was placed as a fief under the rule of the Hundred Associates, a company which also exercised a trading and colonizing monopoly, but made no success and was dissolved in 1663. It was then that Richelieu introduced the system of signarial tenure, the land being divided into portions of from 100 to 500 square miles, usually with a small amount of riverfront, and given outright to younger noblemen, favorites of the court, and clerics, who were, however, obligated to subgrant to colonists, thereby becoming so many immigration agents. These not only treated their colonists as tenants, exacting rent and service, but exercised nearly absolute jurisdiction within their domains, the colonists becoming virtually serfs or retainers of the seigneurs. This condition continued until 1854, when an adjustment of rights was formulated by the Seigneurial Tenures Act, and the government aided the habitants to secure their freedom by indemnifying the seigneurs, or else by paying rent, which was done mostly. Under English rule, the granting of lands, without, however, the seigneurial rights, was continued. In 1784, such grants were made along the St. Lawrence and the Bay of Quinte to veterans of the Loyalist Army, some 20,000, in lots of 200 acres for privates, up to 5,000 acres for field officers. In 1791, every seventh section was ordered to be set aside as clergy reserves for the support of the Protestant Church, a measure which created much friction and formed, especially in the Roman Catholic province of Quebec, a chief grievance in starting the Pepinier Rebellion of 1837. 
some 3,300,000 acres were gradually withdrawn for this purpose, and as far as possible leased to secure an income. Some of these lands were sold after 1827, and finally, in 1853, a statute was passed to sell the remainder and turn over the proceeds to municipalities for educational purposes and local improvement. Extensive grants and sales were made to lumbermen and speculators. In this manner, by the granting of 13,000 acres to an American, Philemon Wright, in 1800, the great lumber industry of Ottawa was started and in 1836 another american syndicate secured about a million acres of grants out of the fifty million acres granted in aid of railroad construction some portion must also have been in timber by all these methods as well as by small grants and sales to settlers a large area of uncertain extent has become private property in Nova Scotia, nearly the entire government domain has passed by grant and sale into private hands, some six million acres, one-half in small holdings. Of the lands remaining in the crown, at least two-thirds is on barrens. Similarly, in Prince Edward Island, the 800 square miles of woodland remaining are almost wholly owned privately, the 14,000 acres of state land being, like most of the private property, stripped of its value. In New Brunswick, over 1.6 million acres, mostly woodland, containing over 10 billion feet, was granted to the railway company, and another million acres or so is in other private possession, a liberal disposal of lands having been continued until 1883, when about seven and a quarter million acres of timber and wasteland remained to the crown. In Quebec, some six million acres are estimated as privately owned, mostly in woodlots on farms. In Ontario, the private woodland area of commercial character may be over five million acres. Besides the large grants, which were and still are probably to the greatest extent in timberlands, the farms in the various provinces, according to the census of 1901, have from 22 to 57 percent in woodlots, or altogether probably in the neighborhood of 30 million acres. The total area privately owned may then be placed at not to exceed, say, 40 million acres, and the largest part of the forest area is still crown lands. The government of the different provinces and the dominion government in the territory and in the middle provinces administering them and deriving the revenue therefrom. This condition has prevailed since 1837, when the home government gave up its claim to land and revenues. The provincial ownership extends over about 500,000 square miles. The Dominion government owns an area of 20,000 square miles in the railway belt of British Columbia, 20 miles on each side of the railway for 500 miles, which contains good timber, and some 722,000 square miles of land in the middle provinces, which contains practically only timber suitable for local use. 3. Administration of Timberlands In the development of ownership conditions, the realization of the valuable assets in timber growth had not been overlooked by the home government. Care of supplies for naval construction giving, as in the United States, the first incentive to a conservative forest policy. Even under the early French rule, the grants of land were made under reservation of the oak timber fit for naval use, as is evidenced from a land grant made in 1683. This reservation led to considerable friction as it hampered the colonists in making their clearings on the best lands. Later, the reservation was extended to include other timber needed for military purposes, and when the British occupation began, these established rights of the Crown were not only continued, but reservations of larger areas for the timber were ordered notably around and north of Lake Champlain. In 1763, and again in 1775, the home government ordered reservations to be set aside in every township. But the great timber wealth seemed so inexhaustible that the governors paid little attention to the wise instructions of the home government for the creation of reservations, and whatever regulations regarding the cutting of timber were made failed to be strictly enforced. 
In 1789, the policy of reserving to the crown all the timber as far as not granted and giving licenses to cut was inaugurated. But not until 1826 was even the revenue feature strongly enough realized to attempt systematically to secure the benefit of it, namely by allowing anyone to cut timber, such as was not required for the Navy, who would pay a fixed rate for what was cut, a surveyor general of woods and forests being appointed to collect the timber dues with the aid of qualified colors, 1811. There was even an attempt made to prevent waste by doubling the rate of timber dues on all trees cut which would not square more than eight inches. This restriction probably remained a dead letter for lack of supervision. Lumbermen, however, found it cheaper to buy the land, making only part payment, and after cutting the best timber, forfeiting the land. Contractors who had the monopoly for cutting the timber for the Royal Navy cut also for their own account. Corruption and graft pervaded the administration, which enriched its followers with the revenues obtained from the timber licenses and otherwise. The strong hand, which in the absence of a strong government, lumbermen were driven to use in order to protect themselves from piracy by their neighbors, or else to perpetrate such, brought about many bloody conflicts. The general maladministration of the so-called family compact, besides other grievances, caused the Revolution of 1837, which, although readily put down, led to the union of the provinces of Upper and Lower Canada in 1841, and to reform of the abuses. It was then that, after the new Governor-General Lord Durham's admirable report on the situation, the home government turned over the administration, in part at least, and revenues of the Crown lands to the several provincial governments, at that time in New Brunswick, where a thriving export trade had been early established, the dues on $2 million worth of production were involved, and in Quebec and Ontario the income amounted to between $200,000 and $300,000. But even then, the immediate revenue, and not any concern for its continuation, animated the administration of the public or crown forests. The freehand sales for nominal sums were changed into licenses to cut, and in order to secure larger returns, these were, by and by, put up at auction for competitive bids, the premium or bonus being paid for the limits, i.e. a limited territory on which the holder or licensee had the exclusive right to cut. In addition to the fixed dues or charges per unit for the timber actually cut, Later, to discourage the holding of timber limits for a rise of prices, an annual cut of first 1,000, then 500 feet per square mile of holdings was required. To still further accelerate the use of the licenses to cut, the Crown Timber Act of 1849 limited the license to one year and provided for an eventual limit in size of the grants. All these provisions forced to more rapid cutting and overproduction, and depression in the lumber market was the result, the supply in 1847 being 44 million feet to meet an export of 19 million. New rules were promulgated in 1851, introducing a ground rent system, a set price being paid per square mile of limit, and doubling the ground rent for unused limits each year. Needless to say, the impracticability of this geometric progression in ground rents became visible in a few years. The final present system in the disposal of timber limits, varying in detail, were gradually perfected in varying manner by the several provincial governments, but they agree in general principles, in that they grant limits for a certain time, some by the year, others by periods, usually 21 years, during which certain conditions as to establishment of mills and amount of manufacture without waste must be fulfilled, and a ground rent, a bonus, and timber dues for all timber cut are to be paid by the limit holder, details and prices varying and being changed from time to time. A diameter limit below which trees are not to be cut also mostly prevails. Lately, sales by the thousand feet BM have been inaugurated in Ontario, and sale by the mile is to be abandoned. 
As a rule, licenses become negotiable and can be transferred upon paying a small fee per square mile. The governments, reserving absolute rights to change conditions of this contract at any time, the interest of the licensee is to cut as fast as he can, other unsatisfactory conditions leading in the same direction. A Department of Crown Lands in the Dominion Government and in each province, in Nova Scotia, the Attorney General acting as head, administers the lands. Scalers or colors attend to the measuring of the cut. The revenue derived by this system by all the provinces amounts now to around $4.5 million per year. Ontario leading with about 20,000 square miles now under license, mostly pine, producing in 1910 $1,835,000. The yearly average for the decade ending 1910 was one and $1.75 million, and some $41 million have altogether accrued since 1867. Quebec, with over 70,000 square miles under license, mostly in spruce, producing only about $700,000, nearly $30 million having accrued during the 43 years, or at the rate of $418 per square mile, two-thirds of which from dues. Since land settlement is, as in the United States, obtainable by homestead and other entries, a good many fraudulent applications under guise of settlement have curtailed the revenue. Until now, closer scrutiny of the fitness of land for settlement is made. The retention of the lands by the government is naturally a feature which would permit and should have earlier induced conservative forestry methods, but the immediate revenue interest has had, and still has, a more potent influence than considerations of the future. 4. Development of Forest Policy the impetus to introduce conservative features seems to have largely come through the influence of the forestry movement in the United States, and although voices of prominent Canadians, like that of James and William Little and Sir Henry Joly de Lopiniere, have been heard before in advocacy of a more far-seeing policy, the meeting of the American Forestry Congress at Montreal in 1882 may be set as the date of the inception of this movement in Canada. The definite result of that meeting was the inauguration of forest fire legislation in the various provinces. In the province of Ontario, the Fire Act of 1878, which had until then remained a dead letter, was improved in 1885 by inaugurating a fire ranger system in which limit holders pay one half the cost of the rangers. The force of firefighters, 37 in the first year, was gradually increased until, in 1910, nearly 1,000 were employed at a cost of $300,000. In that year, a change was made, the whole service, including inspection, being charged against the limit holder. In New Brunswick, a fire law was passed in 1885, followed, in 1897, by the introduction of the Ontario Ranger System. In 1883, Nova Scotia passed a forest fire law, which, like that of New Brunswick, remained ineffective for lack of machinery. This was not provided until 1904, and since then has worked most satisfactorily. Recently, a forest survey of this province was made. Quebec also enacted fire legislation in 1883, but did not provide means to carry it into effect until 1889. Since at first only $5,000 annually was allowed for its execution, and by 1901 to 2, not more than $7,226 was expended for fire protection over an area of 40 million acres, its effectiveness may be doubted. But in 1905, a special forest protection branch, with a superintendent and a ranger system after the Ontario pattern, was organized and the service has become more effective. The need for more organized effort and advice led to the establishment of special bureaus of forestry. In Ontario, a clerk of forestry was established in the Department of Agriculture in 1883, and in 1895 he was replaced by a clerk in the Crown Lands Department, later named Director of Forestry, Mr. Thomas Southworth. This office later was changed to a Bureau of Forestry and Colonization, 
and a technically educated man was appointed as provincial forester with a view of developing a forest management at least in the reserves this movement however soon collapsed for lack of appreciation the office was transferred back to the department of agriculture which does not control any timberlands the forester resigned and the bureau was finally in 1907 restricted to the colonization work the forestry part being deliberately abandoned meanwhile the province of quebec pursued a more enlightened course to control the cut a colors office was established in 1842 which however only checked the square timber then the principal material in 1873 after various futile attempts to secure better supervision a corps of forest rangers was created but as they worked without organization the results were only partial until in 1889 they were placed under seven chiefs or superintendents in 1897 the number of superintendents were reduced to one but having to work with incompetent men political appointees this improvement in headship did not produce much result in 1907 a reorganization took place by introducing two professional foresters educated at government's expense at american colleges of forestry who upon their return were employed to supply the technical supervision of cutting unlicensed lands and otherwise to forward forestry reforms in 1910 the logical sequence occurred by placing the entire forest service except the protection against fire under one of these technical men as chief with the other one as his assistant and a corps of three civil engineers forty forest rangers and six scalers besides twenty student assistants the first organized provincial forest service in canada administered under the superintendent of woods and forests in the department of crown lands in 1898 the dominion government had also recognized the need of more technical administration by instituting a forestry branch in the department of the interior under a superintendent with a view of developing improved methods at first manned without technical advisers who were indeed not in existence gradually the professional element was introduced and the scope of the branch enlarged the irrigation interests of the country being added under the able guidance of the present director whose task under the political conditions surrounding is not an easy one this department may in a few years also become fully organized with technical men of whom there are now seventeen employed besides student assistants these various government agencies and other propaganda produced at least the important result of committing the governments to see the propriety of setting aside permanent forest reserves the first movement in this direction was made in 1893 and in 1895 the first dominion reservations were made by executive order through the minister of the interior these to be sure were located in the thinly timbered parts of the province of manitoba the turtle mountains and riding mountain mainly for the protection of water supply several other similar reserves were set aside by the minister but to give more stability to these reservations an act of parliament was passed in 1906 declaring their permanence and placing them 3,380,000 acres under the administration of the superintendent of forestry there are so far some 26 dominion forest reserves created or in the act of creation compromising an area of over 25,000 square miles the forestry branch is making a brave beginning to survey and manage these reserves under forestry principles of the provinces ontario was the first to recognize the principle of reservations in 1893 when a partially cut over partially licensed territory of over one million acres was set aside as the algonquin national park in the Nipissing district but the first definite establishment of a forest reserve policy dates from the forest reserve act passed in 1898 which authorizes the executive as in the united states to withdraw lands for reserves some eight reserves and two parks have so far been established and the reserved area amounts to around twenty thousand square miles
of management on forestry lines on these reserves there is far little to be heard except an effort to keep fires out quebec has followed this example of ontario first by setting aside the laurentides park in the saguenay region one million six hundred and thirty four thousand acres which like algonquin park was more in the nature of a game preserve during 1906 and 7, however, under a law authorizing the lieutenant governor to set aside forest reserves, over 100 million acres were placed in reserve. Apparently, however, no administration of this preserve in the forestry sense is as yet attempted. British Columbia, which until lately was only concerned in disposing of the well-timbered crown lands after having disposed of the best parts, has placed under reservation the balance, and a forest commission of inquiry has been constituted to devise further measures in the interest of forestry. Its report, appearing in 1911, gives a very clear statement of conditions in the province and the promise of active organization of a better service. Of other attempts to foster forestry interest may be mentioned a law in Quebec, passed in 1882, providing a bonus of $12 per acre for tree planting, which seems to have remained without effect. Another providing for a diameter limit of 12 inches on the stump for pine and 9 inches for other kinds, these dimensions are now varied, inaugurated in 1888, may have preserved some young growth on the limits, although since pulpwood is now the main product and supervision has been inefficient, not much may be expected from such laws. Indeed, the chief of the Forest Service reports that 60% of the regeneration is of the inferior balsam fir. In Ontario, a very competent commission was created in 1897, with a noted lumberman, Mr. Bertram, as president, to formulate methods of reform, but the able report remained barren of results. The Dominion has been active in encouraging the Dominion has been active in encouraging tree planting in the prairies. The Agricultural Experiment Station at Ottawa not only set out object lessons by planting some 20 acres of sample plots, but for a number of years distributed plant material to settlers. This work was later taken over by the forestry branch and increased to a larger scale, some 85 acres being in nursery and the distribution having grown to 15 million seedlings in 1910. Ontario, under the direction of its Department of Agriculture and in cooperation with the Agricultural College at Guelph, has lately embarked in two movements of amelioration, namely establishing a state nursery from which plant material at cost, with advice as to its use, is given to farmers, and purchasing and reforesting wastelands in the agricultural section. Tariff legislation is another means which is in the hands of the Dominion government to be used for encouraging forest conservancy. It has, however, so far not been used directly for such purpose, fiscal and commercial policies being uppermost. But the provinces have in this respect helped themselves by encouraging manufacture rather than export of raw materials. Ontario, leading in this matter by prohibiting export of unmanufactured logs from Crownlands in 1898. Other provinces impose an export duty on pulpwood, cut on Crownlands, as does also Ontario. At present writing, a reciprocity agreement with the United States is under contemplation, which would admit wood products from Canada free of duty an arrangement which, whatever its commercial advantages, bodes no good for conservative forest policy. Meanwhile, private limit holders here and there had begun to see the need of conservative methods, and by 1908 at least two large paper and pulp concerns had placed foresters in charge of their logging operations. 5. Education Until 1900, associated effort to advance forestry in Canada had relied on the International American Forestry Association. In that year, largely through the officials of the Dominion Forestry Branch, Mr. E. Stewart, the Canadian Forestry Association was formed. This association has grown more and more vigorous, and having escaped the period of sentimentalism which in the United States retarded the movement so long, 
could at once accentuate the economic point of view and bring the lumbermen into sympathy with their effort. In 1905, a quarterly magazine, the Canadian Forestry Journal, was started by the association, making its work of instruction and propaganda more effective. The technical literature, as yet slightly developed, is found mainly in bulletins of the forestry branch. A most promising convention held in January 1906, with the Premier of the Dominion presiding, participated by prominent officials and businessmen, seemed to foreshadow the time when a real rational forest management, at least in some parts of the Dominion, would be inaugurated. But it can hardly be said that the expectations were realized, and another such convention was held in 1911, which may perhaps be followed by better results. In 1909, following the precedent of the United States, a conservation commission was appointed for the Dominion under federal support, manned by the leading officials and prominent representative men from all provinces, and here the forestry interests may find at least educational advancement. The first two years of the existence of this commission have, however, produced little advancement. While the Ontario government had directly discredited the forestry movement by abolishing its Bureau of Forestry, indirectly it laid the foundation for a sure future, in 1907, by establishing in its provincial university at Toronto a faculty of forestry, with full equipment. A year later, the province of New Brunswick also established a chair of forestry in its university, while well, sometime earlier the Guelph Agricultural College had introduced the subject of farm forestry in its curricula. The latest development in educational direction is the Forest School organized in 1910 by the Government of Quebec in connection with its forest service for the purpose of educating its own agents. End of Section 25 Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio InterfaceAudio.com A brief Section 26 of A Brief History of Forestry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernow. Great Britain and Her Colonies, Newfoundland and Other British Possessions and Colonies. Newfoundland. Newfoundland, probably the first discovery of America by the Norsemen, remained a mere fishing station until modern times, and, except for the open coast, unknown as regards the wooded interior which was supposed to be largely barren it became a possession of great britain in seventeen thirteen development did not begin until eighteen eighty when the first railroad was built and has progressed more rapidly since the newfoundland railway traversing the entire island was opened in eighteen ninety eight it was found that while the shores and a considerable part of the west and south coast are barren or poorly timbered and on the interior plateau large moss barrens exist there are extensive timber areas of mixed growth white and red pine balsam and spruce with white birch a lumber industry which by 1904 had grown up to probably not less than 100 million feet is rapidly extending over the whole island and an extensive paper pulp industry is preparing to establish itself on timber limits under a license system similar to that applied in other parts of canada some five thousand square miles are now under license forest fires have repeatedly devastated large areas especially in 1904 the experience of that year led to the enactment of a forest fire law but without any agency to make it effective no forest policy exists except the commercial restriction of the license system. A forestry association has lately been formed. Other British Possessions and Colonies Under the influence of the Indian Forest Service, 
or are stimulated by its success some of the other british colonial governments in africa and australia have attempted and sometimes succeeded in establishing a forest policy of east indian territories ceylon the nearest neighbor to india with over twenty five thousand square miles of which forty two per cent wooded mostly with second growth forest of small value attempted long ago an organization with the aid of indian foresters but by nineteen hundred had of over ten thousand square miles only four hundred thirty one in reserves in addition to nearly eighteen hundred acres planted one conservator and eight assistant conservators produce a net revenue of less than thirty dollars there being an import of two hundred fifty thousand dollars necessary to eke out the wood requirements of the three point five million people the straits settlement an area of one thousand five hundred twenty six square miles had by nineteen hundred a reserved state forest area of one hundred thirty eight square miles under an experienced indian forest officer gooda percha rubber and gums are here the most valuable products the federated malay states with twenty six thousand three hundred fifty square miles and heavily wooded after a report by the indian inspector general have begun to reserve forest areas some one hundred thousand acres having been set aside which are administered by the conservator of the strait settlements reserves the government of the island of cyprus also employs a forest officer and guards to look after its seven hundred square miles of forest in africa during the last few years small forest departments have been established by the governments of the sudan east africa nigeria transvaal orange river and natal mostly for the purpose of planting on the treeless plains the government of mauritius had made attempts at conservancy for many years but without notable success the most successful attempt in africa so far is reported from cape colony which as early as eighteen nineteen had a superintendent of lands and woods and in eighteen seventy six a department of forests and plantations neither of which have left much of record in eighteen eighty one a new forest department under a french forest officer was started which has grown until now it consists of one conservator d e hutchins twenty two assistant conservators eighty four european foresters and a few native guards in eighteen eighty eight the needed legislation was had for regulating the working of the nearly half million acres of forest area which in nineteen o two was declared inalienable government property since the wood imports amount to over two million and a quarter dollars annually the need of conservative use is appreciated especially as climatic conditions are unfavorable to reproduction some twenty four thousand acres have been planted during twenty two years at a cost of one million five hundred thousand dollars the first plantations beginning to yield a substantial revenue and it is believed that another forty thousand acres of such plantations would supply all the timber needed in the colony tree planting by private landowners and municipalities is encouraged by furnishing advice gratis and plant material at low cost and to municipalities in addition government aid is extended to the extent of half the cost of planting the seven australian colonies are very variously situated regarding timber supplies three of them queensland western and south australia being poorly wooded the others more or less heavily forested especially tasmania with sixty five per cent and new zealand with thirty one per cent generally speaking the forest areas are confined to the coast in narrower and wider belts the interior being forestless or with scrubby growth this portion is large enough to reduce the total forest per cent to less than six point five the mountains and hill ranges facing the eastern southern and western coasts are especially heavily wooded with magnificent eucalyptus jara and carry while the cory pine is the most valuable tree in new zealand the one successful attempt at a forest policy 
was made by the almost forestless colony of south australia which in eighteen eighty two reserved its scanty forest area of two hundred seventeen thousand acres and started to plant now thirteen thousand acres planted employing a conservator and six foresters in the other colonies at various times unsuccessful beginnings were made and there exist in queensland new south wales and victoria so-called forest branches or departments but mostly without power or equipment and no intelligent conception of forest policy seems practically to exist in queensland since eighteen ninety seven the governor and council may reserve forest lands and regulate the cutting by diameter limit one and a half million acres have been reserved but no staff for administration exists in new south wales six million acres were withdrawn from settlement but it is mostly used for pasture and withdrawal may be revoked at any time no effective system of control exists in victoria five and a half million acres have been declared reserves under act of eighteen ninety nearly half the forest area there exists a forest department of one conservator two inspectors and twenty-five foresters but no plan of management four state nurseries of doubtful value seems the whole result the other colonies still merely exploit their forest resources under loosely managed licensed systems without even an inefficient attempt at intelligent treatment end of section twenty six section twenty seven of a brief history of forestry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by avai in march two thousand twenty a brief history of forestry by bernhard ferno section twenty seven japan the modernization of this remarkable island empire of nippon the native name which began in eighteen sixty eight included the organization of a forest department after german models curiously enough there are other noteworthy points of similarity to be found in the historic development of forestry in germany and japan the empire comprises four larger islands kyushu shikoku hondo or honshu and hokkaido or yezo and a host of smaller ones stretching in a chain of nearly three thousand miles north and south along the asiatic shore the width of land being nowhere over two hundred miles it comprises an area of nearly one hundred fifty thousand square miles with a population approximating fifty million largely engaged in fisheries and other sea industries the islands are of volcanic origin part of the girdle of fire which reaches from the alaska peninsula through the philippines to the antilles with many active craters subject to frequent disastrous earthquakes and tidal waves mountainous with numerous ranges of high hills and with lofty central ridges with numerous short rivers apt to turn into treacherous torrents while hurricanes and water spouts typhoons and equinoctial gales sweep the surrounding seas frequently the soil is nowhere particularly fertile but the patient and painstaking labor of the japanese has brought every available foot of it little more than ten per cent is arable into producing condition wherever the climate compensates for the infertility especially in the most densely populated part the southern half of hondo extending through thirty degrees of latitude the climate naturally varies from the tropical one of formosa through all variations of the temperate to the alpine one of the high mountains and the nearly arctic one of the curile islands the japan current skirting the eastern coast and the mountain ranges with elevations generally not exceeding six thousand feet occasionally up to over thirteen thousand feet which cut off the dry continental west winds also produce great climatic variations between east and west coast 
In general, however, the climate of the whole empire is characterized by a high percentage of relative humidity and ample rainfall, especially during the hot season, producing luxuriant growth. 1. Forest Conditions and Ownership Due to these great variations in climate, four climatic regions being differentiated, the forest flora of Japan almost rivals in variety that of the United States, with over 200,000 deciduous and more than 30 coniferous species of size, besides a large number of half trees, although not more than some 50 or 60 are of silvicultural importance, and not more than 10 or 12 species form the basis of forest management and of the lumber trade, which requires some 2 billion cubic feet annually and supports an export of over $6 million. The value of the total cut was, in 1907, placed at over $17 million, of which $6 million was to the credit of the state treasury. In the tropical districts, bamboos form the main staple. In the subtropical region, the most densely populated, and hence also almost forestless, the broadleaf evergreens, especially several species of oak, furnish desirable fuel wood, and two species of pine are most valued for timber. One, the red pine, P. densiflora, extending its realm rapidly over waste areas. Camphor tree and boxwood furnish ornamental wood. The region of temperate forest furnishes, out of over 60 species, some 14 conifers and 19 broadleaf trees of value, the former mainly of the cedar tribe, with Chamae Ciparis obtusa and Cryptomeria japonica the most widely used, while of the broadleaf species, which occupy more than 50% of the forest area, Tselkova Kiaki of the elm tribe, a chestnut, a beech, several oaks, a walnut, and an ash count among the most useful. Spruce, fir, and white birch are the trees of the northern forest. Mixed forests form 45%, broadleaf 25%, conifer 21%, and 9% is rated as blank or thinly stocked. The forest area, which, over the whole, covers, with the addition of the newly acquired island of Sakhalin, 67% of the land area, or around 75 million acres, one one-quarter acres per capita, is quite unevenly distributed according to topography and population, being mostly confined to the mountain ranges and hills which form the backbone of the country, and to the northern provinces, which contains still large, untouched areas. Hokkaido, which was opened up to colonization only 35 years ago, now with a population of only 20 to the square mile, has 63% of forest, 15 acres per capita. The northern part of Hondo has a somewhat greater area percent, mostly on the high steep mountains, but only 1.2 acres per capita. On the southern portion, the low ranges of hills and valleys, the forest area has been reduced to 53%, but shows only three-quarter acre per capita, and Okinawa, with 26%, and less than one-third acre per capita, shows the lowest. Of this forest area, however, almost one-half is hara, brush forest, chaparral, or dwarfed tree growth, the result of mismanagement, excessive cutting, and fires, and in the southern districts, impenetrable thickets of dwarf bamboo, which crowd out tree and even shrub growth wherever such mismanagement gives it entrance. These extensive haras are cut every two or five years for the brush, which is used to cover and furnish manure for rice fields. Fire, which, until lately, ran over five or six million acres annually, and ruthless cutting, have in the past and are still deteriorating the forest area. Grassy prairie and barrens due to natural conditions are not absent, and are due to excessive drainage through loose, coarse-grained rock soil, 
they are found not extensively at the foot of volcanoes and on highest elevations the differentiation of land areas is not quite certain in 1894 there was still 30.5 percent of grassy prairie reported but some of this no doubt was forested probably one half the bulk of the forest area is owned by the state and the imperial household communal forests are estimated to aggregate in 1904 somewhat over four million acres 7.5 percent in 1910 reported as 11 percent and private property some 18 million 26 percent in 1910 22 percent leaving 30 million for the state and for imperial or crown forest 66 percent the latter comprising some 5.5 million acres these figures are liable to variation due to sales of the latter class and to adjustments of the somewhat obscure property rights the ownership by the state and the conservative use of the mountain forest is necessitated by the protective value of the forest cover the cultivation of the extensive rice fields being dependent upon irrigation two development of forest policy the history of japan dates back to 660 bc when the empire was founded on the island of kyushu by the warrior king jimmu tenno he established a kind of feudal government with the daimyos knights or barons holding their fiefs from the mikado who was considered the sole owner of the soil or at least all exercise of ownership rights emanated from him private property seems then not to have existed at all the people having merely rights of user colonization of the islands brought under the mikado's dominion progressed rapidly and with it not only arable portions but even mountains were denuded with the beginning of the christian era the need of better protection against floods seems to have been recognized and in 270 a d we find the first forest official appointed a son of the royal house who with assistance was to regulate the use of the forest property which under the rights of user granted by the mikado was being excessively exploited and devastated in the fifth century the feudal method of giving fiefs of land and forest to the deserving vassals had come generally into vogue and later with the rise of buddhism forests were assigned to the temples and priests who as in germany the monks were assiduous in cultivating and utilizing them soon the daimyos similarly to the barons in germany began to assert exclusive property rights and notwithstanding various edicts issued from time to time to secure free use to the people more and more of the forest area was secured by daimyos and by priests as temple forests in the ninth century deforestation and excessive exploitation had so far progressed that not only the need of protecting watersheds was recognized by edicts but fear of a timber famine led even to planting in the provinces of noto a period of internal strife and warfare during the following centuries which left forest interest in the background led in 1192 to the establishment of the rule of the shoguns the hereditary military representatives of the mikado who made him a mere figurehead and exercised all the imperial functions themselves until the revolution of 1868 restored the mikado to his rights the effort at conservative forest use was renewed with increased harshness when after a period of warfare and devastation the great shogun family of tokugawa 1603 assumed the rule of the empire enforcing the restrictive edicts with military severity even at that early age the protective influence of forest cover on soil and water flow was fully recognized and a distinction of open or supply forest and closed or protection forests seems to have been made the latter being placed under the ban of the emperor or shogun and withdrawn from utilization the extensive forests of the province of kiso the best remaining owe their preservation to these efforts 
the daimyos, 260 in number, each in his district, enforced the edicts in their own way, giving rise thereby to great differences in forest administration, yet in the absence of technical knowledge deterioration continued. The severity of punishments for depredations, etc., reminds us of those of the German Markgenossen, a hand or finger being the penalty for theft, death by fire, that for incendiaries. The idea of protecting or reserving certain species of trees, which was practiced in India by the Rajas, we find here again in the beginning of the 18th century, the number of such protected species varying from 1 to 7 and even 15 in different districts. Another unique and peculiar way of encouraging forest culture was to permit peasants who made forest plantations in the state forests to bear a family name, a right which was otherwise reserved to the knights or samurai, or to wear a double-edged sword like the latter. Arbor days were also instituted, memorial days and festivities, as at the birth of children, being marked by the planting of trees. While in Germany the love of hunting had led to the exclusion of the people from the forests, in Japan it was a question of conserving wood supplies that dictated these policies. It is claimed that to these early efforts is due the preservation of the remaining forests. But while this may be true in some instances, as in the province of Kiso, more probably their distance from centers of consumption and their general inaccessibility preserved those of Hokkaido and of the northern mountains. Certainly the brush forests south of Tokyo do not testify to great care. The detested shogunate was abolished in 1867 by a revolution which brought the Mikado to his rights again and crushed the power of the daimyos, whose fiefs were surrendered, and their acquisitions of forest property, as well as, a few years later, those of the priests, were declared state property, with the exception of some which were recognized as communal properties. Similar to the experiences of France, the disturbances in property conditions, which implied instantaneous loss by the people of all rights of user in the state property, as well as removal of all restrictions from private and communal properties, led to wholesale depredations from the state domain and to widespread deforestation and devastation, an area of a million acres of burnt waste near Kofu, west of Tokyo, testifying to the recklessness of these times. Without any force to guard property rights, stealing on an extensive scale, similar to past experiences in the United States, with the accompanying wastefulness, became the order of the day, and is even now not uncommon. A first provisional administration of state forests was inaugurated, and a forest reconnaissance ordered in 1875 in order to secure insights into the mixed-up property relations, and restore to their rightful owners such portions as had been wrongly taken by the state. In 1878, the state forests were placed under a special bureau, organized by Matsuno, who had studied forestry in Germany, Eberswalde, for five years. But it was not academic knowledge that was needed in the situation. It was necessary first to mold public opinion in order to secure means for administrative measures. This he set himself to do through public addresses and pamphlets, and by organizing a society of friends of forest culture, and finally, in 1882, by establishing an experiment station at Nishigahara, and, a year later, a dendrological school, which four years later was combined with the agricultural school at Komaba. Five years later, both were joined to the University of Tokyo. With the transfer of the Forestry Bureau to the Department of Agriculture and Commerce in 1881 and the reorganization in 1886, a new era seemed to be promised, yet a substantial progress in organized forest management of the state property does not seem to have been made for another decade at least, the slow progress being largely due to lack of personnel 
and the continuance of mixed property conditions which involved not only uncertainty of boundaries but also mixed ownership although this last trouble namely of mixed ownership by state and private individuals had been recognized as inimical to good management it was deliberately increased by the law of eighteen seventy eight in a curious way reviving an old custom namely by permitting private individuals to plant up clearings in the state forests in this way these individuals secured a certain percentage usually twenty per cent of the eventual profits arising from the results some two hundred thousand acres were planted under this arrangement to remove the boundary difficulty a survey of the boundaries of state property and adjustment of property rights as well as segregation of the state lands to be disposed of namely small lots and others not needed was ordered in eighteen ninety it was then also that the first provisional working plan for the fellings on state lands was elaborated and gradually with the progress of the survey more permanent plans were adopted for district after district by eighteen ninety nine the adjustment had progressed far enough to begin the restoration of properties which the state had improperly claimed to their proper owners it was then also that the imperial forests intended for the support of the imperial household were increased to about five million acres meanwhile the personnel had increased in numbers and improved in character in 1904 the organization of the forestry bureau under the minister of agriculture and commerce arranged somewhat after german models consisted of one director and four forest commissioners with ten clerks forming the head office the sixteen districts into which the state forests were divided were presided over by thirty-two conservators and eighty inspectors while three hundred twenty five district officers with eight hundred eighty assistants and six hundred twenty six guards altogether over one thousand eight hundred employees formed the field force in nineteen ten the number had increased to two thousand five hundred mainly by additional rangers this organization applies to the state forests under control of the department of agriculture strangely enough those in sakhalin hokkaido and formosa are not under that department but under the supervision of the minister of home affairs and are merely exploited while the imperial forests are under the household department in nineteen o seven only seven per cent of the state forests were under working plans the need of supervision of the ill-managed private and communal forests mostly located near the settled portions early attracted the attention of the new regime mainly on account of their protective value annual losses through floods to the amount of four million dollars and similar losses due to unchecked forest fires gave the incentive to the passage of a law in eighteen eighty two simply forbidding all forest use in protection forest which simple prescription evidently did not work until a further revision was made in eighteen ninety seven this latter does not confine itself to legislation for protection forests alone but also authorizes the supervision of supply forests under the special control of the local governors under this law which also extended the assistance of local authorities to would-be planters aided by reforms in the corporation system remarkable activity in planting wastelands ensued so that in the next two years not less than one million acres of communal property was set out with trees numbering over eight hundred million while in the state forests some four hundred thousand acres of vacant land had been planted by nineteen seventy some sand dune planting and reboisement works are also the result of this legislation further legislation more closely defining state control was had in nineteen o seven in connection with this planting it may be of interest to record the attitude of japanese foresters toward natural regeneration this is no longer popular in these days when the knowledge of forest management possessed by foresters has become highly developed 
for if that method is the easiest and least troublesome nevertheless it is not advisable in view of the necessity of effecting a thorough improvement in our silvicultural conditions only on steep slopes and for protection forests it is applicable in 1897 also some eight experiment stations were organized in addition to the earlier one at nishigahara organized in 1882 by matsuno education in forestry has lately run riot in japan as it has in the united states since the first school organized in 1882 not less than 62 institutions had seen the need of offering the opportunity to become acquainted with that subject. By 1910, these had been reduced to 47. Here, however, different grades are frankly acknowledged. There are three collegiate institutions whose diploma admits to the higher service. Four are of secondary grade, 19 give special courses, and the rest treat the subject merely as a subsidiary of a practical education, including agriculture, stock farming, and fishery. A ranger school, which was instituted under Matsuno's guidance, controlled by the Forestry Bureau, came to an end during the Russian War for lack of funds, but has probably been revived again. A forestry association now with 4,000 members carries on propaganda and publishes a magazine, and cooperative associations among small owners to facilitate better management are being formed under the law of 1907. In conclusion, we may say that Japan has done wonders in reorganizing its forestry system in a short time, but, according to one competent observer, while all the Japanese care for detail and love for orderliness is apparent in the office, not all that is found on paper is to be found as yet in the woods, and that, for similar reasons as have been indicated for Russia, many things happen in the woods that are not known in the office. End of section 27section 28 of a brief history of forestry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in january 2020 a brief history of forestry by bernhard ferno section 28 korea the latest move in forestry form in this part of the world, as a result of Japanese influence, is to be recorded from Korea. Indeed, in 1910, Japan annexed Korea and will doubtless apply her own methods in the new province. The forest area of Korea comprises only about 2,500,000 acres, out of an area of nearly 53 million acres of very mountainous country. A concession for the exploitation of the northern forests to a Russian, which included the replanting with exotic tree species, was the immediate cause of the Russo-Japanese War. In 1907, by cooperative arrangements with Japan, a conservative forest policy was to be inaugurated by laws similar to those of Japan. Drought, floods and erosion of soils have been common experiences. The preservation of forest cover, especially at the headquarters of the Yalu and Tumen in the northern part of the country, is aimed at. For this purpose the government has taken all forests under its care. All private owners or leaseholders must report their holdings and have their property listed, and in case of failure to do so the property is forfeited. The government may then expropriate, or else regulate the cutting, or, where protective functions of the forest cover require it, may forbid cutting altogether. A forestry school is also part of the program. End of section 28 Section 29 of A Brief History of Forestry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernow. 
United States of America. 1. Forest Conditions. The great and exuberant republic of the United States, vast in extent and rich in natural resources generally, excelled and still excels in extent, importance, and value of her timber resources, and having only lately begun to inaugurate rational forest policies, promises to become of all absorbing interest to foresters. The marvelous growth of the nation, which from three million in seventeen eighty had attained to a population of seventy six million in nineteen hundred, and by the last census numbered around ninety two million people, has been the wonder of the world by reason of its rapid expansion, and yet the limit is far from being reached. Annually some three quarters of a million or more immigrants from all parts of the world arrive, and there is still room and comfortable living for at least another one hundred million if the resources are properly treated. The large land area of nearly two billion acres, over three million square miles, is undoubtedly the richest contiguous domain of such size in the world, located most favorably with reference to trade by virtue of a coastline of over twenty thousand miles and diversified in climate so as to permit the widest range of production while a simple mathematical relation would make the population at present about thirty-one to the square mile such a statement would give an erroneous conception of economic conditions for the distribution of the population is most uneven a condition which must eventually diversify the application of forestry methods in different parts of the country in massachusetts and rhode island combined for instance the density of population is four hundred and twenty eight to the square mile exceeding that of the similar sized state of Württemberg in germany while in the neighboring state of maine it is not twenty five the atlantic coast states south of south carolina a territory slightly larger than germany show about half and the central agricultural states about one-third the density of that densely populated country on the other hand some of the western states montana wyoming nevada arizona and new mexico have less than three to the square mile similar unevenness is found in the distribution of resources especially of timber wealth and to some extent at least the present populational distribution is explained by the uneven distribution of farm soils and timber outside of the unorganized territory of alaska and the disenfranchised district of columbia the country is divided into forty-six states and two territories which will eventually acquire statehood in addition there are a number of insular possessions under the direct control of the federal government each state being under the constitution sovereign in itself as far as its internal administration is concerned it is evident that no uniformity of policies can be expected except so far as initiativeness in which the american citizen excels may lead state after state to repeat the experiment attempted by one the federal government has no direct jurisdiction in matters concerning the management of resources within the states except so far as it still owns land in the western so-called public land states and a few parcels in the eastern states over which it still retains jurisdiction the severest test of democratic institutions is experience when the attempt is made to establish a policy which shall guard the interests of the future at the expense of the demands and needs of the present democracy produces attitudes and characteristics of the people which are inimical to stable economic arrangements looking to the future such as are implied in a forest policy the vast country with an unevenly distributed and heterogeneous population presents the greatest variety of natural as well as of economic conditions the immediate interests of one section naturally do not coincide with those of other sections particularistic and individualistic tendencies of the true democrat are antagonistic to anything which smacks of paternalism the attitude under which alone a persistent far-sighted policy can thrive frequent change of administration or at least the threat of such change impedes consistent execution of plans fickle public opinion may subvert at any time well-laid plans which take time in maturing 
the true democratic doctrine of restricting state activity to police functions and the doctrine of non-interference with private rights as well as the idea of state rights in opposition to federal power and authority all these characteristics of a democratic government are impediments to a concerned action and stable policy that in spite of these antagonistic interests conditions and doctrines substantial progress toward establishing at least a federal forest policy has been made is due to the fact that the american in spite of his reputation as a materialistic selfish opportunist is really an idealist that he responds readily to patriotic appeals that in spite of his rabid nationalism he is willing to learn from the experiences of other nations that indeed he is anxious to be educated finally much credit is due to the men who with single purpose devoted their lives to the education of their fellow citizens in this direction it must to be sure be added that remarkable changes in the political attitude of the people have taken place in the last thirty years since the propaganda of forestry began changes partly perhaps induced by that propaganda which have aided this movement and which if they persist promise much for the future development of forest policies a decidedly paternalistic if not socialistic attitude has lately been taken by the federal government and by skillful construction of the constitution as regards the right to regulate interstate relations has led to an expansion of federal power in various directions a similar paternalistic attitude has developed in the legislatures of several states to a noticeable degree even the judiciary has taken up this new spirit and is ready to sanction interference with private property rights to a degree which a decade ago would have been denounced as undemocratic and tyrannical two courts have lately ruled that owners of timberlands may be restricted without compensation as regards the size of trees they may fell on their property if the welfare of the state demands such interference the argument of the roman doctrine utere tuo ne alterum no seas which forestry propagandists have so strenuously used seems finally to have found favor and the inclusion of the community at large present and future as the possibility damaged party does not appear any more strained the idea of the providential function of governments as the writer has called it seems to have taken hold of the people the democratic doctrine of state rights and restriction of government functions has even among democrats been weakened through the long continued reign of the republican party the party of centralizing tendencies to such an extent that the latest democratic platform of a presidential campaign nineteen o eight outdid the republican platform in centralizing and paternalistic propositions it is proper to emphasize the growth of this socialistic attitude as it is bound to influence and influence favorably the further development of forest policies nevertheless it is still necessary to keep in mind that the states are autonomous and that while the federal government in spite of the antagonism in the western states in which the public lands are situated has been able to change its land policy from that of liberal disposal to one of reservation it alone cannot save the situation while a few of the states have made beginnings in working out a policy to arrest the destruction of their forest resources which are mostly in private hands still much water must flow down the mississippi before adequate measures will be taken to stave off the threatening timber famine and the energy of the various local and national conservation associations will need to be exercised to the utmost forest conditions three extensive mountain systems running north and south give rise to at least eight topographic subdivisions of the country going from east to west one the narrow belt of level coast and hill country along the atlantic shore from one hundred to two hundred miles in width with elevations up to one thousand feet but especially low along the seacoast from virginia south drained by short rivers navigable only for short distances from the mouth a farming country with the soils varying from the rich to the poorest some three hundred thousand square miles 
two the appalachian mountain country nearly of the same width as the first section with elevations up to five thousand feet the watershed of all the rivers to the atlantic of several rivers to the gulf and of the eastern affluents of the mississippi a mountain country of about three hundred and sixty thousand square miles extent rich in coal iron and other minerals except in its northern extension formed of archaean rock three the great river basin of the mississippi a central plain of glacial and river deposit rising gradually from the gulf to the headwaters for more than twelve hundred miles and nowhere over one thousand feet above sea level the richest agricultural section seven hundred thousand square miles more or less in extent four the plateau rising toward the rocky mountains from one thousand to five thousand feet above sea level some eight hundred and seventy thousand square miles in extent a region of scanty rainfall hence of prairie and plain but mostly rich soil of undetermined depth capable of prolific production where sufficient water supply is available five the rocky mountain region rising from five thousand to near ten thousand feet except some higher peaks an arid to semi-arid district of rugged ranges covered mostly with forest growth often open and of inferior kind with tillable soils in the narrow valleys requiring irrigation for farm use a mining country rich in gold and silver extending over one hundred and fifty thousand square miles six the sierra nevada mountain range including the coast range rarely over seven thousand feet elevation arid to semi-arid on the eastern slopes humid and supporting magnificent forest growth on the western slopes some one hundred and ninety thousand square miles seven the interior basin lying between the two preceding mountain ranges some four hundred thousand square miles for the most part a desert although in part supporting a stunted growth of pinon and juniper and where irrigation is possible productive eight the interior valleys of the sierra comprising about thirty thousand square miles which under irrigation have become the garden spots of the pacific to these topographical subdivisions correspond in part the climatic and the forest conditions although variation of soil and of northern and southern climate produce further differentiation in types and in distribution of field and forest the first three sections are originally densely wooded the great atlantic forest region but farms now occupy most of the arable portions the fourth and seventh are forestless if not treeless while the fifth and sixth were more or less forested the pacific coast region floristically also these topographic conditions are reflected namely in the wide north and south distribution of species unimpeded by intervening mountain ranges and in the change in composition from east to west the two grand floristic divisions of the atlantic and the pacific forest having but few species in common are separated by the plains and prairies the atlantic forest is in the main composed of broadleaf leaves with conifers intermixed which latter only under the influence of soil conditions form pure stands as in the extensive pineries of the south and north and in the northern swamps and on southern mountain tops the central region west of the alleghanies exhibits little conifer growth in its composition and is most widely turned to farm use white pine hemlock and spruce are the important coniferous staples of the northern section and a number of yellow pine species with old cypress and red cedar are the valuable conifer species in the south as regards valuable hardwoods there is but little change from north to south the pacific forest flora is almost entirely coniferous but here also climatic conditions permit a distinction of two very different forest regions the rocky mountain forest being mostly of rather inferior development and the sierra forest exhibiting the most magnificent tree growth in the world nearly half the country is forestless grassy prairie and plain 
some four hundred million acres being of the latter description while open prairie and bush forest or wasteland occupy six hundred million acres within the forest region of the east some two hundred and fifty million acres have been turned into farms leaving still two-thirds of the area either under woods or else wasted by fire although any reliable data regarding this acreage are wanting the area of really productive woodland in this section may probably be set down as not exceeding three hundred million acres which would be nearly forty per cent of the total area varying from thirteen per cent in the central agricultural states to fifty per cent in the southern states maine new hampshire and arkansas being most densely wooded with over sixty per cent the rocky mountain and sierra forests each with one hundred million acres would bring the total productive woodland area to a round five hundred million acres or about twenty six per cent of the whole later estimates including brushlands of doubtful productive capacity increase this area to five hundred and fifty million acres it is almost idle to attempt an estimate of the timber still standing ready for the axe not only are the data for such an estimate too scanty but standards of what is considered merchantable change continuously and vitiate the value of such estimates the writer's own estimate made some years ago of two thousand five hundred billion feet which by others has been treated as authoritative and forming a basis for predicting the time of a timber famine and which was lately sustained by an extensive official inquiry must nevertheless be considered only as a reasonable guess ventured for the purpose of accentuating the need of more conservative treatment of these exhaustible supplies in comparison with the consumption which represents around forty five billion feet b m and altogether twenty three billion cubic feet of forest grown material and the ultimate value of all forest products reaching the stupendous sum of around one thousand two hundred and fifty million dollars and as in other countries this lavish consumption of forest growth from five to fifteen times that of europeans has shown in the past a per capita increase of thirty per cent for every decade the bulk of the standing timber is to be found along the pacific coast and the sierra and in the southern states with their extensive pineries the northern and eastern sections are within measurable time of the end of their virgin supplies of saw timber the practice of culling the most valuable species has changed the composition and the regeneration making it inferior and large areas have been rendered worthless by fires the loss of fire the bane of american forests as far as loss in material is concerned probably does not exceed two or three per cent of the consumption and may be valued at say twenty five million dollars per annum but the indirect damage to forest and soil changing the composition bearing the soil and exposing it to erosion and washing turning fertile lands into waste in brooks and rivers into torrents is incalculable there is no doubt that at the present rate of consumption the bulk of the virgin supplies will be used up in a measurable time which will force a reduction in the use of wood materials a more or less severe timber famine is bound to appear indeed has already begun to make its appearance and all recuperative measures will not suffice to stave it off although they may shorten the time of its duration End of section 29。section 30 of a brief history of forestry。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。a brief history of forestry by bernard ferno。section 30。united states of america。early forest history。the early colonizers settling on the atlantic coast soon after the discoveries of columbus did not as is usually believed find an untouched virgin forest the aboriginal indians had before then hewn out their cornfields and had supplied themselves with fuel wood and materials for their utensils and fires accidental intentional or caused by lightning had no doubt 
also made inroads here and there. The white man, to be sure, is a more lavish wood consumer. His farms increased more rapidly, his buildings and his fireplaces consumed more forest growth, and carelessness with fire was, as it is still, his besetting sin. Moreover, a trade in timber with the old world developed, in which only the best and largest-sized material figured. Wastefulness was bred in him by the sight of plenty, and the hard work of clearing his farm acres incited a natural enmity to the encumbering forest. The first sawmill in the New World was erected in 1631 in the town of Berwick, Maine, and the first gang saw of 18 saws in 1650 in the same place, while before that time masts and spars, handmake cooperage stock, clapboards and shingles formed commonly parts of the returned cargoes of ships. By 1680, nearly 50 vessels engaged in such trade cleared from the Piscataqua River. The ordinances on record, which were issued at the same early times by the town governments of Exeter, 1640, Kittery, 1658, Portsmouth, 1660, and Dover, 1665, restricting the use of timber, remind us of the early European forest ordinances. They were probably not dictated by any threatening deficiency of this class of material, but merely intended to secure a proper and orderly use of the town property. The appointment of a royal surveyor of the woods for the New England colonies in 1699, and the penalties imposed in New Hampshire, 1708, for cutting mast trees on ungranted lands, $500 for cutting 24-inch trees, and in Massachusetts, 1784, for cutting white pine upon the public lands, $100, were probably also merely policy regulations to protect property, rights of the crown or commonwealth. That this last move was in no way conceived as a needed conservatism is proved by the fact that two years later the legislature of Maine devised a lottery scheme for the disposal of 50 townships, and 3,500,000 acres were disposed of in this way during the 12 years following the war. Altogether, the states sacrificed their wild lands at trifling prices. But when William Penn, the founder and first legislator of the state which represented his grant, stipulated in 1682 that for every five acres cleared, one acre was to be reserved for forest growth by those who took title from it, that may properly be considered an attempt to inaugurate a conservative policy dictated by wise forethought, an attempt which, however, bore little or no fruit. Thoughtful men probably at all times looked with pity and apprehension upon the wasteful use of the timber as they do now, yet squander went on just as it still does, but the apparently inexhaustible supplies in those early times called for no restriction in its use. At the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, a fuel-wood famine must have appeared in some parts of the country, just as in Germany at that time, and for the same reasons. The wood having been cut along the rivers, which were the only means of transportation, and hence the distance to which wood had to be hauled, increasing the cost. This was probably the reason why the Society of Agriculture, Arts, and Manufactures of New York after an inquiry by circular letter, issued in 1791, published in 1795, a report on the best mode of preserving and increasing the growth of timber. This condition probably also led the wise governor of New York, DeWitt Clinton, of Erie Canal fame, in a message in 1822, to forecast an evil day, because no system of economy for the reproduction of forest supplies was being adopted. And, he added, probably none will be, until severe privations are experienced. Like Great Britain at the time, the federal government became concerned as regards supplies for naval construction, and by act approved in 1799, appropriated $200,000 for the purchase of timber fit for the Navy, and for its preservation for future use. Small purchases were made on the Georgia coast, but nothing of importance was done until, in 1817, Another act renewed the proposition of the first, and directed the reservation of public lands bearing live oak or cedar timber suitable for the navy, as might be selected by the president. 
Under this act, a reservation of 19,000 acres was made, in 1828, on commissioners, Cyprus, and six islands in Louisiana. Another appropriation of $10,000 was made in 1828, and some lands were purchased on Santa Rosa Sound, where, during a few years, even an attempt at cultivation was made, including sowing, transplanting, pruning, etc., this was done under a more general act of 1827, by which the president was authorized to take proper measures to preserve the live oak timber growing on the federal lands. Under these acts, altogether some 244,000 acres of forest land were reserved in Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, and Mississippi. But although another act of 1831 provided for the punishment of persons cutting or destroying any live oak, red cedar, or other trees growing on any lands of the United States, no general conception of the need of a broad forest policy, or even of a special value attaching to the public timberlands, dictated these acts, except so far as the securing of certain material, then believed necessary for naval construction, was concerned. Indeed, the Act of 1831 remained for sixty years the only expression of interest in this part of the federal domain. In those early times, the extent of our forest domain was entirely unknown, and the concern of occasional early voices and public prints regarding a threatened exhaustion of timber supplies can only be explained by the fact that, in the absence of railroads, the supplies near centers of civilization, or near drivable and navigable rivers, were alone of any account. That the earlier propagandists of forest culture received scant attention was due to the fact that conditions soon changed, and with these changes the evil day seemed indefinitely postponed, and the necessity for forest culture apparently vanished. These changes were mainly wrought by the opening up of the West, by extending means of transportation through canals and railroads, and by distributing population whereby the need for nearby home supplies was overcome. A continental supply of apparently inexhaustible amount was brought into sight and within reach. Meanwhile, the population began to grow. Immigrants began to pour in by the hundred thousand, and the westward stream opened up new country and new timber supplies, and a lumber industry of marvelous size began to develop. The small country mill, run in the manner of, and often in connection with, the grist mill, doing a petty business by sawing as occasion demanded, to order for home customers or export, gave way to the large mill establishment, as we know it now, and with the development of railroad transportation and the settlement of the western country, especially the forestless prairies, the industry grew at an astonishing rate. It is worth while to briefly trace the history of this industry for the sake of which the need of conservative forest policies is essential. That the petty method of doing business lasted until the middle of the century is evidenced by the census of 1840, which reported 31,560 lumber mills, with a total product valued at 12,943,507 or a little over $400 per mill. By 1876, the product per mill had become $6,500. By 1890, with only 21,000 mills, it was $19,000. In 1900, nearly the same number of mills as were recorded in 1840, 33,035, furnished a product of $566 million, and in 1907, the banner year of production, the cut of 28,850 mills was reported at over 40 billion feet, and the gross product per mill had grown to $23,000, or a value for all of 666641367 In 1909, 48,112 mills cut 44,509,761,000 feet, valued at 684,479,859 dollars. Nearly half this product came from the southern states. 
In the 50 years from 1850 to 1900, the value of all forest products harvested increased from 59 million to 567 million, and in 1907, the value had risen to 1,280 million, representing a consumption of over 20 million cubic feet of forest grown material. Especially after the Civil War, the settlements of the West grew as if by magic. The railroad mileage more than doubled in the decade from 1865 to 1875, and with it the lumber industry developed by rapid strides into its modern methods and volume. How rapidly the changes took place may be judged from the fact that, in 1865, the state of New York still furnished more lumber than any other state. Now it supplies only insignificant amounts, a little over 2% of the total lumber cut. In 1868, the golden age of lumbering had arrived in Michigan. In 1871, rafts filled the Wisconsin. In 1875, Eau Claire had 30, Marathon 30, and Fond du Lac 20 sawmills, now all gone. And mills at La Crosse, which were cutting millions of feet annually, are now closed. By 1882, the Saginaw Valley had reached the climax of its production, and the lumber industry of the Great Northwest, with a cut of 8 billion feet of white pine alone, was in full blast. The white pine production reached its maximum in 1890, with 8.5 billion feet, then to decrease gradually but steadily to less than half that cut in 1908. Southern development began to assume large proportions much later. At the present time, the lumber product of the southern states has grown to amounts nearly double that of all the northern states combined. But not only the unparalleled and ever-increasing wood consumption, which now has reached 260 cubic feet per capita, five times that of Germany and ten times that of France, threatened the exhaustion of the natural supplies. Reckless conflagrations almost invariably followed the lumbermen, and destroyed generally the remaining stand, and surely the young growth. So common did these conflagrations become that they were considered unavoidable, and though laws intended to protect forest property against fires were found on the statute books of every state, no attempt to enforce them was made. No wonder that those observing this rapid dissemination of our forest supplies, and the incredible wastefulness and additional destruction by fire, with no attention to the aftergrowth, began again to sound the note of alarm. Besides the writings in the daily press and other non-official publications, we find the reports of the Department of Agriculture more and more frequently calling attention to the subject. In a report issued by the Patent Office as early as 1849, we find the following significant language in a discussion on the rapid destruction of forests and their influence on water flow. The waste of valuable timber in the United States, to say nothing of firewood, will hardly begin to be appreciated until our population reaches 50 million. Then the folly and short-sightedness of this age will meet with a degree of censure and reproach not pleasant to contemplate. In 1865, the Reverend Frederick Starr discussed fully and forcibly the American forests, their destruction and preservation, in a lengthy article in which, with a truly prophetic vision, he says, It is feared it will be long, perhaps a full century, before the results at which we ought to aim as a nation will be realized by our whole country, to wit, that we should raise an adequate supply of wood and timber for all our wants, the evils which are anticipated will probably increase upon us for thirty years to come, with a tenfold the rapidity with which restoring or ameliorating measures shall be adopted. And again, like a cloud no bigger than a man's hand just rising from the sea, an awakening interest begins to come in sight on this subject, which, as a question of political economy, will place the interests of cotton, wool, coal, iron, meat, and even grain beneath its feet. Some of these, according to the demand, can be produced in a few days, others in a few months or a few years, but timber in not less than one generation. The nation has slept because the gnawing of want has not awakened her. She has had plenty and to spare, 
but within thirty years she will be conscious that not only individual want is present, but that it comes to each from permanent national famine of wood. The article is full of interesting detail, and may be said to be the starting basis of the campaign for better methods which followed. Another unquestionably most influential official report was that upon Forests and Forestry in Germany, by Dr. John A. Warder, United States Commissioner to the World's Fair at Vienna in 1873. Dr. Warder set forth clearly and correctly the methods employed abroad in the use of forests, and became himself one of the most prominent propagandists for their adoption in his own country. About the same time appeared the classical work of George B. Marsh, our minister to Italy, The Earth as Modified by Human Action, in which the evil effects on cultural conditions of forest destruction were ably and forcibly pointed out. Among these earlier publications designed to arouse public attention to the subject should also be mentioned General C. C. Andrews' Report on Forestry in Sweden, published by the State Department in 1872. The census of 1870 attempted for the first time a canvas of our forest resources under Professor F. W. Brewer, as a result of which the relative smallness of our forest area became known. All these publications had their influence in educating a large number to a conception and consideration of the importance of the subject, so that, when, in 1873, the Committee on Forestry of the American Association for the Advancement of Science was formed and presented a memorial to Congress, pointing out the importance of promoting the cultivation of timber and the preservation of forests, and recommending the appointment of a commission of forestry to report to Congress there already existed an intelligent audience, and although a considerable amount of lethargy and lack of interest was exhibited, Congress could be persuaded, in 1876, to establish an agency in the United States Department of Agriculture, out of which grew later the Division of Forestry, a Bureau of Information on Forestry Matters. Dr. Franklin B. Ho, one of the signers of the memorial, was appointed to the agency, it is to be noted as characteristic of much American legislation that this agency was secured only as a rider to an appropriation for the distribution of seed. While these were the beginnings of an official recognition of the subject by the federal government, private enterprise and the separate states also started about the same time to forward the movement. In 1867, the Agricultural and Horticultural Societies of Wisconsin were invited by the legislature to appoint a committee to report on the disastrous effects of forest destruction. In 1869, the Maine Board of Agriculture appointed a committee to report on a forest policy for the state, leading to the Act of 1872 for the encouragement of the growth of trees, exempting from taxation for 20 years lands planted to trees, which law, as far as we know, remained without result. About the same time, a real wave of enthusiasm regarding the planting of timber seems to have pervaded the country, and especially the western prairie states. In addition to laws regarding the planting of trees on highways, laws for the encouragement of timber planting, either under bounty or exemption from taxation, were passed in Iowa, Kansas, and Wisconsin in 1868, in Nebraska and New York in 1869, in Missouri in 1870, in Minnesota in 1871, in Iowa in 1872, in Nevada in 1873, in Illinois in 1874, in Dakota and Connecticut in 1875, and finally the federal government joined in this kind of legislation by the so-called Timber Cultural Acts of 1873 and 1874 amended in 1876 and 1877. For the most part, these laws remained a dead letter, excepting in the case of the federal government offer. The encouragement by release from taxes was not much of an inducement, nor does the bounty provision seem to have had greater success, except in taking money out of the treasuries. Finally, these laws were in many or most cases repealed. The Timber Cultural Act was passed by Congress on March 3, 1873, by which the planting of timber on 40 acres of land, or a proportionate area, 
in the treeless territory, conferred the title to 160 acres, or a proportionate amount, of the public domain. This law had not been in existence ten years when its repeal was demanded, and this was finally secured in 1891, the reason being that, partly owing to the crude provisions of the law, and partly to the lack of proper supervision, it had been abused, and had given rise to much fraud in obtaining title to lands under false pretenses. It is difficult to say how much impetus the law gave to bona fide forest planting, and how much timber growth has resulted from it. Unfavorable climate, lack of satisfactory plant material, and a lack of knowledge as to the proper methods, led to many failures. A number of railroad companies, opening up the prairie states, planted at this time groves along the right-of-way for the sake of demonstrating the practicability of securing forest growth on the treeless prairies and plains. There was also considerable planting of windbreaks and groves on homesteads, which was attended with better results. Altogether, however, the amount of tree planting, even in the prairies and plains, was infinitesimal, if compared with what is necessary for climatic amelioration, and it may be admitted now as well as later that the reforestation of the plains must be a matter of cooperative, if not of national enterprise. At this time also, an effort was made to stimulate enthusiasm for tree planting among the homesteaders and settlers on the plains by the establishment of Arbor Days. From its inception by Governor J. Sterling Morton, and its first inauguration by the State Board of Agriculture of Nebraska in 1872, Arbor Day gradually became a day of observance in nearly every state. While, with the exception of the so-called treeless states, perhaps not much planting of economic value is done, the observance of the day in schools, as one set apart for the discussion of the importance of trees, forests, and forestry, has been productive of an increased interest in the subject, Arbor Days have perhaps also had a retarding influence upon the practical forestry movement in leading people into the misconception that forestry consists in tree planting, in diverting attention from the economic question of the proper use of existing forest areas, in bringing into the discussion poetry and emotions, which have clouded the hard-headed practical issues and delayed the earnest attention of practical businessmen. Private efforts in the East in the way of fostering and carrying on economic timber planting should not be forgotten, such as the offering of prizes by the Massachusetts Society for the Promotion of Agriculture as early as 1804 and again in 1876, and the planting done by private landholders at Cape Cod in Rhode Island, Virginia, and elsewhere. These efforts, to be sure, were only sporadic and unsystematic and on no scale commensurate with the destruction of virgin forest resources. A touching attempt of two noble Frenchmen to teach their American hosts a better use of their magnificent forest resource, although of little result, should never fail of mention. André Michaud and his son André-Francois, who between 1785 and 1805 explored and studied the forest flora of the United States, and published a magnificent North American Silva in three volumes, left, in recognition of the hospitalities received, two legacies of $20,000 for the extension and progress of agriculture, and more especially of silviculture, in the United States, which bequests became available in 1870. The American Philosophical Society at Philadelphia, a trustee of one of the legacies, has devoted its income to beautification of Fairmont Park, providing a few lectures on forest botany and forestry, and collecting a forestry library, while the other legacy has been used by the Massachusetts Society for the Promotion of Agriculture to aid the botanical gardens at Harvard and the Arnold Arboretum, besides offering the prizes for tree planting referred to above. End of section 30